for the refugee written and performed by professor mike steinel and we are still not allowing refugees from ukraine into this country even though president biden went to poland and said we would be welcoming the refugees but uh, as usual america doesn't keep its promise welcome to the mop up for april 18th 2022 i'm david feldman coming to you from an air shaft overlooking a parking garage somewhere in manhattan where the temperature is 49 degrees and cloudy the u.s food and drug administration is investigating whether or not lucky charms is making people sick let me save you a little time yes lucky charms is magically debilitating the sugar causes heart disease obesity diabetes and cancer the sugar causes cancer this is not a breakfast it's a dessert and not a good one there are reports of consumers saying they grew ill after eating lucky charms you know consuming lucky charms is just is a lot like having sex with Jeff Bezos if you don't want to pu puke your guts out then just don't think about it disconnect disassociate 100 people have now complained that after eating Lucky Charms they experienced explosive diarrhea prompting Lucky Charms to change their slogan to explosive diarrhea always after my Lucky Charms explosive diarrhea always after my lucky charms well Tucker Carlson speaking of explosive diarrhea interviewed a uh, a bromeopathic expert he's a nutritionist who insists our balls are not getting enough sunlight um, if you want to optimize and take it uh, to another level, expose yourself to red light therapy. Yes. Um, and the juve um, that we were using in the documentary, there's a massive amount Which of... Which is testicle tanning. It's testicle tanning, but so much data out there um, that isn't being picked up on or covered. So, obviously, half the viewers right now are like, what? That's testicle tanning? That's crazy. But my view is, okay, testosterone levels like crash and nobody says anything about it. That's crazy. So why is it crazy to seek solutions? It's not crazy to seek solutions. And I think um, I was recently exposed to a term called bromeopathy. And I think there's a lot of people out there right now that um, are, don't trust the mainstream information. Yes, <laughs> bromeopathy. Forget John, Johns Hopkins. Uh, I need to talk to someone who has a master's in bromeopathy. That would be bromeo as in bro, where men, bro, take care of other men. Bromeopathy, bromeo, bromeo, we're far out thou. I'm in the hospital because my testicles smell like charred steak. Well, the truth is, I listened to Tucker Carlson. I got interested in bromeopathy and I got my testicles tanned and now they look like this. Thanks a lot. Tucker Carlson, my my testicles now look like the t the tanning mom. Remember the tanning mom? Okay. Anyway, according to new research from ProPublica, America's 25 richest paid a true tax rate of just 3.4 percent between the years 2014 and 2018. The 25 richest Americans paid a true tax rate of just 3.4 percent. During the past two years, the wealth of this country's 735 billionaires, their wealth has increased by 62%, and they are now owning nearly $5 trillion worth of America's wealth, which explains why, despite being the wealthiest country in the history of civilization, we can't afford it. We cannot afford it. Whatever you want, we can't afford it because why because 735 people own five trillion dollars of america's assets and they refuse to pay taxes so we we can't afford it we can't afford it now don't tell me it's complicated if you tell me it's complicated then you're another grover norquist or stephen moore remember stephen moore they, you know they take money from billionaires to convince us that it's that it's complicated by the way, Stephen Moore, 
Heritage Foundation, Club for Growth. He's this tool of the billionaires. He used to write editorials for the Wall Street Journal, insisting that when you lower taxes for the billionaires, they create jobs, even though that's a lie. He doesn't want the rich to pay taxes. He's not a billionaire, but apparently he doesn't like to pay taxes, and he doesn't. He doesn't pay his taxes. The IRS had to put a lien on his home. This is Stephen Moore from the Heritage Foundation Club for Growth, Wall Street Journal's editorial department. He wouldn't pay his taxes. They put a lien on his home. He also doesn't like to pay child support, Stephen Moore. And uh, they had a, his wife and kids had to sue him to get back child support. So that's who these people are. They don't care about their own children. Why would they care about yours? This is who they are. You know, Scarlett O'Hara from Gone with the Wind said, as God is my witness, I will never be hungry again. And that's who props up the billionaire class. People in these think tanks, people like Stephen Moore, who once or twice in their life tasted poverty and vowed, as God is my witness, I will never be hungry again, even if it means the rest of America has to be hungry. Interim Starbucks CEO Howard Schultz, who also grew up poor and looked at his father and said, as God is my witness, I will never be hungry again. That's Howard Schultz, the interim Starbucks CEO. He stepped down, now he's back, and he's touring America's Starbucks, urging his employees not to go union, not urging so much as threatening his employees not to go union. In an exchange with Madison Hall, a 25-year-old barista and union organizer working in Long Beach, California's Starbucks, Howard Schultz reportedly said, well, if you hate Starbucks so much, why don't you go someplace else? Hey, Howard Schultz, if you hate your employees who turned you into a billionaire so much, why don't you leave America? Seriously, take your money and get the F out of this country. Pull an Ayn Rand, you know, where you threaten to, to leave. Take your ball and leave and don't come back. We'll be better off without you. We don't need you, Howard Schultz. You are a cancer. Leave, take your billions and get the F out of this country. Meanwhile, Jordan Zacharin, writing for Perfect Union, says that Starbucks has fired Elisa Sanchez, a Starbucks employee working in Arizona, after Starbucks executives learned she was helping organize a union at her Starbucks in Arizona. Sanchez moonlights at Starbucks while working for our military, training to be a pilot. And so Howard Schultz fired a member of our military all because she wanted a livable wage. Howard Schultz, get the F out of America. You hate this country. You're unpatriotic. Get out of America. Take your billions and get out. Jordan Zuckerin over at Perfect Union also reports that Starbucks fired an outspoken union leader in Buffalo, New York. There are reports that Howard Schultz, the CEO of Starbucks, is beginning to punish leaders of Workers United for successfully organizing Starbucks workers in the Buffalo area. Angel Krempa, a ship's shift supervisor who worked at Starbucks for two years and had never been reprimanded until she identified herself as a union organizer, has been fired. In December, Krempa got written up for wearing multiple union pins on her Starbucks apron, even though she had permission from her Starbucks manager to wear those pins, but they fired her anyway. Al Jazeera is reporting that since those first Starbucks in Buffalo went union, Howard Schultz, the CEO of Starbucks, is now waging an unprecedented war of intimidation against union organizers that many labor activists insist violate the National Labor Relations Board. 
So far, workers in more than 100 Starbucks locations around America have petitioned the NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board, to hold union elections. Some of their demands include $25 an hour for a barista and a benefits plan that includes mental health. Some of you are thinking, I don't have that, so why should they have it? I know some of you are thinking that. I know people are thinking, why should they get $25 an hour and health benefits that include a psychologist if I don't get it? The answer is, if they get it, you'll get it. There are 9,000 Starbucks nationwide. Might be a good idea to contact Howard Schultz, CEO of Starbucks, who hates America. He hates America. If you hate unions, you hate America. You hate this country, Howard Schultz. You hate the working man and the working woman. You'll fire members of our military if they want to go union. You hate this country, Howard Schultz. Howard Schultz. Yes, I pronounced it properly. Howard Schultz. Howard Schultz, the multi-billionaire who ran for president in 2020. Remember that? And then he discovered everybody hates you, Howard Schultz, because you're full of Schultz. You are completely full of Schultz, Howard Schitts. Get out of this country. Go, go. You hate us. You hate your employees. Go live with the people who pick your coffee beans. That's a whole other Starbucks issue. Howard Schitt's built an entire business on exploiting third world countries, paying his bean pickers slave wages. According to The Guardian, children as young as eight, as young as eight in Guatemala are picking coffee beans for Howard Schitt's Starbucks. The children are paid fewer than $5 a day, are in breach of international labor regulations laid down by the UN's International Labor Organization. So just don't just leave America, Howard Schitts. Leave, leave this planet. We hate you. You're disgusting. You're repulsive. You're, you're basically a drug dealer. You deal caffeine and you're a drug dealer. And one day we will find out what caffeine is doing to our population, the massive doses of, of caffeine that uh, are, you'll see, you'll see. Go live in uh, Guatemala, Howard Schitts from Starbucks, with the children who pick your beans, Howard Schultz. How do you sleep at night? How do you, you know what? He can't sleep at night from all the caffeine. So he figures if as long as I can't sleep, I might as well hire eight year old children to pick my beans at $5 an hour. And I know it's complicated, right? Howard Schitts from Starbucks. I know it's complicated, you piece of Schultz. You know, I, it's complicated. How am I supposed to be worth billions of dollars if I stop paying eight year olds in Guatemala $5 a day to pick my beans, but they're liberal. You know, it's always they're liberal on all the social issues that don't cost Howard Schitts a penny. Get the F off my planet, Howard Schultz. Get the F out of here. And you know what? Go to Starbucks and when they write your name on a cup, write Go Union on it or maybe try Pete's. Or better yet, give up your five dollar latte and donate to the two candidates we have on today's show shahid buttar and congresswoman marie newman we actually have an incumbent on the show i have access today i have access i i never get access i have access today to a, an actual congressperson the world health organization issued a report last week saying that six million people around the world have died from covid 19. unfortunately one of them is not howard Schitts. one million americans have died from the disease more than in any other country america's death rate that's death per 100,000, is the highest in the industrialized world while America ranks in the top 20 worldwide in COVID deaths. So we more Americans have died than any other country. And, you know, on a per capita basis, that's also the case.
So it's not just because we have so many people. Well, but you know, uh, America's a great country. We came up with the vaccine. No, two Muslims in Germany came up with it and Pfizer licensed it. And we, our government paid for the Moderna, uh, the Moderna mRNA vaccine. According to a new report by the Centers for Disease Control, American Indian and Alaska Natives are three times more likely to get hospitalized from COVID, African Americans, 2.5 times more likely to be hospitalized, two times more likely to die from COVID. Hispanic or Latino persons are close to two times more likely to get COVID and close to three times more likely to be hospitalized. A new study from the Poor People's Campaign reveals that Americans living in poor rural counties are more likely to die from COVID than those living in wealthy counties here in America, because this is a diseased country. Speaking of diseased countries, in France, Marine Le Pen, the right-wing nationalist running against French President Emmanuel Macron, Marine Le Pen said over this weekend that if she's elected, and that will be at the end of this month, if she's elected, she will shut down the country's wind turbines and solar power installations. Marine Le Pen received a multi-million dollar loan eight years ago from Vladimir Putin, and she has promised to pull out of NATO and move France away from the EU and America. Do you see what Russian money does? Do you see how Putin operates? He props up right-wing nationalists like Orban or Marine Le Pen or Donald Trump or the entire Republican Party, and they all vow uh, that they'll never get off fossil fuel. And uh, that's what Putin wants, because so much of Russia's economy depends upon fossil fuel. Meanwhile, 73% of France's electricity comes from nuclear power, which Marine Le Pen and President Macron both support. Well, Tom Dispatch, pretty good news gathering organization, is reporting that during an earnings call in January with his investors, Raytheon Technologies CEO Greg Hayes said the possibility of war in Ukraine would be good for, you, for Raytheon's bottom line. Raytheon, Raytheon CEO Greg Hayes said, quote, we are saying, I would say, opportunities for international sales. The tensions in Eastern Europe, the tensions in the South China Sea, all of those things are putting pressure on some of the defense spending over there. So I fully expect we're going to see some benefit from it. God bless. What did, what did, what was it saying, Matthew? God bless the war makers. Isn't that what Jesus said? God bless the war makers, like Raytheon CEO Greg Hayes, who spoke to Harvard Business Review two weeks ago. And here's what he said uh, I think, again, um, recognizing, you know, we are there to defend democracy. And the fact is, eventually, we will see some benefit in the business over time. Uh, everything that's being shipped into Ukraine today, of course, is coming out of stockpiles, either at DOD or uh, from our NATO allies. And uh, that's all great news. Eventually, we'll have to replenish it. And we'll, we will see a, a benefit to the business over the next coming years. Yes, that's uh, that's the CEO of Raytheon, Greg Hayes, who says war is good business. That's why you do this, right? You make these missiles because it's profitable, right? We are there to defend democracy. Yeah, well, why don't you defend our democracy by getting the F out of my country? Why don't you just get out of my country? You're not defending democracy. You're defending your bottom line. A year ago, Raytheon stock sold for $78 a share. At the end of today, it was selling at $105 a share. It is up 20% since Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine. Hayes earns close to $20 million a year. So on behalf of all my listeners, rotten hell, Raytheon CEO, Greg Hayes, seriously rotten hell, really. And then get out of my country. Actually, this country is hell. 
there you have it. How much clearer do we have to make it? War is big business. War is big business. Well, on Friday, Israeli soldiers fired tear gas into the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem, the third holiest site in the Muslim religion. That was during Ramadan morning prayer services. This was an operation that lasted one hour. 158 Palestinians who were praying were injured. 500 were arrested. Jared Kushner, his new investment firm just got $2 billion from Saudi Arabia. Even though Jared Kushner is a cretin, he really is. He's a, you know, he had to buy his way into Harvard. Uh, he's a complete failure at real estate. He, his holdings were belly up. He had to, during the Trump administration, get a bailout from Qatar. He has no background in investing. He's a complete zero, but yet, he got $2 billion from Saudi Arabia. Why? Well, Juan Call, well, Professor Juan Cole writes over at Informed Comment that one of the reasons Saudi Arabia just handed Jared Kushner $2 billion to invest in Jared Kushner's newly created affinity fund management firm, one of the reasons is that Saudi Arabia is making a big bet that Donald Trump will return to the White House in 2025 and Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, also known as MBS, he's trying to curry favor with the Trump family. Professor Cole suggests that MBS could be paying Kushner back. This could be the bribe after the fact for helping Saudi Arabia secure the purchase of $110 billion worth of weapons from the United States. So what? why did they why did they buy your weapons, CEO of Raytheon, Greg Hayes? We are there to defend democracy. Yes, you're there to defend democracy in Saudi Arabia, the bastion of the Enlightenment, Saudi Arabia. Well, on today's show, we are joined by Congresswoman Marie Newman, who represents Illinois' 3rd District. Congressman Newman supported Senator Bernie Sanders' run for president in 2016 after he lost the nomination to Hillary. She heard the call and ran for Congress in 2018, where she lost the nomination to the incumbent Dan Lipinski, a blue dog Democrat, whose father first held that seat nearly 40 years ago. Kind of like, you know, the Pelosi dynasty. Shahid Buttar will be talking about how Nancy Pelosi wants to pass her seat to her daughter. It didn't work in 2020 for the Lipinskis. Marie Newman defeated Lipinski in the primaries. She received endorsements from Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, and Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot. And she went on to win the general election. Congressman Newman says she entered politics to make the world safe for her transgender daughter. She joins us at 7 p.m. with Howie Klein from the Blue America PAC. Congresswoman Newman has voted against America's funding of Israel's Iron Dome missile defense, which uh, is made partly by Raytheon because they want, why, what, what are you doing? We are there to defend democracy. Yes, yes, that's why Raytheon exists, to defend democracy. So uh, Congresswoman Newman uh, voted against America's funding of Israel's Iron Dome missile defense. She voted to impeach Donald Trump. And most importantly, she voted for Bernie Sanders Build Back Better, which, among other things, would provide universal preschool for all three and four year olds, ensure that the cost of insulin for diabetics is no more than thirty five dollars a month, and it would expand Medicare to include hearing aids, create more than 1 million new affordable housing, and uh, it would spend billions to improve public housing. Build Back Better, dead. It's dead. Thanks to West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin, Democrat, uh, whose announcement against Build Back Better last fall, when he said he wasn't going to vote for Bernie's Build Back Better, Goldman Sachs and Moody's Analytics revised their projections for economic growth downwards. When Manchin said he wasn't going to vote for Build Back Better, 
Goldman Sachs and Moody's Analytics said, well, this is not good for the economy. Imagine that Moody's and several leading economists agree that while Build Back Better might play a modest to insignificant role in inflation, it would in the long run be offset. That inflation would be offset by an increase in economic growth. And of course, if we can negotiate the price of drugs, uh, that would put a bite in inflation, wouldn't it, Joe Manchin? Build Back Better would have been paid for by increasing taxes on billionaires, as well as corporations who pay little to zero in taxes. Uh, Build Back Better would also start funding the Internal Revenue Service again so that it has the staff to start collecting taxes from the very wealthy who avoid paying taxes by hiring lawyers who wear the IRS down, which is why most of the auditing done in this country by the IRS is directed towards people at or below the poverty line. This is a, a really sick and diseased government. It really is. The IRS only has the staff to audit people who are living at or below the poverty line. The latest studies show that our Internal Revenue Service audits poor families making $25,000 a year or less at five times the rate of the rest of the country. This is what we do, right? We never pick on anybody our own size, right? Can't, can't go to war with North Korea. They have a nuclear bomb. Can't go to war with Pakistan. They have a nuclear bomb. Pick on somebody who's smaller. Punch down. This is what America does. So if you're poor and you claim the earn, earned income tax credit, this government will punish you with an audit. Why? Because they can. ProPublica reports that billionaires pay five times less in taxes than most Americans in terms of a percentage, five times less in taxes than most Americans. Between 2006 and 2018, Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos paid no income taxes at all for at least two of those years. So we know for a fact that twice between 2006 and 2018, Amazon CEO at least twice paid zero income taxes. Tesla CEO Elon Musk, the anti-union racist Elon Musk, didn't pay taxes in 2018. And if you think it's unfair to call Elon Musk a racist, ask the people who work for him at Tesla. Billionaires don't pay any taxes on their stock holdings. This is why Jeff Bezos doesn't have to pay taxes. If you're Jeff Bezos and say your stock in Amazon is worth, oh, I don't know, $200 billion, you only pay taxes on the dividends, which in Amazon's case are next to nothing. Amazon pays practically no dividends, if, at, if any at all. So there are no taxes to be paid if you're Jeff Bezos. Bezos only must pay taxes when he decides to sell shares of Amazon stock, which are then capital gains and taxed at a much lower rate than regular income. ProPublica reports that billionaires use something called the buy, borrow, die method, where they borrow against their wealth in order not to pay taxes. And then their estates, after they die, are able to avoid taxes in a very complicated tax dodge known as buy, borrow, die. Uh, from what I can understand, billionaires, what they do is they borrow money against their stocks. They live off the borrowed money, but they're borrowing it from their estate. And it's kind of like the same way people who are cash poor but rich on paper because they own a house, they're able to borrow against the value of their home. That money is borrowed at a much lower interest rate than what they would have to pay in taxes. Plus, the interest that they have to pay on the loan is often tax deductible. And then if you're a billionaire, it's all passed on to your estate after 
after you die. Now, why is it so complicated? And why is this thing buy, borrow, die legal? Because the billionaire class hires lawyers to go work for the government and they rewrite the tax code. That's the only reason. There is no economic theory to justify this as, as a public good. It's simply rich people flexing their muscles, hiring attorneys and accountants to go in there into the IRS and rewrite the code. That's what they do. It They pay off our politicians. And there are stories about tax attorneys and accountants who leave the, the private sector. They go to work for the Internal Revenue Service and they rewrite the code to benefit their clients, not just billionaires in general, but specifically for the clients. We are a kleptocracy. We are a kleptocracy. If you own an apartment building, the interest on your mortgage can often be deducted. But if you rent, no tax deductions. There is no mystery to why America has so many homeless people. Our government is controlled by homeowners who write the tax code to make it advantageous to landlords and punishing to people who rent. Our government is controlled by landlords. You know, like feudalism, that's where we're at. This is neo-feudalism. Our government is controlled by landlords who block the building of low-income housing as well as public housing because housing prices can only keep going up. And that's what you want if you're a landlord. Housing prices and rent can only keep going up if the demand outweighs the supply. So when the government fails to spend money on public housing or low-income housing, they are subsidizing anybody who owns a home. The reason your home is more valuable today than it was a year ago is because our government is subsidizing you by not taking care of the citizens, which is why we have homelessness in America. When you see homelessness, it's not complicated. It's not because they're mentally ill. It's because this country is mentally ill. People are homeless, not because they're veterans suffering from PTSD. It's not because they're transgender youth who can't get hired or they can't get rented because they're transgender youth. Liberals love that shit. They love to blame homelessness on all of the above, except for the truth, which is liberals are landlords and they don't want this government building more housing because then the value of their property will go down. That's who liberals in America are. They like to look compassionate. So it sounds smart. It sounds like you have a heart to say, well, it's a very complicated problem. Homelessness, it's veterans, it's transgender youth, it's uh, the mentally ill. No, it's because you're a greedy, watch your language, you have a congressperson on today. It's because you own a home and you want the price to go up. Liberals own homes. That's why they're not leftists. Liberals are landlords who want to be able to look themselves in the mirror each day. So homelessness can't not be their fault. They'll say homelessness has many fathers. No, it doesn't. There's a shortage of housing and the housing we do have is unaffordable. And liberals are liberals because they are landlords. They have degrees, so they must find complexity to justify their venality. There is no complexity. There is homelessness because liberals are pieces of shit. So if any of you out there think homelessness has anything to do with anything other than a shortage of homes, go look for a place to live making just $31,200 a year. Okay, give yourself $31,200 a year to work with and find a place 
to live on your own, not with kids, not don't be a single mom. That that's that's a homeless shelter. That's moving back in with your parents. That's just as an individual, find a place that you can live in, but you only have thirty one thousand two hundred dollars a year. That's where you're working uh, $15 an hour, if you're lucky to be making $15 an hour, and you're working 40 hours a week, if you're lucky enough to, to be working 40 hours a week, that's $2,600 a month, okay? Go find a place to live. I'm not saying, forget being a single mom. That just get, get a tent and live, go, get, go to a, house, a homeless encampment, forget it. Just an individual making twenty six hundred uh, a month, after taxes, after paying for food, clothing, transportation, and of course medicine, medical bills. You know, maybe you have some kind of insurance, but it doesn't cover everything. After all that, find a place to live on twenty six hundred dollars a month. There is a place for you to live, a tent city here in America. Try it. See if you can navigate the system. Then tell me that people are homeless because they're mentally ill. Or if they're mentally ill, uh, you know, tell me that the that, that people are on the streets because they're mentally ill. Uh, no, uh, they are mentally ill because they are homeless. That's why they're mentally ill. Living on the streets makes you mentally ill and this country is mentally ill this country is mentally ill and uh in denial and we refuse to see what discomforts us on monday thirty thousand children converged on the white house lawn to participate in president joe biden's very first white house easter egg roll uh, which is an all-day event dating back to the 19th century when President Rutherford B. Hayes realized that he could distract the nation from the fact that he was ending Reconstruction, pretty much canceling out why we fought the Civil War in the first place. He realized, you know, throw an Easter egg hunt at the White House lawn and nobody will realize that the Civil War was fought in vain because of Rutherford B. Hayes. That's uh, that's what the Easter egg hunt was all about. I'm going to turn the South over to the Klan and other assorted white supremacists. Freed blacks will all be arrested as vagrants and fill our prisons. We're going to lose the Civil War after winning it. But I'll host an Easter egg hunt on the White House front lawn to look like I'm what? Caring? Competent? Because, you know, Joe Biden has nothing better to do than MC an Easter egg roll. Well, part of the job is ceremonial. Uh, who says? Get, get Ryan Seacrest to do that part of the job. Look, the president, uh, this is his poll numbers. Like, I, I, I'm not the only one. This guy's, this guy's bad. And I'm not feeling sorry for him. People keep saying, why are you being so mean to the president? He's not my mother. He's not my father. He's not my friend. Nobody in politics should be your role model, your hero, your savior. They are our servants. Treat the people who serve you with respect when they deserve respect. If a waiter is spitting in my food, I'm going to spit back. And Joe Biden is spitting in our food. Uh, he's not doing anything for the American people. He's making things worse. He is making things worse, not better for America. He is there to distract us so we don't see the five richest families walking away with all our country's natural resources. Build Back Better died last fall. He couldn't do it. I don't think he wanted to. So now he distracts with Ukraine. When Ukraine could have been prevented, we have 
a White House, a belligerent White House right now that keeps talking about winning this thing as opposed to stopping this thing. If you look at the narrative coming out of Washington when it comes to Ukraine, when you look at the narrative out of the Biden White House, they are proudly saying that Putin is a lot weaker than even Putin imagined. They're saying he's in a bubble and that he blundered in Ukraine and we're going to beat him there. And then the Russian people will rise and remove him and then everything will go back to being like it used to be. Shitty and horrible. They, the White House is spinning this as a victory. They wanted this. They wanted cities turned to rubble, dead women and children, millions of refugees. They wanted this because they're spinning it like they're winning. Who is winning? Not the Ukrainian people and certainly not the American people, maybe the guy from Raytheon. The thing that we need to understand is there are people in the councils of our government who right now are lobbying to double double our military budget and take the war to Putin. There are people who want to double the military budget, double our military budget. No, no money, no money for healthcare, universal preschool, insulin for diabetics, but double our defense sp spending to fight Putin because there are some sick, effed up cretins in America who believe in American exceptionalism, that we need to be the primary superpower, and that if we aren't, then China or Russia will fill the vacuum. Yeah, we've got 140 million Americans living at or below the, the poverty line. We have the worst, the worst healthcare system in the industrialized world while we're paying the most for it. Our democracy is a failure. In a survey of voter turnout, we rank next to dead last in the industrial world. So what is this American exceptionalism that we need to spread to the rest of the world? What is the, this benefit to our being the primary military superpower? I'm not seeing any of the benefits. We spend more on defense than everybody else combined, and I'm not making that up. We spend more on defense than everybody else combined, and now they want to double that. Did we win in Afghanistan or Iraq? Can we shoot North Korea's missiles out of the sky? What are we getting for what we're spending now other than loss and 400,000 dead civilians. All I hear about now is the Patriot missiles that can shoot incoming rockets out of the sky made by our friends over at Raytheon. And we're deploying them all over Europe, right? That's what we're being told. Patriot missiles to shoot down incoming missiles all over Europe. We're giving them to Poland. And yet somehow we can't invade North Korea because he has nuclear tipped missiles. What, what about our Patriot? What about the, the, tri the Patriot missiles? What about the trillions we have spent on the Star Wars defense initiative since Ronald Reagan took office? We spent trillions and we still can't shoot a missile out of the sky. And yet we're planting Patriot missiles in Eastern Europe to shoot missiles out of the sky, unless that's one big lie, which it is. They say we can shoot missiles out of the sky. Then they say we can't shoot missiles out of the, the sky. We deploy the Patriot missiles in Europe and we're told it can shoot Russian missiles out of the sky. And then we're told, but we can't risk World War III because we can't shoot Russian missiles out of the sky. And those missiles have nuclear are nuclear tipped. Uh, do you feel safe or confused? Do you feel you're living under a blanket of security that, that we're protected from incoming Russian, Chinese, or North Korean missiles? I don't feel safer. After all the trillions we gave to Raytheon 
to shoot missiles out of the sky and all the lies they have told us, the bedtime story that they're telling Poland, oh, we, we, here, take our Patriot missiles. We can shoot Russian missiles out of the sky. It's a lie. We can't shoot them out of the sky. And you know who knows that? Here's who knows that we can't shoot missiles out of the sky. Our military. Our military knows we can't shoot the missiles out of the sky. And that's why the Pentagon it goes before the House Armed Services Committee and says, no, we're not setting up a no-fly zone over Ukraine because that could lead to World War III. And World War III could mean nuclear-tipped missiles coming across the ocean into America. And even though most Americans are convinced we can shoot those missiles out of the sky, we can't. We can't shoot them out of the sky. Does anybody remember mutual assured destruction? MAD, remember that? That was the deal we had with Russia. You can destroy us. We can destroy you. There's nothing we can do about it. Both of us, we won't build anti-ballistic missiles like the Patriot missiles. So I guess we're just going to have to learn to get along. That was mutual assured destruction. Well, America secretly left that under George Bush. And so Americans, even though it's still mutual assured destruction because we can't shoot Russian missiles out of the sky. Most Americans have been misled into believing that we can shoot them out of the sky, but we can't. We can't. Well, one of the reasons the world hasn't been destroyed since the invention of the atomic bomb is this world was run at a time by people who were willing to live with a certain amount of uncertainty. Eisenhower, the, the Khrushchevs, the Brezhnevs, the Kennedys, even the Nixons, uh, the Carters, they, they knew that only a child like mine thinks they will ever be completely safe. So you dial back the rhetoric and you make sure you don't do anything rash. And then an idiot a senile fool named Ronald Reagan became president and he saw some movie in the 40s about being able to shoot missiles out of the sky and he dreamed up this fantasy of the Star Wars Defense Initiative and he spent trillions to shoot missiles out of the sky. Never worked and now most Americans think we can shoot missiles out of the sky uh, and that allowed brash talk. And now we have people advising Joe Biden who either think we can shoot Russians missiles out of the sky or think, eh, what's a couple of million dead? These are childlike minds with degrees. Some of them have degrees, but they're children who are unwilling. They get terrified about uncertainty. They don't understand that most of the problems go away if you give it time. But these are children, Jen Psaki, Blinken, Biden. They have childlike minds. Jake Sullivan, our national security advisor, like Condi Rice and Dick Cheney and George W. Bush and Rumsfeld. These are children who can't handle uncertainty. And they're not, they're too stupid to understand that time is a massive wave and time will heal if you just try to go with time. Time is a wave and you try to stay on the surfboard for as long as you possibly can without crashing into the rocks or falling off. That's how you avoid war. That's how up until around now, we were able to avoid destroying the planet even though there are plenty of nuclear weapons out there. You gotta work with time. Putin is going to be 70. He's surrounded by people in his 70s. Yes, he's horrible, but he has nothing to do with us. So why are we meddling in Russia's government? Why are we nipping at his heels, encouraging Ukraine to join NATO? Why are we, why did we turn the Soviet Union after it fell? Why do we turn Russia into a kleptocracy? That's what Wall Street did. It descended on Moscow after the fall of the Soviet Union, like vultures, and they converted Russia into a kleptocracy because that's what we are.
That's what we are. We created the oligarchs. We turned Russia into a kleptocracy because America is a kleptocracy. And even though we just lost a 20 year war on terror that killed 400,000 innocent civilians, even though it hasn't even been a year since we left Afghanistan with our tail between our legs, somehow, somehow we're supposed to now double our defense spending because we are the indispensable actor on the world stage. The world needs us. Who benefits from this? All this money is stolen from our government so that they could double our defense spending. And it goes into the greedy paws of the CEO of Raytheon and the bankers. And they keep us in line by questioning our patriotism. It's I'm the one. I'm the one who's unpatriotic. I'm the one who's unpatriotic because I'm against World War III. Don't you love this country? Don't you support the troops? Yeah, I do. Well, don't you want to keep it safe? Yeah, from you. I want to keep it safe from you. I want to keep this country safe from military adventurism that only makes it more dangerous to be an American. Iraq and Afghanistan made us less safe. When you kill 400,000 civilians, that's 400,000 individual reasons someone is going to decide to deploy a terrorist to blow up a building in America. We are less safe because of the global war on terror. And more importantly, we are less free. There's less money for us, and that makes us less free. So Joe Biden is playing a very dangerous game with Russia and Ukraine, and there are always unintended consequences. I don't trust Joe Biden or the people he surrounds himself with. The enemy is not Putin or Russia. The enemy is oil. We need to be getting off oil. That's our existential threat. Not Putin, it's oil. Oil, fossil fuels. You want to stop all the wars? Get rid of fossil fuels. We're either fighting wars over fossil fuels or because of fossil fuels, because of the famine that fossil fuels create or the droughts that fossil fuels create. Putin, his oil, that's not the issue. The issue is all oil. We need to destroy the oil companies. So if you own a share in, in, in an oil company, then you are a bigger threat to my children than Vladimir Putin. If your income, if your wealth is predicated on owning oil stock, you're the one who needs to go, not Vladimir Putin. Don't tell me it's complicated. Everybody needs to sell their shares in oil. Universities must divest, foundations, museums, everyone must sell their shares in oil companies and drive down the price of oil companies, not the price of oil, the price of what it costs to buy these mass murderers like ExxonMobil. Everyone must sell their shares in oil companies, mutual funds, banks, everybody has to divest themselves of oil companies so that no matter how much they drill and then pay out in dividends, nobody wants to own them. This is a moral issue. You want to help the people of Ukraine? Get off oil. Even President Zelensky said that. Why is it that America can't live with the uncertainty of Vladimir Putin? but is perfectly okay living with the uncertainty of climate change. We are mentally ill and we are stupid and we are getting the entire world killed because we consume most of the oil. Two years ago, Noam Chomsky said he was voting for Biden because the Republican Party's climate denial makes them more dangerous than the Nazis. In terms of raw numbers, sitting back, denying climate change, that will kill way more people, according to Noam Chomsky, than the Nazis could have ever dreamed of. So after more than a year of the Democrats controlling the White House, the Senate, and the House, 
What have they done other than some, some window dressing, incrementalism? We rejoined the Paris Agreement. Biden is getting us killed. Just like Trump, he is doing nothing about climate change. Change. Schumer is getting us killed. Mansion, Cinema, or Tester, or Warner. It's not just Mansion. There are tons of right wing Democrats, and they were never a surprise. We knew who they were before the 2020 election. If you were running for president and you cared about climate change and you were a Democrat, you better have come up with a plan to deal with Mansion, Cinema, Tester, Warner, or you should not have run for president because the clock is ticking on this planet. It's not the Republicans' fault. They're Nazis. They're a cancer. It's not the Supreme Court's fault. It's not the Electoral College's fault. It's not Citizens United. We've got the White House, we've got the Senate, and we've got the Congress right now. It is the Democrats' fault right now. With a stroke of a pen, Joe Biden could take on the oil companies and he could mobilize the American people to march on the oil companies. He knew who Joe Manchin was. Biden was vice president. He was in the Senate. He knew exactly who Joe Biden, who Joe Manchin was. He was Joe Manchin was Joe Biden. They're, they're, they're both the same. And Joe Biden knew what he was going to be up against with Joe Manchin. And he didn't have a plan. This is malfeasance. We have a president who can't even defeat a small time backwater revenue agent on the take like Joe Manchin. But somehow we're going to trust him to take on Putin. Like I keep saying, the Republicans are a cancer, but it is the Democrats who are supposed to be the surgeons who we brought in to get rid of this cancer and Joe Biden cannot do it sorry i'm sorry but the job of president is not occupational therapy for senior citizens who are twilighting you want to work on your cognitive functions go to a nursing home stay out of my white house joe biden you are not up for this job all right we will be back but first some music from mike steinell We got poor song hysteria in the greater Bay Area. We heard about it on CNN.com. I guess they're calling it a swine bomb. We've been infested by feral hogs. They messed up my lawn and they ate my dogs. They're taking over and they're out of control. We're gonna organize a swine patrol. We got a swine bomb. Doing the swine bomb boogie. These hogs are smelly and they make nasty sounds. Some of them weigh close to 800 pounds. Now you tell me if you think I'm mistaken. I think that sounds like an awful lot of bacon. These critters are mean, they can tear into you. Here's what they say you're supposed to do. Get on your car or climb up a tree. Cause pigs can't climb, at least that's what they tell me. We're in a swine bomb. Pigs can't climb. Doing the swine bomb boogie. Pigs can't climb. Folks are getting guns and shooting them on sight. I doubt if Peter thinks that's all right. All my life I've been for gun control. Now they done put me on swine patrol. Pigs can't climb and white men can't jump. All we can do is a bumpity bump. 
Can we chill these pigs out with some smooth and metal jazz? Round them all up and send them to Alcatraz. We're doing the swine bomb boogie. We got a swine bomb. The pigs can't climb. We're doing a swine bomb boogie. We got a swine bomb. The pigs can't climb. We're doing a swine bomb boogie. The pigs can't climb. We got a swine bomb. The pigs can't climb. We got swine hogs all over the place. We're doing a swine bomb boogie. The pigs can't climb. We're gonna do If I knew I would tell you Seems like we're gonna do the big scat Big scat Thank you so much Professor Mike Steinel, Swine Bomb Boogie. Well, you're listening to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. Coming up at 7, we are joined by Congresswoman Marie Newman, and then at 7.30, Shahid Buttar, who will be defeating Nancy Pelosi uh, in November. He's running for Congress. Well, let us welcome back to this show Jason Miles and Pascal Robert, they're co-hosts of the This Is Revolution podcast. Go to thisisrevolutionpodcast.com. Welcome, Pascal. Hey, how are you, David? Thank you for having me on. I thought I was seeing Jason maybe he's having some technical difficulties, making it difficult for him to appear today. Uh, let me just do a quick check. Maybe he, let's see. Uh, I see Pascal. Maybe he's, nope. I don't see him in, well, I'm sure he'll join us. Uh, but let's let's talk about your show because you have Boston College sociologist, Dr. I'm gonna- Zine uh, Magubande, I believe that's how you pronounce her name. She's an African last name. Ma- right. Magubande, Magubande. And she has an article coming out on the framing of race that comes out of both intersectionality and critical race theory and yes. how it here's the role of class and the material realities that lead to hardship for working class and poor black, brown, yellow, and white communities. Let me make a pitch for diversity. Okay. Uh, do you think that it's possible that corporate America is doing things ass backwards by going with diversity first, but then maybe this diversity could lead to unions, this kind of wokeness, part of wokeness does include class struggle? Uh, That's a very good question. And I would make the argument that number one, part of the problem I have with the way the the question is framed is it assumes that for us on the left, we should be interested in the best will for corporations when our politics is about trying to neutralize the capitalist efficacy of corporations. So it's not particularly in my wheelhouse to spend my emotional energy as someone who is left of the liberals by far in terms of what is best for corporations, because my goal is to redistribute the wealth from the corporations to the masses. That being said, I don't want to act like I'm dodging your question. I am not a person who believes that we should go back to the bad old days when only white males had corporate jobs. I believe that with the legal protections that we had coming out of the civil rights era, you know, Civil Rights Act of, of uh, 64, Title VII, and all of those, you know, all of those economic discrimination laws should preclude the capacity of employers from discriminating against people. Now, do I believe that there's an argument based on past denial of inclusion that merits augmenting inclusion in these spaces, my position is that I'm still more interested in redistributing the wealth from those spaces to the people who are on the margins of the classes that are not getting that wealth. Because what we find with these types of 
diversity, equity, inclusion paradigms is that it basically is a competition for elites at the top or the best spots while there's no distribution. For example, uh, Walter Ben Michaels is a very good academic who's a friend of Adolf Reed who talks about how in the 50 years plus po past post the civil rights movement, we have had the greatest proliferation of diversity, equity and inclusion into the corporate and private sector spaces clearly than what it was before the civil rights movement. You know what has also been happening at the same time? Wealth inequality between the top 1% and the rest of the country has been proliferating. Right. So right. What has been the benefit of that, that, that diversity, equity, inclusion, except to give a symbolic uh, salve to American capitalism? Does he see how wonderful it is? We have Ketanji Brown Jackson. We have Kamala Harris. We have Barack Obama. America is great. Don't you want to, don't you guys, aren't you glad that you live in this country? Right. So I, I'm a, a Naderite, which is a disservice to Ralph Nader. I, I don't, you know, I, I believe in what Ralph Nader believes, but I don't speak for him. But so my, what I take from him and then filter through my own stupidity, and I am not speaking for Ralph Nader, is there is a way to work within the system, the democratic system to this. And I'm not arguing. I'm just, I, I just, I, I, I'm just trying to hear your response to this idea that if we organize, if the American people use the tools that were given to us by the founding fathers, even though there are tools given to the corporations and the richest 1% from the founding fathers, but if we, the 99%, organize and focus that we we can affect democratic change that would change capitalism, that we'd go from to, to a more like a, a co-op model. This is not Ralph Nader, this is me now, but, but where, where if we can somehow gain the levers of power, we could not necessarily nationalize the oil companies, but at least own 10% of the oil companies, which is a major voting share and dictate policy. What do you say to that? I know it's incrementalism. I know. Well, my position, my position is pretty clear is that I have no problem with the idea of revolution, but I also realize that revolution for the sake of revolution is fetish. The goal, if you're going to have a revolution, is not to do it for the sake of doing it. It's because you want to improve the material conditions of people's lives. And until you have an agenda to do that, that I don't suggest you to say revolution for the sake of revolution. Right. On the path to revolution, if you believe one is necessary, I don't think that you should turn down reform, but you should not be a reformist. So I do believe in organizing and mobilizing people, and I do not believe my politics is not about abstentionism. I'm not telling people don't vote because the system is corrupt. And I'm not one of those kind of leftists. I believe in organizing. I'm not a fan of the Democratic Party. I actually don't believe in telling people who they should vote for or telling people what party they should be in. I believe in giving people political education about how the system works and telling them what class politics about their material interests may work better for them depending on what they want and organize them to make the choices that empower them. I'm not trying to be their ventriloquist, whether they are black, white, and otherwise. I would hope that people who are on the economic margins realize why politics of economic redistribution are better for them. Now, the, to the direct question you're asking, do we live in a period of capitalism where reform is possible in a way that can make the system more equitable? I would make the argument that in the last 50 years, we've had a particular type of, type, particular type of capitalism called neoliberalism, which is a fancy word, hyper-privatization, wealth goes upward, gutting of the government services. You know what I'm talking about. And as a consequence, uh, wealth is, is accumulating at the top. There's not a lot of redistribution. There's a lot of precarity in the job spaces. And people are not exactly feeling the bets of this iteration of capitalism, which was intentional. But why did we go into neoliberalism? We went into neoliberalism because America could not con 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 compete and did not have the monopoly trade advantage that it had under the Bretton Woods era from 41 to 71 because Germany and Japan started to manufacture and started to more equity, uh, more uh, uh, 
more better off in terms of trading capacity. So we didn't have the muscle to sell enough goods to finance even the New Deal type of reforms, which was the best that we've ever had in this country for most of humanity, even though it didn't help a lot of black and brown or women by that by fact. So that particular period of if you will, New Deal progressivism was based on the fact that after the Marshall Plan and bankroll in Europe, America had a monopoly on global trade. Okay, right. so my question is that if you want to be uh, be real about it, what kind of paradigm allows America to have the actual kind of economic trade capacity where we could refund another New Deal? on the same terms that we had the old one, except be more inclusive racially, gender-wise, than anywhere else, that'll take more money and more legislation, when the realities aren't the same. I, I just have to address something, because somebody wrote just now, 1922 called, David, they want your economic policy back. You know, when you're hosting a show and you have a guest like Pascal Robert on, Part of the, the dialectic is presenting the other side and asking questions to, to, so that it prepares my audience to talk to conservatives. So my, my uh, articulating what the other side is saying does not belie my support of neoliberalism or neoconservatism. I mean, there is a problem in this country where uh, some Americans have an ideology and even playing devil's advocate or posing a question so you to teach people how to talk to the other side is deemed wrong and suspect treasonous, treasonous to 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 vocalize what the other side is thinking how the fuck are you going to talk to people and get things done if you don't know what the other side is thinking i mean sometimes sometimes the people who listen to my show like some of them I just go you just want to be you you're you just want to be told what you already know and that's why we're losing you don't know what the other side is thinking or why they're thinking it or what they want sorry no it's quite right. I understand the frustration. sometimes the chat room gets me pissed off I understand the frustration. No, I yeah. really do. Try not to read it sometimes. Go ahead. I'm sorry. The point I was going to make to you is that I'm not opposed to reform to improve the material quality of people who are not economically able to make, maximize the best returns on this current system. I, I, I support that. My position is that the precarity of American capitalism right now, I don't particularly see the paradigm where we could have some kind of New Deal 2.0, where we have more global comp competitors on the international trade, we have more debt as a country and th than we did before, and what exactly is going to be the means that this, this will happen? Yes, I'm a fan of federal jobs guarantee. Yes, I'm a fan of, of, uh, of uh, 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 national health care. Yes, I'm a fan of, of uh, uh, tuition-free public state education. All of that is wonderful. Those things will help many people. Those things don't stop capitalism, and they will not stop the precarity that capitalism will, the, the will require. Now, if you were asked, well, Pascal, well, what is your economic paradigm? Well, guess what? I have one. And it is a, co a cooperative socialist-like paradigm. We have a capitalist, alleged free market system, system in America right now. We have you know, hundreds of, of, of Fortune 500, we have Fortune 500 companies, publicly traded corporations. I say this. All of the publicly traded corporations we have on the securities exchanges, divide them in thirds. One third goes into a trust for all citizens in society. One third goes for the original private investors who started the country, the, comp the companies, and one third in a trust for the government that diminishes the need for taxes and the government can get that revenue from that third. Each third has voting shares in all corporations in the country. We remove interest and use an equity-based lending. Why? Because interest allows proliferation of vampire suckage from the banks and use equity-based lending. What does that mean? I want to buy a house. Guess what? I'll lend you the money and we will, I will lend you the money from the house and you pay me back as the equity value in your house goes up. So when your value goes up, my value goes up and you use that to pay me the principal and I have a share in the increased equity of your loan instead of the sucking money from you, whether you make money or not. Okay. You can have you, a whole financial system functioning like that. Can you, can you 
do say that exactly what you just said, but slower so it can think sink into my thick skull. It's called equity based lending. Normally now you want to borrow buy, buy a house, you get a loan for hundred thousand dollars, and it says six percent of interest, nine percent. No matter what, you pay nine percent forever. The house goes down in value, you still pay nine percent and the principal. The house goes up in value, you pay 9% and the principal. Equity-based lending says, I lend you the principal and you pay me a percentage of the increase of market value in the house per year. So I'm investing in your house with you. In other words, I'm only going to give you a loan if I know this house is going to increase in value over time. What do you do? But what? Okay, this is interesting. But what do you do if you buy a house for a hundred thousand dollars, and then one year it doubles, and suddenly you you have to pay? You, you, no, you, 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 this is all in the agreement. You can agree to the term. I don't get all of the equity that increases. We 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 come a fixed amount. It doesn't. I mean, the goal is to get back the principal and a fair market share that we agree upon that you give me a percentage of the equity. I don't want 50% of the equity. Maybe it's four, maybe it's five, whatever it is. That's negotiable. But you also have, I mean, I'm just running this through. So if you you buy a house for $100,000 and you're going to owe 5% of what the house is worth each year. not, not, Not just the worth, the increase in value, the increase in equity. In other words, I want to invest in you making profit. What that does, it diminishes spurious lending. In other words, you're going to get a loan when I know that you can make money and I can make money. Right. The problem with that, though, is uh, nobody knows what a house is worth until it's sold. So That's how do you? Well, what is it? What, I mean, there are ways. I mean, I worked in real estate. You can. Look at the trends of the of the neighborhood over time. There's ways you can for, forecast the that. way the government assesses your income tax. Right. The goal. The goal. My my so you're position the, value, that, the taxes on your house. Right. My, my position is that we should stop making living off loans a business for banks. Banking should be simply a place where you lend principal to invest in purchases or, or assets where the lender and the borrower both benefit to diminish the parasitic capacity of capital, of parasitic of interest, simply being siphoned off, regardless of the condition of the investment, whether it goes down or up, and going to banks. Right. I'm not trying to live in a society where banks have more money than anywhere else. And so talk to me again about dividing the country into three the trusts. corporations are divided. In other words, all of the shares are all publicly traded corporations. One third in a trust where all citizens per capita receive shares of all of the publicly traded companies. And it goes into a trust where they receive their, their dividends from their shares. One third goes to the people who started the corporations. So they still profit from the company. And one third is you know, in a state uh, trust for the government to diminish its need for taxes that is used not to pay. I'm sorry, hang on. It's Dr. Katz from, uh, hang on. I, I can't take the call. Uh, you know, Jonathan Katz, Dr. Katz. Uh, so go, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, no problem. Yeah, the goal is to set up a paradigm where the government has its, its third, the, the, pop, the citizens have their third, and the original initiators of the business get their third. The government is not keeping that money to pay fat cat salaries to politicians. They use the money from the revenue from those corporations to do public goods investment, quality schools, quality healthcare, and innovation and research and development to improve the quality of lives of people in that society. We can have decisions in terms of how those funds are allocated when the government receives them. Also, to show that we're not trying to dissuade private small business ownership, your gut, your business doesn't get divided in thirds until it reaches a certain percentage of profit per year. In other words, we can say only businesses that make over $100 million a year will be eligible to be divided cooperatively. Why do you do that? Because you, dis- you don't disincentivize small business development. Right. Capitalism, I keep hearing about this is end stage capitalism because it certainly looks like it. 
or it, it isn't even capitalism where this is feudalism in a way that we're, where we're heading that argument made yeah yeah so what stuns me is capitalism or whatever you want to call this system has a pretty resi resilient way of landing on its feet absolutely like this thing in ukraine we just pulled out of Afghanistan with our tail between our legs and we're already talking about doubling defense spending now nobody's questioning it so what it, is that part of end stage capitalism is this farce is this farce I will make the argument and I, I, my goal is not to offend the, the viewers. You cannot have a capitalist society with highly informed citizens. Right. Right. But I'm stunned that, the, you know, when you think of the accelerationist argument that I keep hearing, well, things just have to get really bad and then people are going to wake up. No, they go, they just go into a deeper slumber. Right. Because I think that there are mechanisms we have, whether it be entertainment, fast food, there are ways the system can dull people down and make them ripe for exploitation and still think that they're enjoying things. Right. By the way, I'm sorry I got angry about that comment in oh, the it's chat. Not, it's, quite, it's quite all right. So it's, I, I, I get frustrated when people accuse me of believing what I'm asking as, a, as opposed to trying to find the answers uh, so questions posed by frauds like David Brooks or, you know, uh, or Joe Biden. It's just very frustrating. Uh, do you know David Cobb? He ran for president on the Green Party ticket and he managed. How are you, David? Pleasure to meet you. My name is Pascal Robert. How are you? It's a pleasure to meet you as well. I, I, anybody on the Feldman show is a friend of mine. So I, I am interested Wonderful. in getting to know you. Thank you. Why don't we do this? Why don't we spend five minutes overlapping, getting you two to know each other? Because I think David Cobb and Pascal are allies. And Pascal was just unveiling something called equity based lending. And uh, David Cobb is active right now in public banking. Uh, tell David what, t David, tell Pascal. I think what David you've been might have heard, I'm, I'm sure he's probably heard of equity-based lending. I don't of think course he's he has. I have, and I'm super excited, Pascal, because what I'm going to do is actually uh, give you the context to invite you to tell me more about what you do, because it's true I'm active with public banking, but uh, that is part of the context. I have the honor of serving as the coordinator uh, of the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network, where we do public banking and participatory budgeting and worker cooperatives and community land that, trust. I like that. Right? Excellent. So what we say is democratizing all of economics, right? There you go. So sometimes called non-reformist reforms, Pascal, right? Yes. So, so that's my national work with the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network. But I'm really excited to talk to you because I have a new job David Feldman may not even know this yet, but I resigned my position as the executive director of a nonprofit called Cooperation Humboldt in order to take a job with the Wiat tribe, the local uh, uh, tribe upon whose ancestral land I occupy mm. to, to uh, coordinate the Dishkama Community Land Trust that's gonna do both regenerative economic development and affordable housing and restoration ecology jobs, and we're putting together integrated capital stacks to take philanthropic money, equity money, state and federal money. Uh, it, and so I'm very eager to talk to you and your expertise around equity lending, because for us, we call it the full spectrum of capital. Like there's probably literally 15 different types of money. See, I grew up poor. I always thought there was just one type of money. I'm now learning there's probably 15 different types of money, right? Hmm. And so with that, I'd love to hear where you're at with the work that you do. Well, this is, I mean, I, I, I worked in real estate. I practiced law for a while, but my goal is, as I said, is to create an economic paradigm where banks don't live off rent from money. 
So instead of just giving you a fixed interest rate where even if your business is going downward, they make money, I say let them lend you the principal and have a contract with you that they make money off a percentage of the profit you make in your business, which does two things. They will only lend to profitable businesses and they will get a fixed income in investing in the benefit of your business in the future. So risk is spread fairly. It's not one-sided. So what, one of the main reasons why I like equity-based lending is it's not a win-win for banks. I don't believe that banks should be the only institutions that are flush with cash in the society. I think risk should be spread fairly. And I think that lending should be done in a way where it maximizes profits for the lender and the one receiving the loan in a way where it's an investment mechanism into the equity growth of the business instead of a parasitic leaching, regardless of the quality of the business, a fixed VIC no matter what. Pascal, you and I are gonna have to talk, right? I'm gonna literally send you through uh, David Feldman uh, a link to my calendar so you can schedule a 30 minute conversation with me one-on-one -on -one because I do wanna say this. One of the things that I have, like, so I'm a, I'm a lawyer, right? I like, got a warning. Like, Pascal is a lawyer too. So there you go. So Pascal, like, here's what I say. Almost all of us who went into law, at least of my generation, you see the gray beard, right? That went into to, to law to like be a movement lawyer or a people's lawyer. We almost all ended up either doing personal injury trial law, you know, fight for justice for the injured worker, or we did criminal defense, right? To fight against the repressive racist state against, uh, uh, against you know people who were being victimized, or we went into mass uh, uh, defense work, you know, for protests and so forth, or fourth immigration law to fight for justice in that community, right? But note that every one of those are almost all sort of reactionary kinds of uh, reactive. work. They're all reactive. We ha almost none of the people like me and you went in to transactional work. So there is a real dearth of knowledge around how to do transactions from a racial and social justice equity lens. We just don't have enough lawyers who know how to put those deals together, right? right. And so we need to build out that team. No, I agree with you, I appreciate that. Jason is here, Jason wanna jump in? Hey, Jason, Jason is the co-host of this is revolution and he's responsible for their brilliant video essays and he comes to us from mexico we're eating into david cobb's time that's the, the no, no, oh, keep okay. these cats here no, I, you're not about about my time. Like, I, I totally to want to have this conversation i want to get on your podcast as a guest and talk about and i want y'all to hear i'm literally this this weekend or uh, this this earth day the we are tribe cooperation on bolt and Cal Poly University are putting together a conference called Decolonizing Economics. And I want you all to know about it because next year I want you all part of it. I'm going to literally drop it in uh, to the, so uh, to David, the link. David, David he'll, you can email us. He'll, he'll email it to us. I'll email it. Jason, you're going to stick around because I actually have to, to, to depart. I got to get ready. Are, are we on now? Because I'm so confused at everything that's happening right now. Well, am I well, late or am I early? You're late. You're late. Oh, then I apologize. Well, but that's okay. We're, we're glad to see you. And uh, will you come back next week? Yes. Oh, well, yeah. And I'll be on time because I've messed up. I thought it was uh, on 30, on a half. So well, you, you missed me getting angry at the chat. Oh, no. That was nice. Little, well, I'm on edge. I'm on. I'm, yeah, good it, conversation, though. I'm sorry. We had a good conversation, though. Yeah, we have a great conversation because I'm not trying to create a uh, a uh, an echo chamber. You know, we're yeah. you have to be able to understand what the other side is thinking. Uh, anyway, Jason Miles and Pascal Robert are the hosts of This Is Revolution podcast. Yeah. And Jason, very quickly, why don't you plug your uh, your show and tell us what your next video is on. Sure. Uh, we have a show coming up. Uh, I've titled it uh, Racial Democracy versus Social Democracy. Uh, the problems with uh, race reductionism in social policy. So that's a long wordy title. Um, it's shorter than what Pascal told me to have the title. So that should tell you how wordy we were trying to get to explain what we we're going to talk about. But 
Um, kind of talking about things like critical race theory, intersectionality, and even anti-racism. Um, what are they really doing? Um, is it helping? Are they just trying to offer more capitalistic reforms? Is this just bourgeois liberal democracy masked as something more? Um, we have a very, very interesting guest. Uh, Pascal, can you say her name? I don't want to say Mugubande, Mugubane, Mugubane, Zin Mugubane. And she wrote this uh, fabulous paper. I didn't even want to send it to you because it was too long and I knew you weren't going to have time to read it, David. <laughs> but, At least you uh, think I could read. <laughs> <laughs> it, was just, it was too long and I was like, there's no way he's got time to read this. But um, it looks That's like I may, it looks like Ben Burgess and I may be in the East Coast doing some live stuff. And I want to know if it's cool if we uh, come by and, and hang out with you in real life. I love that. That would be great. Sounds yeah. Good. Yeah. Let's wrap it up because Pascal has to go. And Jason, we'll see you both next week, I hope. Thank you so much. Definitely. Everybody listen to the This Is Revolution podcast. Thank you for taking time to Thank be you, David. See you guys. Joining us is David Cobb, who's been away for a while. It's good to see you, sir. Uh, as mentioned earlier, you're a lawyer. You ran for president on the Green Party ticket, and you also ran Ralph Nader's presidential campaign. I want to talk about whatever you want to talk about, but I have a question. Sure. Uh, I promise myself I will not give them the fight. I'm dealing. We're all dealing with a lot of crap. And one of the things I've noticed is the only thing I can control is how I interact with other people, how I receive other people and give in return. And, you know, I'm a bitter, angry guy who, you know, I, I don't mind destroying things if people are bad. And I, I've been saying to myself, I'm not going to give them the fight. I'm not going to give them the fight. And, and somebody wrote something in the chat room and the bell went off and it was like round one. I'm ready for how how do you not give them the fight? All right. So thank you for that framing. Uh, boy, I really regret that I didn't come on early enough to see whatever it is that we're talking about. And what the chat is right. But it has, can, it had nothing to do with the, it has nothing to do with what was written in the chat room all good but but let me let, i'm going to respond in two ways right because what you framed is really important uh, and two things one have to has to do with the fact that i have 26 years of recovery uh, as a recovering alcoholic um and so i really want to and the second one is i want to talk about righteous anger so the first thing is as somebody with 26 years of recovery, what I understand with clarity is that I do not control other people. Hell, I don't even persuade other people. What I can, like, I might be able to inspire them, I might be able to provoke them to think a certain way, but literally, David, and you said it, I wanna anchor it. The only thing that you control is your own reaction to what is happening in the world. That includes what other people are saying, what other people are doing. Uh, and one thing that I have come to really understand is that if I am, if I get provoked to the point that I am yelling, screaming, that I'm in anger, reacting, I'm no longer communicating. Wow. Uh, and certainly not inspiring or persuading, but you know what? Sometimes that's all right, because if you can't hold that shit in, right? If, if there is something that just gets so much, you've got to, that's why they call venting your frustration or venting anger, right? And that, that's the segue. Point one, you really only control yourself. You can't control other people, but you can control how you react to it. It's like you can't control thoughts that pop into your head, but you can damn sure control your conduct. That's why I might be so angry that I like metaphorically want to murder you, but you can't hold me responsible for wanting in my head to strangle you for some dumbass thing that you've said, right? right? If I put hands on you, then you can control it. So number one, you're absolutely right. You can only control yourself. 
point two, and I really want to anchor this, that there is something called righteous anger, right? Anger, like righteous anger is a unique type of anger, right? Because if you are provoked by anger at something that is unfair, unjust, that's actually an appropriate reaction, right? It really is, but it's still not righteous anger because anger just on itself is just anger. Even if it's provoked by injustice, it really can only be righteous if it actually it provokes you, is a catalyst for you to try to do something about whatever it was that made you angry, right? So one can be righteously angry at racism or sexism or capitalism, uh, et cetera, right? But uh, and it's also important to know this, if you get angry at something and you just stay angry, that is dangerous. It's dangerous to your psyche, to your physical body, to, to your emotional health. Anger stewing alone is incredibly, incredibly dangerous. Righteous anger is whenever you then say, this thing that made me angry, this injustice, I'm gonna try to do something about it. And you know what I've discovered? It's like a miraculous alchemy. It helps me channel joy and happiness because even if I can't control the outcome, right? If I have done, and this is the third point I'll make. That uh, an angel just got its wings. <laughs> you heard that, right? <laughs> my, the goddess is in my spiritual political practice does not require that I win or succeed. What she says is do your best. And only I can really be the judge of whether I've really genuinely done my best. Because if I've done my best, then I can release the result. And then therefore I don't have to get upset that I didn't persuade or convince anyone to stop being a racist or stop the pollution or stop the abuse or et cetera, et cetera. If I've literally done my best to try to be a good person and to interrupt badness and to create goodness, then I can, and here's the kicker, release the result. Right. Because at the end of the day, it gets back to number one, right? You only control yourself. That's all you've got. Right. Well, let's talk about why you've been away. You quit your job as executive director of Cooperation Humboldt, and you are now the director of the Dishkamu Humboldt Community Land Trust. This is land return, regenerative economic development projects and affordable housing. Uh, tell us about that. Let's talk, let's start with affordable housing. Yeah. So first of all, you like, here's something, let me get, let me give you an op you and your listeners, viewers, an opportunity to get righteously angry about affordable housing in this country. Right. Like I got to tell you, like, I didn't really know this, right. Uh, but, but the, the way affordable housing works now is the rich, greedy developer parasites, uh, uh, go to and get what's known as low income tax credits from our federal tax dollars. They put together philanthropic money uh, from nonprofits and they put together package deals to go to city government and say, we're going to build you affordable housing. Oh, by the way, I'm the developer. So I'm getting all this public money, tax money and philanthropic money in order to build this affordable housing. And I'll guarantee you uh, that the, 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 the property that I build will be affordable. Oh, by the way, it's only affordable for 35 years. And at the end of that 35 years where I've already made money, guess who owns the property, Faldo? Hmm. I do. The reedy parasitic landlord uh, got all this public money to provide public housing. I own it. Oh, and guess what else happens at the end of 35 years? Are you ready for this? Market rates. I don't even have, like, literally, this is the reason it's a treadmill for how the developer class has figured out uh, how to completely pillage and plunder from the public coffers. And that's why Dishkama Humboldt Community Land Trust is writing into our, uh, our projects that we will guarantee to the city of Eureka, the city of Arcata, the city of Fortuna, that when we do affordable housing, we guarantee it in perpetuity, right? 
Like right. we're guaranteed, we're going to take housing off of the commodity market and we're going to start treating access to housing as a fundamental human right. And it's a, we're flipping the script, but we're doing it with concrete projects. We're, we're building out right now a site evaluation for what will be a five or six story mid-rise apartment that is using laminated mass timber to be net carbon zero and make it available as affordable housing forever. This is the new paradigm. This is how we can actually uh, shift and engage in non-reformist reforms. How do you define affordable housing? Well, affordable is actually a definition under, under federal law, and it's a percentage of uh, what's known as the American, me uh, pardon me, the average median income of a particular area. Uh, so that is a it's, a, it's a fairly complicated formula, but that's it in a nutshell, basically. So you're, are you working with housing, urban, and development? We will be, uh, but the, again, the difference is that we're going to ensure that the Wiat tribe actually uh, owns and controls the actual building. Right. So, right. so we we work. Let, let's say we work in parallel with HUD. I see. I see. Tell me about land return and how that relates to affordable housing. Well, thank you so much for that. Uh, so. You know, uh, uh, it's worth pointing out that I have the honor of living uh, on Wiat ancestral territory. And I like to often say that uh, I am an uninvited guest on Wiat ancestral territory, but my mama, my mama and papa, that's Southern for grandmother and grandfather, uh, taught me when you're a guest in somebody's home, act right. And that's why Dave, if, if you and Hannah ever had me over for dinner, I promise you, I'm going to offer and help wash the dishes. Well, I mean, I've got bigger chores than that. I, I mean, <laughs> that's a p piano that needs moving. Uh, how's your plumbing skills? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, dishes? I, 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 so it's, I, I, it's been too long since I've been on the program. I, I forgot that you're a, a stand-up comedian. Look, um, but the point is, I know how to be a good guest in that way. What I've realized is, and I say this sincerely, my culture and society has not taught me how to be a good guest on any land. Mm -hmm. Because my culture, our culture, David, has taught us how to be extractors, how to be dominators, how to be competitors. Uh, and you know, you and I touched on this once before. I know my ancestors from Scotland and Ireland were in right relationship with the land before the English empire and then Vikings and Romans, you know, before others came and, and pushed them off. All I'm getting at is I can learn a, by decolonizing myself how to be appropriate here on Wiat ancestral territory. So land back is, is both physical, literal, and also metaphorical. The physical literal is the city of Eureka was the first community city anywhere in the United States of America to return land to a tribe without restrictions. It's called the Tulawat land return. You can look it up online and, you'll, and I could even drop it in the link. It's, a, it's an amazing success story. So what I'm now doing is putting out a call to people in Humboldt County. If you wanna physically return land, Maybe, you know, if you're a person of wealth and you want to put it in your will, I've got another person that is uh, returning six acres that she lives on, but she's retaining a life estate. She doesn't have any children. So she's saying, I'm giving the land right now to the Wiat tribe, but I'm going to, to stay living on this land. It's called a life estate that I can uh, keep for the uh, entire uh, time uh, of her life. So... All I'm getting at is that the uh, there's ways to physically return land to Wiat stewardship because indigenous worldview around property and land is that you don't own land, you're in relationship with it. And the relationship is both with the land and the forests and the rivers and the fish in the rivers and the animals in the forest. Everything is not, it's not about rights at all. It's about reciprocal responsibilities and humans have a responsibility to, to be in right relationship. Our culture of property rights 
actually teaches us that I have the right to exclude, I have the right to exploit, I have certain rights uh, that are associated uh, with what I can do. And it's all about a, a type of extractive economic model. So land return is both physical land return, and I've already got three different pieces of land that I am in the process as a lawyer of helping people return it to we ought stewardship. And the metaphorical part is to say, like right now I, I, I'm in a house that the, well, the, the, the bank owns it, right? But, but I'm, uh, I'm paying a mortgage on it. So I need to, to keep this place. But the metaphorical land return is to acknowledge that the we ought know how to be here and that I can learn from them uh, in a way that, um, that I can learn that Ure the city of Eureka was once called Jarajiji. Jarajiji in Solatluk, their language means a good place to stop and rest. Why? Because for the Wiat people, uh, all of their names of places had to do with, well, that was a good place to stop and rest as you covered the bay, right? Because the the, 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 what we call the Mad River, uh, what they call Gudalini uh, River comes down and this, there was a good shallow bank where you could put in your dugout. The point I'm making is instead of talking about place names to either honor some individual or, or something, uh, some person, to describe it based on its relationship to the natural world. They're learning to help me think about basins of relations. Waterways are the interconnected ways that trading posts and trade routes existed pre-contact because that's where things were grown. They were already doing extensive commerce and trading, right? Like we've been taught this lie about indigenous people only come like the, that this was a sparsely populated place and that they were all primitive. There were 500 sovereign nations here with complex cultures and civilizations and commerce trading amongst one another. This was a vibrant place that was living in, in parallel with the largest abundance of, of just life. You know, the, the, the salmon were so thick that you could literally walk across the river on their backs during spawning season. During the migration period, they talked about the sky, it being like a, an eclipse because there were so many geese and other waterfowl covering the land whenever a flock would come by that it would be like a massive cloud coming hmm. the point i'm making is there was this place was teeming with life including humans and they didn't see like oh our village is here and nature is out there they understood that they were literally part of it they didn't just manage a forest they were in the forest so when I'm ashamed to tell you that my only exposure to First Peoples in America is playing, uh, this is really going to sound horrible, the casinos. As yeah. a kind of, so I've never been on uh, a reservation that wasn't a casino. I think most Americans don't know what life is like on a reservation. I'm sure that you're right about that. Uh, and I, I honor your courage to actually say that out loud because it's, you know, it, uh, and, and what I'll say is this, Michelle Vassell, my very dear friend and current boss, uh, the tribal administrator of the Wiat tribe, uh, which is basically the city manager for the tribe, right? She's the, the chief executive. She's, uh, she often says, David, our work is, it, yeah, we're doing projects, restoration ecology projects and regenerative economic projects and other projects, but it's not just projects. What we're actually doing is healing ourselves and each other by healing the land. We return the land to the balance that existed to a regenerative ec ecological economic system, uh, and we heal ourselves by doing this. What and does the we what does the we hot reservation look like if you were to visit it? Well, look, if if I took you to the res, uh, uh, what you would see is eighty acres of uh, housing, right? Uh, uh, but that's because 
the entire area of Wiat ancestral territory, they've been pushed onto just 80 acres. They once, their natural uh, territory uh, is 10,000 square miles. So the res and reservations are places of extreme poverty because it's been imposed upon them. So when I talk about healing the land, we're talking about reversing that process. So reservations, unless it's a casino tribe, reservations are a place of profound poverty. What kind of health care do they have? You know, it's interesting that the main health care that the, the we uh, uh, ascribe to is what's known as uh, the North Indian uh, 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 health clinic system. Uh, and it's basically uh, if you, uh, everybody qualifies for it. It's basically Medicare for all for tribes. You know what we deserve. Right. And are they happy with it? Well, better than not having any health care, you betcha. Uh, right. it, and, you know, part of the problem, of course, is and the, the Wiat tribal administrator or Wiat tribal chair, uh, uh, Ted Hernandez talks about this is, you know, naturally what we, we used to eat differently and eat better. Right. So part of the problem has been the, the colonial imposed diet because they they don't literally have access uh, to the kind of gardening and forestry uh, and salmon fishing and, and, and what they used to do. So like, yeah, that's my quick reaction there. Okay. Well, David Cobb, you, are, now, are we going to be having you uh, weekly? Well, I hope so. I mean, uh, you know, uh, I, I kind of made a joke, right? Like uh, I was worried that, uh, you know, coming off, uh, if there'd still be a, a spot for me whenever I come back on. So I'd love to work with you and Hannah to figure out when could be a regularly scheduled uh, slot. So I miss you, you guys. I miss you guys. We've missed you. People have been writing in. Where's, where is David Cobb? So, oh, well, so, so yeah, let's absolutely do it. I also understand that you had my dear friend, Melicia Figueroa uh, on, yeah. on the show. Yeah. Isn't she dynamite? Yes, she is. And, and she's going to be coming back. So that's fantastic. I'm trying to hook up Howie Klein uh who's do gonna think uh, you just you do the thing and i'll talk to your your crowd to say howie klein is coming up next y'all all know howie he comes on uh every week with feldo and tries to uh, take on the task of educating poor david feldman so Howie does his best to try to help howie uh help david understand what's going on uh uh he operates uh blue america pack uh he's a writer and a thinker and so and the conscious of david feldman how am yes. I doing, Feldo? You're doing pretty good, but I don't have him on the line. Oh, shoot. I okay, thought I just so saw him. Let me up. try it again. Uh, <laughs> Dog got it. See, this is the problem. Like, uh, I'm just the talent, David. Like, I don't know what I'm doing up here. I'm just, you know. Yeah. Well, let's, let's sign off to you. Thank you, David Cobb. Hopefully, I'll see you next week. You betcha. All right. Okay. Bye, y'all. Good to be back. Thank you, David Cobb. That's fantastic. Well, Howie Klein is coming up with Congresswoman Marie Newman, but I have a problem. Your call again. One one seven T. I'm having problems with my phone, so let's try this phone. Maybe this will work. Okay, so far so good. Hello, Howie. Yes, the, the other uh, phone that you called on, I didn't hear anything. I just oh, it, it, I'm happy. I called, I was getting some kind of bizarre fax or something. By the way, we're, we're on, we're on the air. So, uh, I have no, are you there? Yes, I have no fax. Oh, you want me to call back on that other line? No, I'm happy on this line. It doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, I'm waiting on Congresswoman Newman. I don't see her uh, here yet. So why don't we talk and hang on. Yeah, I don't see uh, I don't see her yet. Uh, okay, uh, so Santa Claus just called me. Yes, from from uh, Alaska, and he's uh, he's he's very anxious to come on. So I, I sent you and your daughter and him an introduction uh, for next week. So we'll have him on next week. Great, great. 
for some reason you're a little low and i i have a i've been having a technical problem well while we're waiting for congresswoman marie newman why don't you tell us what we can look forward to next month because we are in the the midterms and the primaries have started right so uh, the next the next important one is on may 3rd so that that's really really soon so that's North Carolina. So there's a whole bunch of uh, important stuff happening on the Republican side. But my guess, I mean, really, we're just interested in watching that in the hopes that they all destroy each other. In fact, right. I was just writing right. about uh, Madison Cawthorn, who may, who may well lose. So we like the idea that he loses, but the guy who's going to beat him is, is just as right wing and just as insane, just not, uh, well, I shouldn't say just as insane, he's not. But just as certainly on policy matters, just as insane. Right. And, and really, and there are, you know, there are organizations there in the district, uh, the 11th district of North Carolina, the whole extreme western part of the state. And there are organizations there that are urging Democrats to switch their, um, their party ID so they can vote against Cawthorn. And that isn't a good idea. We're better off with Cawthorn because he is, he's such a, a wonderful mascot for the Republican Party. And he's giving the he gives the Democrats stuff all the time. And like if they were going to replace him with like a mainstream uh, conservative, well maybe. But th- this guy's a state senator. He's, he's a crackpot. And there's no there's no it doesn't make sense. We're better off letting Cawthon stay in that seat until there's a blue wave and a Democrat can come in and take him uh, take him down. So the Cleveland you write about the Cleveland. Wait, wait, before we before we go to Cleveland, which I want to very much. I just want to say one more thing about North Carolina is that there's a really important race in the northeastern well, part of the state where um, Erica. Well, we, uh, Congresswoman uh, Marie Newman just joined us. Oh, great. So we can talk about uh, North Carolina another time. Hey, Marie, how are you? I'm very well. How are you, Howie? Good. I'm good. Congresswoman so, uh, Marie Newman represents Illinois' third congressional district. This is, I believe, your first term. And you are supported by Howie Klein, and you are also supported by Bernie Sanders, as well as Elizabeth Warren and Mayor Lightfoot. Howie, please introduce Congresswoman Marie Newman. Well, Congress, Congresswoman uh, Marie Newman has been, uh, you know, someone who who came came to the party making a bunch of promises about how progressive she's going to be, and guess what? She is now the number one most progressive member of Congress, uh, according to Progressive Punch. She has the highest vote score of anyone in Congress. There's, there can only be one number one. That's, that's who we're talking to today. Wow. So uh, I wanted to ask uh, Congresswoman Newman uh, uh, about, uh, and, and she, she's being challenged by a corporate Democrat, a New Dem, uh, uh, who's trying to uh, get her seat. Is and it so, Solipinski? No, not Olpinski again. There's someone okay. like him. It's a, it's, a, it's a guy named Sean Kasten who's got tons of corporate money behind him and ideological conservative money behind him. I mean, they're taking an opportunity to try to go after um, Congresswoman Newman because he's not a progressive and doesn't support the, you know, the Green New Deal and doesn't support Medicare for All, and he's, he's pretty awful. But I, I wanted I, this I'm not so sure of. I wanted to ask you about this uh, Congresswoman Newman, uh, I know you don't take corporate PAC money. Does does Kasten take corporate PAC money? Yeah, he's taken about a million dollars in uh, corporate PAC money just in the last couple of years. So it's really significant. And it's from, you know, it's funny. It centers in three bad buckets, right? Our, our three top enemies, oil and energy uh, companies, uh, healthcare insurance, and pharma, oh, four, and a fourth bad bucket, uh, financial services. And he sits on financial services. So, wow, not great. Well, that, that explains why he hasn't uh, uh, endorsed the Green New Deal or uh, Medicare for All. He's taking money from the people that don't want that to happen. Yeah, he you know, he doesn't even you know, Howie, he, he doesn't even support carbon pricing. Just so you know, like, not like so when he talks about that he's a climate hawk, I laugh so hard. It's so hilarious. Well, he first ran as that. He was like some kind of a, 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 an environmental entrepreneur. 
and he, he, and he, that helped him to get into Congress originally. And then once he got into Congress, he did the opposite of what you did. He just became more and more bought out and conservative. And, and I mean, you know, I mean, it's pretty easy to support the Green New Deal at this point, And he absolutely refuses. But I wanted to ask you about when you're, when you're campaigning in the district, mm-hmm. um, do, 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 the, do the constituents know about him? Do they understand the difference? between someone who takes corporate money and someone who doesn't, or is it just like, you know, something they don't get? Yeah, you know, um, there, I would say that in the district, uh, people are not necessarily aware that he takes a ton of corporate cash. And, you know, remember, they blended uh, about half of my district with five other districts, right? And one that one fifth of that uh, uh, five group is um, Sean's Sean's district was incredibly wealthy, affluent. He he was a weirdly good match for that district. Now the district is half my district and then a, a, an amalgamation of others. He's completely ill-fitting because he likes talking to rich people and talking about rich people things. And that's what he does. And so he's not a great fit anymore. But in my part of the district, um, it is people hate it when you take PAC money because they know that it handcuffs you and then you're required to stay within this, these rules. Uh, whereas when you don't take uh, take uh, corporate money, you you are free to uh, be in alignment with your district and vote your district. <laughs> and so they're starting, to, the answer is they're starting to understand that, but that takes education, you know, and um, we've been pounding that drum really hard and people are starting to understand, but not uh, as many as I would like. Right. Well, I mean, I guess what they, what they, you know, I mean, when you tie it to policies that are popular, like the Green New Deal or Medicare for All, and, and yeah. you say, you know, why hasn't he supported these things? Why isn't he a co-sponsor of any of this? Uh, I guess that, and then you tie that to the money, I guess then they, then that helps them to understand. Now, he's got a lot more works. money than you do. Yeah. I agree with you. That does work. We've been very clear that the throughput line, it's very linear. It's like when you take uh, money from all of these health insurance companies and you don't support Medicare for all, very clear. When you uh, take money from BP, Chevron, Exelon, and all of these other energy uh, companies, and um, you never say that they price gouge, you never, you know, you never go after them. And I go after them all day long. There's a reason, right? You know, and um, he, he only, he thinks our only tool in our um, climate toolbox are uh, rebates and dividends. He thinks those are our only tools. So he's a cap and trade guy. Which, which among the 74 other things we can do, I don't have an issue with, honestly, like do everything, do everything all day long. But to call the Green New Deal um, and the Thrive Agenda impractical and um, what else does he call it, naive, is ridiculous. The Thrive Agenda is the um, actualization of the Green New Deal into money buckets and specific actions that will mitigate and get us to our emissions reductions goals. So it's it's really it, the level of hypocrisy is is astonishing to me. Can you explain the the, uh, uh, the Thrive Agenda? I don't I don't know that everybody knows what that is exactly. Yeah. So the Thrive Agenda was built to kind of um, actualize and operationalize. Um, our uh, Green New Deal. So it takes the premise of the Green New Deal that we want to be uh, reduce emissions by 50% by 2035, some say 2040, um, say some say 2050, um, and actually puts it into buckets like uh, mitigating uh, lead pipes, um, addressing uh, polluters in a very real way where we are actually punishing them and stopping them and putting them out of business, uh, making our two biggest culprits, we all know this, 40% of all emissions come from buildings and construction, and the other 40, 35% comes from uh, uh, transit, right? So in the Thrive Agenda, it would allocate to electrifying and putting renewables into all of our transit systems, um, you know, uh, doing like a what is the equivalent of a, um, a wartime production methodology around um, electrification of all vehicles. Um, by the way, the, our, our uh, vehicle manufacturers are ready to do this. The problem actually is the gas and oil companies won't refuse to uh, cooperate. Our, our, uh, our, manuf- our auto manufacturers are ready to go on this. Um, but also in the Thrive Agenda are um, specific strategies around how we 
uh, completely rehabilitate affordable housing with green housing, that, um, that we uh, address transit systems housing together because they are so integrally tied. So th this is a, it's a really robust plan that actualizes the Green New Deal. And so to not, a, to not agree with those things is egregious. Yes, but when you're out in, in your district explaining it to, to the voters, do you, do you ever get any pushback saying that, look, you, you have the White House, you have the House of Representatives, you have the Senate, and, and you haven't done any of this stuff. Why should we give you another, uh, me, me, why should we give the Democrats another uh, term? You know what, I'm lucky in my district. Um, so the new district that I'm running in, which is the new Illinois six, it's a, basically an open seat in many ways because it's a brand new district in Illinois. Um, they, um, they're still willing to support us. Um, Democrats are Democrats, even most independents are supporting us. It's a D7, D6, D7 district. Um, and people are still willing to support us. I don't have as much pushback on that, but people do say it. And you know what, they're right, is that, um, look, we, we didn't get Build Back Better done. Um, we didn't uh, make sure that child uh, tax credits stay in place, universal child care, uh, help for um, in-home health care and all of those folks. Like this is, their, their complaint is absolutely legitimate. Um, but we do have to say, you know what, we got um, the Infrastructure Act together, which wasn't as climate friendly as we wanted to, but it's still, uh, you know, doing a lot around uh, bringing down emissions in the transit agencies and uh, mitigating lead pipes and the like. So uh, not perfect. And look, I rail on this every day, you know, so um, we need to do more. That's right. But in my district, they are understanding that, look, you got some pretty big things done, but you didn't get the, th the, the most, the largest thing that we wanted done. Um, which was climate action and child tax credits, universal child care, all of those things in PPP. And what about uh, reducing the price of uh, of pharmaceuticals and raising the uh, the minimum wage? Do you are you finding people saying, "Why didn't you guys get that done?" Yeah. <clears throat> now I think what um, you know this new tech. What you've seen this uh, right that uh, we passed um, insulin thirty five dollars uh, per month. Uh, cap. And I think that that's a good thing. And that's a good starting point. But um, and Republicans still voted against it is unbelievable, right? Um, people are still asking for a uh, reduction in prices. And, and honestly, I'm still of the mindset that let's do Medicare for all and do this in a way where we put it in chunks. So the first chunk should be, hey, uh, Medicare is available to everybody over 55. We reduce the top 35 drugs. We add vision, dental, hearing, long term health care. Roll that out year later, roll out to the next group and to vulnerable populations and on and on and get this thing done. I, we have the infrastructure to do this. Let's just do it. Let's move it. This is honestly, as we all know on this call, um, Medicare for all would be far easier to implement than Obamacare was. Obamacare was creating a whole new structural system and Medicare for all is already in place. Right, because it's just adding to Medicare. Yeah. it's. Just, but <laughs> So they, but then you've got Republicans, you've got Republicans and conservative Democrats who are standing in the way. Hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. So what's yeah. the answer? I mean, and even and I and I'm worried because as bad as I think Pelosi has been, and I'm not saying she's terrible, but uh, she hasn't been uh, she hasn't been good on, on a lot of these things. Uh, what I see coming down the pike is much much worse, uh, and it worries me. I even see progressives. Uh, saying that they are getting behind Hakeem Jeffries. Hakeem Jeffries isn't going to uh, be on our side on any issues. Anyway, sorry to sorry to uh, bring that up to you. No, I, I um, look. I, I I don't think that uh, I I don't know. I mean, I obviously have not personally talked to Madam Speaker and find out if she's uh, running again or if she's uh, wanting to be Speaker again. I absolutely have no idea. I mean, she'll win her election, but I have no idea if she has interest in. And who knows, maybe she steps down, who knows, a million different things could happen. Um, and there's four or five people that would vie for that position. So is is Hakeem the front runner? I actually don't know. I don't sense that there is a front runner right now. Oh, well, good. We're better off without a front runner because, you know, I mean, I, I don't see any real uh, strong progressives getting ready to run for that. I, I've been, you know, begging Pramila to do it and she just sort of... Uh, you know, sort of 
which is me awake. <laughs> Can I ask you about Nina Turner? And were you surprised that the Congressional uh, Progressive Caucus, the Democratic Progressive Caucus, didn't endorse Nina Turner? Why didn't they? Yeah, I guess in the charter, and I've, I, I have not obviously read our charter, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> in our CPC charter, we don't go against incumbents. Um, so not great. <laughs> I think that Honestly, there's a bunch of rules in Congress that are beyond ridiculous, um, and that's one of them. Um, you know, because I'm in an incumbent on incumbent race, and um, now the the CPC caucus actually has endorsed me um, over Sean, which is good, right? <laughs> uh, but Did they endorse you when you were running against Lipinski. I, I know that Pelosi didn't, Madam Speaker. Oh, um, no, the um, the caucus, that was another rule in their charter that um, they couldn't endorse against an incumbent within a primary. Right. Um, so, but I'm endorsed this time and happy with that. And, you know, uh, but I, I'm, I gotta say, if I was Nina Turner, I might be a little upset. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, she's a lot upset. I talked to her about it. She was really, really upset. Yeah. Uh, and, and I don't blame her. And, and a lot of people are very upset and people are looking at the uh, Congressional Progressive Caucus with new eyes now and, and mostly a lot of anger uh, because, you know, uh, that the woman who they did endorse is a new Dem. How does the Progressive Caucus endorse a new Dem over she, Nina? She, both, um, I, she is a part of the Progressive. She was uh, accepted into the Progressive Caucus, too. So she was endorsed uh, by she was accepted into the Progressive Caucus and then endorsed by um, CPC. So that happened. Over do, how do you, what do, how do you get into the, the caucus? What do you what you, do have you, to, so you have to be voted in. Um, you present your credentials and your voting record. And, you know, and um, I believe Chantel did vote progressively on many things. Um, you know, um, again, it's the the charter rules uh, around the caucus, and uh, Pramil would know more about that than I do. But uh, you know, it, following the charter rules, apparently. Right. Yeah. Well, then they they I guess they need to be changed. You're and you're an officer of the uh, CPC, so uh, anyway. Uh, now, what about Chantel? By the way, is she a uh, is she a co-sponsor of the Green New Deal and the uh, and the uh, Medicare for All? I think she recently did sign on to Medicare for All. I think that's recent. Can I ask you about Build Back Better? Do you mind? Uh, right ahead. When President Biden was running for office, he knew who Joe Manchin was, and Kirsten Cinema, and Tester, and Warner. Why didn't he have a plan? He knew that that these people in the Senate were going to block Build Back Better. Do we have pork barrel spending to buy these votes? Seems to me Lyndon Johnson would have said to Joe Manchin, there's going to be a university named after you in West Virginia. And these little boys and girls are going to go to this university every day and see your name. And they're going to remember Joe Manchin forever. Yeah. What happened to that? What, what happened to pork barrel spending and earmarks? So I think that um, there's there's not a lot to get. And that may not be important to Manchin. Like weirdly, they may have been important to uh, politicians in a bygone era. But that may because honestly, I don't know Manchin. So I, you know, I couldn't tell you what's important to him. Um, his coal company is important to him is what's important. To him. So shouldn't so isn't it the responsibility of the Democratic leadership to find out what's important to Joe Manchin and give it to him so we can have universal preschool and free tuition? Isn't that the job of the Democratic leadership to figure out how to I, get these people on board? Honestly, I, I, I do think that the president tried to negotiate that way and find something that was very important to him and he just couldn't get there beyond his coal company there's not a lot joe cares about i mean just sort of, I mean, Manchin doesn't care about a whole lot but if you're the president and you know that you're going to be president and you know who joe manchin is shouldn't you have shouldn't you have had a plan for this before you decided to run for office and i think he did and i think that the tables kept look look in the last uh probably two months of the negotiation, um, Manchin and Simna, they'd have a deal, literally they'd have a deal, they'd call us on a Friday night 
and tell the caucus that we've got the deal. Here it is. Here are the line items. And literally by Monday morning, Manchin would call uh, the president back and say, you know, I don't like it now. Literally. Right. But so, that, but I don't understand. I'll move on. I just don't understand. We, we know that you need it's below the belt. It's politics. It's rough and tumble. Why you're the most powerful man in the world and you're going to let a backwater senator manipulate the process? It seems to me you have a lot of arrows in your quiver that you could use if you really wanted to build back better, right? Yeah. And I think that, uh, and look, um, uh, I agree with a whole lot with the president and there's things that we don't agree on. Right. Um, and there's just things that I'm not privy to. I, I'll just be honest with you. Like, you know, we, when we were, um, when Pramila was leading the way with uh, Build Back Better um, and negotiating directly with Mansion and Cinema and, and those folks, um, she made a lot of headway. Um, in fact, now we hear that uh, the Build Back Better bill will probably live in three buckets and we'll get something done. Now, Manchin is interested in climate action. If he can get uh, leases to be um, executed, which takes seven years and honestly give him a few and and then we'll pull him back. You know, like right. talk about rough and tumble. It's like, okay, say yes and then say no. But before I turn it back to Howie, I have one question. Why can't I read transcripts from congressional hearings. When there is a hearing, all I get from the committee website are the prepared statements, mm -hmm. but the back and forths, you cannot, you cannot read a transcript of the hearings. You have to go through the congressional uh, printing office if they ever decide to print it. Is that on purpose? Is there a reason we cannot read transcripts of hearings? Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I, having been on, I'm on two major committees, and um, I don't see why you shouldn't be able to. I didn't, I wasn't aware of that that you couldn't that you couldn't get beyond the prepared remarks because the prepared remarks are available to everybody. I know that, um, but the you know the unprepared remarks, I wasn't aware that you couldn't. Well, access it's them. a for-profit business. I've looked into it. So C-SPAN, which runs advertising now, by the way. They have closed captioning, but you cannot download the closed captioning and read the hearings. And if you want a printed transcript or an online PDF, you have to go through the Congressional Printing Office. It's business. There are companies now that charge for these transcripts. That's ridiculous. I did not know that. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Uh... Uh, well, first of all, I didn't know C-SPAN was now advertising. That's kind of kooky too. Um, but no, that's very interesting. I did not know that. And I don't have an answer for you on that. Howie? Yeah, uh, you know, I'm in California. We put a, a huge amount of money into having a bullet train and nothing has happened. Now, I, I, you're, on, you're on the transportation committee, right? Yes, I am. Yeah, and... and I, I, I read somewhere that you're a big proponent of bullet trains, right? Or at least for your own district. <laughs> I speak well, yeah, I think that because two reasons. One is um, that it would begin to reduce emissions and that we can electrify them. So it's, a, you know, or they can be uh, other modes of renewables. So I am a fan. So why, why, ha why hasn't anything been done? I, I, never under I never could understand that. I mean, yeah. California so, spent that much money. And that we, you know, all we got were, were a bunch of studies. Yeah, so there's three um, uh, corridors they're looking at for high-speed rail. So when I brought Buttigieg in um, over the summer, um, I asked him for a pilot um, here, and um, they are assessing that. So there may be a pilot from Cleveland uh, to Chicago, and then one that would extend to D.C. Um, and New York. So those uh, those long-term bullet trains um, would be very, very effective, and that is under consideration. So do know that from the DOT budget, that actually is under consideration. There will be pilots. We just haven't determined where they're going to be yet. Right. You would think- And, and is, is this a bipartisan thing? Yeah, no, I mean, honestly, the, no, they're in California and in Texas. I know the Republicans don't like the high speed rail uh, projects that have gone up because they haven't been perfect. And I've got news for everybody. Uh, newer technologies, newer processes, new programs are never perfect and they don't work very well sometimes. So you do have to stay at it. Um, you know, 
I, as I remind everybody, you know what? Social security didn't work real well the, fir the first few years. Welfare didn't work very well the first few years. Um, you know, every program we've had didn't work real well the first few years. So you have to address it, but it doesn't mean that you walk away from it, so. You voted against funding, or at least American funding, Israel's Iron Dome, which is sh able to shoot down missiles, primitive missiles coming from Hamas. I believe Raytheon helped design Iron Dome and probably gets a piece of it. Does Iron Dome work? Do the Patriot missiles work? Are we able to shoot missiles out of the sky or is this just a dream? So uh, the Iron Dome has been somewhat effective. And just to be clear, I wanna break that down for everybody why I voted against it. So, uh, first and foremost, um, we have uh, built that technology in a joint way, and it's Raytheon and several other uh, private enterprises worked with both countries, Israel and, um, and the U.S. Um, we made a commitment to pay for uh, certain parts of it um, to Israel. We met that commitment in the NDAA appropriations bill. I voted yes for that because that, there was our, an increase in military personnel um, uh, salaries. So I said yes to that. Otherwise, I would have voted against the NDAA because it made the uh, DOD budget higher than it's ever been, which is ridiculous. That's the so, National Def uh, Defense Authorization Act, and the DOD is the right. Department. Right. Right. So, so with that, um, when Iron Joan came up and asked for a billion more dollars, because we again we made our commitment in the appropriations budget, we had paid them that. We're all good. Like peace out, right? So when the Iron Dome vote was carved out and said, um, hey, Israel's asking for a billion more beyond the commitment that we already um, kept for them and paid, um, I said no for five reasons. One is labor was mad about it. They said, hey, you're going to spend a billion dollars on a defense mechanism that you've already paid for. No, that should be paid. On the, that should be going to uh, either construction or green construction, green jobs, whatever. Um, and then um, the uh, the peace folks in my district, their anti-military uh, apparatus um, uh, increases, um, said no. Um, there were uh, gun safety groups that said no. There were churches that said no, and rank and file folks that said no. So this was uh, one of those situations where, because I'm very in touch with my district, all of those groups are like, no, ma'am. I said, well, then I'm going to vote my district and say, no, ma'am. And then obviously the uh, Palestinian rights folks, which uh, is a strong contingency, and they said no. So this was not a like me pulling it out of the sky and taking a chance on a vote. It, it just, my district did not want it. So we said no. Does it work? Can we shoot a missile out of the sky? Because we're planting Patriot missiles in Poland and around Europe. Yeah. And they work. They I mean, work? It, it may not have a perfect uh, score, but yes, they yeah. work. It, it works somewhat, and, and it's it's the best that we have, basically. But let me just add one thing to it. So I want to be clear on what happened um, recently that few people know about is that um, the Ukrainians, so uh, President Zelensky went to Israel um, six, eight months ago, knowing that he was going to be in this conflict. Clearly, he knew that. Um, and asked Israel, hey, can we have some of the um, technology and help us build this? Because, and they said, no. So it's okay. Um, and remember, President Zelensky is Jewish, <laughs> has relatives in Israel, the whole deal. So it was one of these, the hypocrisy of the Israelis sometimes is, is um, they all, but they were all, but Israel is trying to remain neutral because there are a couple hundred thousand Jews still in Russia. That's right. So th it's a balancing act and it really is. But and, also Bennett, and Bennett is meeting with Putin, the, the, the Israeli prime minister tried some shuttle diplomacy with Putin. Is Biden going to do any shuttle diplomacy with Putin? Well, there's diplomacy going on all the time. Don't mistake that there's not big shows of, you know, uh, them meeting on a rock somewhere um, in Asia or in Europe. You know, the, you get a sense that you get a sense that President Biden, who I voted for uh, and I would vote for him again. Do you get a sense that he wants to have it out with Putin in Ukraine? that this is something he prefer, he would prefer to, to have a, a proxy war with Putin in Ukraine and have it break him, kind of like Zbigniew Brzezinski tricking the Soviets into invading Afghanistan. Is it? Look, I, I think that- um, I don't know that they, that they tricked 
anybody into invading Afghanistan. Once they were in Afghanistan, uh, the U.S. did everything it could to bleed Russia and just make it more and more horrible. But I don't think the U.S. encouraged them to invade Afghanistan. Well, and actually, Brzezinski takes credit for tri- he was uh, Carter's national security advisor, and he takes credit for tricking the Soviets into getting into a Vietnam-like quagmire in Afghanistan. And I can't help but wonder if Jake Sullivan, our national security advisor, and Tony Blinken, our secretary of state, think they're tricking Putin into quicksand, Ukrainian quicksand. No, it, 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 I, I think that's the wrong way. He does not want a war. I want to be clear. President Biden does not want to put troops on the ground anywhere. He is very... No, but I'm talking about funding. You know, instead of going with diplomacy, he he's giving weapons instead of olive branches. Well, that's part of our commitment. Uh, Russia invaded Ukraine before before uh, Biden was president. I mean, uh, Crimea was taken over when when Obama was president. And that I mean, you know, that's part of this, this same war. I mean, we may not see it that way, but the Russians and the Ukrainians do. It's a, it's a slow beat. But um, but to be clear, so and I just want to go back a, a minute and I want to roll back the tape a little bit. So. Um, with regard to um, Ukraine and NATO and uh, President Biden's posture, let's, let's be very clear. Everybody's furious. Uh, the president's furious. Blinken's everybody's furious. Um, had, had we not, I also want to give the Biden administration some credit here. Had we not been working for six months prior to the incursion um, and this unprovoked war, had we not been working on um, coordinated sanctions, they would not have happened as swiftly and clearly as they have. We have dis- disempowered something like 50 to 60 percent of uh, of uh, their economy right now. So we are. It is effective. Is it a slow methodology? <clears throat> yes, it is. Uh, but had we not done that work uh, with our partners across the world, we would not be in this position. It would be far worse. It's horrifying to watch. I can't tell you. It's it's like watching, um, it, you know, just hundreds of thousands of people die in slow motion. It is a horrifying thing to watch. Um, but so there should be a peace movement. We should, and we and just know, and I think you all know this. You're, no one's naive on this call that um, peace discussions. And uh, peace talks are like this, right? They go up and down and in and out and all over the place. It is not a linear line. Um, So those discussions are taking uh, place at all times in different ways. It's just that we have to figure out how to give uh, Putin um, some level of out here. And that's just forever the process of those peace talks is like, how do we give him an off ramp where he still, um, you know, doesn't look like an absolute fool. Um, so, but just know that the, the sanctions are working very effectively, very effectively. Marie, before we say goodbye, there's one other question I wanted to ask you. You fought really hard for two cycles to get into Congress. You defeated an incumbent, which is really, really difficult to do. Now that you're in Congress, what do you, what do you feel was the thing that you accomplished that made it worthwhile? Was there something, was there like one particular thing that uh, is important enough for you to have sacrificed so much of your life uh, to get in there? Um, I would say there's two big buckets for me. One is that um, in Congress, being part of um, the Progressive Caucus and making kind of every bill more progressive, and we have in many ways, those are the things, those are the invisible things that we don't see every day. And then there's a series of what I call hole pluggers that I put together, um, which is the Matt Holler bill, which would require um, ETO, which is a carcinogen that's banned in Australia and and Europe, uh, brought brought to uh, introduced. Um, So it would be stopping that toxin um, and many other hole plugger bills, reducing taxes for micro businesses and making sure that immigrants and people of color are first in line with access to capital and small businesses. It is all of those things. And then most importantly, convening people in my district and gluing everybody back together so that all the electeds, all the community leaders are talking and getting things done. On the unsexy topics like train delays and flooding and all those things that um, no one seems to care about, but I do. So um, we did a lot in a very short amount of time and it brought $240 million to the district um, in 10 months. And my predecessor, it took 16 years to bring $300 million to the district. So, you know, it, it's about fighting and advocating for um, your folks. And I think that I advocated in a way that's really strong. Um, and I will tell you, um, I think that I'm going to win this race, 
probably by a very small amount. But if I don't win for some reason, it just means that God had a different plan for me to advocate because um, I'm not going to stop. How do people donate to you? How do people donate? Oh, you're so kind. Um, my, the name of my website is marienewmanforcongress.com. Marie Newman, Marie Newman for Congress.com and go give money to Marie Newman. She's endorsed by Howie Klein. That's all you need to know. <laughs> that, that's the truth. If she's endorsed by Howie Klein, we donate money. Give whatever you can, as long as you're an American citizen or have a green card and give five dollars, five hundred dollars. I don't think you can. What's the I don't think you can give more than. What's the individual amount, which is a lot of money. So uh, no one should, um, it shouldn't be a hardship um, for everybody. I, I tell people that all the time. And if it's a hardship, keep your money. But if you can spare any money, we deeply appreciate it. I'm up against a corporate dem that has $2 million on me. Um, but the the top amount that an individual can give is uh, $2,900. But if you've got $2, God bless you and I love you. <laughs> right. Listen, we, we've been talking about uh, Howard Schultz cracking down on this, the Starbucks people trying to go union. You might want to think twice about your mochaccino and give it to Congresswoman Marie Newman instead. Howie, you're breaking up for some reason. Are you there? Yeah, the, 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 yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can't you, you how we broke up I apologize Howie Klein thank you so much for introducing us to Congresswoman Marie Newman and I know how hard it is to get elected to Congress I don't know how hard it is but it is and and you took on a powerful machine the Lipinski machine and I I will do anything I can to help you win and go back to Congress. Once again, what is your website, please? It's Marie Newman for Congress dot com. Marie Newman for Congress dot com. Everybody go right now to Marie Newman for Congress dot com and donate what you can. You'll feel better. I promise you. Thank you, Howie. Thank you, Congresswoman. Thank you so much. And everybody be well. You too. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Howie. Your sound is off. Okay, I, I apologize. I, uh, but thank you, Howie. Thank you so much. Uh, Howie Klein from Down With Tyranny. Read him every day over at Down With Tyranny. One of the people Howie Klein also supports is our next guest. He is Shahid Buttar, and he is running for Congress. And it's great to see you again. You ran for Congress in 2020. I think you are the biggest challenge to Nancy Pelosi in the history of her career, right? You're you're running to take uh, Nancy Pelosi's congressional seat. Welcome, Shahid Buttar. Thank you, David, for the welcome. It's great to be with you again. And yeah. just to respond to your question there, yeah, the strongest challenge that Pelosi's ever faced was our 2020 campaign when we won 81,000 votes. And we're looking forward to building on that and liberating our city's voice from Washington and getting us a representative in Congress yep. who stands for human rights and right. global peace and justice instead of the corporate corruption of Congress. Well, I don't want to embarrass you, but it is an honor to have you on the show. The last time you were on the show, I didn't get to talk to you about the things that I really wanted to talk to you about. And you showed up at office hours and that was fantastic friday night it, it was you rolled up your sleeves and talked to a relatively small group of people and uh it's a bottom up it's not top down campaign and i really uh, appreciate you talking to my hardcore listeners at office hours friday night go to shahidforchange.us s h a h i d for change.us give him money give him money he is up against the pelosi dynasty and again i'm a democrat i'm a democrat uh but but it's time for change and nancy pelosi is not serving the american people she is a has at least 200 million dollars she is a landlord 
She is not equipped to understand the needs of the 140 million Americans who are living at or below the poverty line. You said something at office hours, Shahid, that chilled me. Her plan is to have one of her kids replace her. SF Gate has reported and publicly confirmed what has long been the subject of and not an, and not even a secret at all. I was going to say an open secret, but that would be uh, too charitable. Right. Christine Pelosi sits on the DNC, the Democratic National Committee. Her, she's never been elected to a position outside it. She has been quoted, uh, named by several news outlets, in addition to SFGate, LA Times, CNN, as a potential successor to her mother. I find it interesting, particularly because what SFGate predicted is that if Nancy is allowed to retire on her own terms, she will announce her retirement soon after winning this race. That will trigger a special election, not unlike the one that Nancy Pelosi won her seat in back in 1987, which was the last time she ever debated anyone. And this special election would, of course, favor her daughter because it would be on an accelerated timeline. Other campaigns would not have the chance to spin up muscle to combat her name recognition and fundraising muscle. And all that is to say the only way to stop the dynastic inheritance of a congressional seat what I see as either an immigrant or a constitutional lawyer from both perspectives subtly differently as outright feudal aristocracy. Right. The only chance to stop that train from reaching the station is to deny Nancy the opportunity to retire on her own terms. Right. And if you frankly see independent of the succession plan, which offends any notion of democracy, when I just look at the policy record of an incumbent with a long history of blocking human rights, for instance, to universal health care, voting and supporting every military spending increase in the last generation, slow walking the impeachment process towards Trump and then limiting them to let him off the hook and funding his concentration camps, you know, every accretion of power that the NSA and the surveillance apparatus has gained, all of these things can be traced back to her tenure. And I, this is at the same time, of course, that Congress has abandoned affordable housing, frozen the federal minimum wage, repeatedly passed tax breaks, targeted tax breaks, favoring the wealthy. That's a policy record that demands accountability. And I'm eager to be an agent of that accountability and, again, make some different choices in Washington on behalf of my city. Well, let's talk about the concentration camps, because that's a freighted word. The ICE detention camps are concentration camps. When they were called such, I think this was three years ago, some members of the Jewish community were offended. It took, I believe, I, I'm not sure which Holocaust museum and a team of about 150 rabbis to say, no, no, these detention centers are by their very definition, concentration camps. You are rounding up and placing people of a specific nationality, a, a race of people who speak a certain language, you're rounding them up and detaining them. Uh, I just wonder, the, the only difference between some concentration camps, I don't, I don't think we, the Japanese internment was for profit. I don't, when we rounded up the Japanese, I don't think those concentration camps were for profit. I think Hitler's, they, they use the, the ones who then starve to death could go off and build ammunitions and uh, earn, a, earn a little money. What's happening with these detention centers, ICE detention? Do you support, first of all, getting rid of ICE? Absolutely. Abolishing ICE is a human rights imperative. And I so appreciate you making the point that compared with the Japanese internment, in some respects, the contemporary mass detention of migrants and asylum seekers is arguably worse. You ask what's happening in the detention centers, one of the things happening in the detention centers is the forced sterilization of migrant women in custody. This was and in Georgia, right? That's exactly right. And that is straight out of the Nazi playbook, frankly. It, you know, these might not be death camps yet, but you know, when you look at these kinds of definitional human rights abuses acknowledged around the world as a human rights abuse happening in our name with public resources, putting private dollars in corporate pockets, and that is the essence of fascism, when the denial and the derogation of human rights makes money for an industrial complex that is embedded in the state. That is definitionally exactly what fascism is, and it is not a far off future fear in the United States. In 2022, it is here. It is firmly we established. Taught, we taught Hitler eugenics. 
It was Oliver Wendell Holmes who said one generation of Cretans is enough. They were talking about my grandparents. He was talking about my grandparents when he said one generation of Cretans is enough. But Hitler, didn't they learn the eugenics program from the United States? Well, the eugenics program and the genocide of indigenous Native Americans was, in fact, if I recall correctly, there were aspects of the American program that the Nazis thought were too kind, particularly the, uh, the one drop rule. Uh, you know, they right. figured that would, would be, uh, it would resign too many people in their own community to the disfavored status. So they couldn't go that far. They couldn't be as abusive as America was to our black neighbors. And that is a horrifying comparison to acknowledge. And it is inescapably historically true. And when I look at our nation today, there's a long standing reckoning now, a long overdue reckoning, I should say, with race that is happening, unfolding. And in some respects, being wound back up as it is being unwound in the, in the United States, across the United States, including right here in San Francisco, to make this point very clear, our elected district attorney, Chase Boudin, is up for a recall election. He'll be on the ballot in the very same one that I'll be on against Nancy Pelosi. In the when is the date of that, please? June 7th. Okay. And we encourage every San Franciscan to register and participate and, and to oppose the, the recall of Chase. Uh, I see there being a great deal of demagoguery in the press, particularly in the local body politic here. So the, the clamoring about a crime wave in the context of an uptick from a historically low baseline. Right. And this reflects, to your point about private dissension centers, the policing industrial slavery complex makes a lot of money for a lot of people at lots of different points in the process from the Taser Corporation, which is the leading producer of body cameras, to the private prisons, which are directly analogous to the private detention facilities, to the tech companies, which are charging prisoners and their families through the nose for things like to use this very same digital infrastructure that we're using right now. Uh, you know, there is a phone call to make a phone call. It's like eight dollars a minute or something like that. It's obscene. Uh, Boudin uh, is the district attorney, and he's part of this new wave there aren't too many i think his name is kramer in philadelphia the krasner. larry krasner larry krasner i'm yeah. krasner. Bell in st louis the, there's a there's a handful of them around the country liberatory da's who, who are decarceration who say we're going to lock up criminals instead of just people of color it's a novel idea to lock people up and after the black lives matter protests the police came roaring back and twisted the numbers and have the right wing have said talk of defunding the police is causing the uptick in crime. There's, nobody's defunded the police anywhere, right? Maybe Austin a little, but there's been no real defunding, but that's what's causing uh, the crime. Talk to me about the Faircloth Amendment. You mentioned it during office hours. This is outrageous. Yes, thank you. The Faircloth Amendment relates to affordable housing, and it was passed to limit, to restrain the federal government and stop it from building new housing, which is frankly the key to resolving the affordable housing crisis that's emerged in cities across the United States. The federal government has resources that local governments don't, and local governments often don't have the capacity to, on the marketplace, compete with private developers, particularly to establish new housing, to build new projects. And that's exactly what the federal government could do, used to do, cannot do any longer due to this amendment passed in 1979 that I would like to overturn. And when I see across the United States, not a single city in which a minimum wage worker working a full-time job can afford a two bedroom apartment for you know one kid, it, that's not okay. That wow. it is preposterous that a full-time worker is unable to afford anywhere in the United States a home. And that's a reflection of many things, including the commoditization of housing. It's a reflection of the Fair Cloth Amendment. It's a reflection of a lot of things. The freezing of the federal minimum wage for over a decade. You know, these are these are all policy factors that are driving that outcome. And I would like to frankly change all of them. And those are things that we can do through policy when we have different people making the decisions in Washington. People who are landlords like Paul Pelosi and Nancy Pelosi, we're talking tens of millions of dollars in real estate. 
they can write the code, they can write the tax code, they can write the laws like the Faircloth Amendment that benefits landlords. Why does the Faircloth Amendment benefit landlords? They can do that. They do do that. And they have done that. The right. Faircloth Amendment benefits landlords by restricting housing supply and basically inflating the price of housing as a commodity good to be sold and as a thing to be rented. Now, right. The one thing to note here is that who ends up paying the price in communities across the country, particularly here in San Francisco, the displacement and gentrification that has been driven by the affordable housing crisis has literally shifted the racial composition of our city. African Americans were at one point in San Francisco, as many as 12% of our local population. The black community is down to 4% here. And that doesn't even frankly in any way capture just how vicious it has been for our black neighbors in San Francisco. A generation ago, through an urban renewal project in a neighborhood called the Fillmore, there was a destruction of a generation of black wealth. And now today, in fact, over the last 50 years, but continuing today, our last black enclave, Bayview Hunters Point, is the site of one of our state, I think our nation's worst environmental justice, environmental racism calamities. The US Navy has a shipyard that for decades was poisoning the neighborhood with radiation, particularly from ships that were being cleaned after they were testing atomic bombs in the South Pacific. And to have a neighborhood where there are so many public disease vectors, things, different kinds of cancers, asthma, the, there's just at the moment, just an effort to try to track the, the epidemiology of that neighborhood and establish the density of the cancer cluster there. Everybody's suing each other, the Navy's suing the property developer who's suing the contractor who tried to clean it. There's building new housing happening there right now as we speak. And people acknowledge that the soil is toxic. Right. And, and the only person who could do anything about it is Nancy Pelosi and her only role with respect to the poisoning of Hunter's Point was to help engineer the privatization of the land that is now poisoning the residents. And this is a pattern of policymakers putting their private profit before the public interest. And when you noted real estate investments, that's one among a series of ways in which ownership interests skew public policy. There's a long overdue debate finally happening about policymakers owning publicly traded stocks, that is to say shares in publicly traded companies. But even that has not touched as you correctly noted, real estate investments and the conflicts of interest that they introduce, or for that matter, uh, in investments in things like private equity instruments or hedge funds. If the public knew how policymakers were investing in hedge funds and how those in hedge funds were investing in communities, I think people would be at least as outraged as they are over publicly traded stocks. At the moment in the country, one of the things that private equity firms are doing is buying up all the excess housing stock, which to bring us full circle to your original question is absolutely in the benefit of landlords because it's creating an artificial price bubble in the real estate market right. that benefits people who make a million dollars a year in rental income like Nancy Pelosi. And that's not even counting her stock trades and the insider trading and the hedge funds and the private equity. You know, Being a policymaker should not be a profit-making enterprise. And if you want to make profit, you know, she's been very adamant to say it's a capitalist society. If you want to make money, go do something else. This is not a place to make money. This is supposed to be an arena to represent people and pass policies to protect people from the vagaries of the marketplace, not to exploit it for their own benefit. And that's what she's been doing for 35 years. And it is completely unethical, unacceptable. It is corrupt. And I hope to make it, I hope to bring it to an end. Well, I think uh, we have a mutual friend. Uh, he goes under the name Jeff Blackwood on this show. I'm not, he's a, uh, and he turned me on to capitaltrades.com. He helped your last campaign. Uh, I have a feeling he facilitated this appearance as well. Uh, anyway, he turned me on to capitaltrades.com. If everybody goes to capitaltrades.com, and it's very easy to use. You've been there, right, Shahid? Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. And, and look at what Paul, Paul, it's really easy to navigate. And you will you will go then to shahidforchange.us and give Shahid money because Pelosi has to go. It is, you know, it's criminal. It cannot be legal what Paul Pelosi 
is doing. It can't be legal. The trades he's making in Amazon and Apple, it cannot be legal. And if it is, then they should be arrested for being speaker and allowing it to be legal. It can't be legal. So you, you sort of noted this before, the irony, the tragic irony is that these people make the laws and they write them to their benefit. The Stock Act was passed under President Obama in 2012, and all it requires is disclosure, even it has been routinely violated by dozens of members of Congress, as documented by Business Insider. And it's not just the case, you know, there's two layers to this. We've talked for a little bit about some of the ways in which the, you know, with hedge funds and private equity uh, instruments and real estate, how the pending reform proposals don't meet the need and don't stop the intrusion of the profit motive into the policymaking process. You know, even the reform proposals are limited to publicly traded stocks. But there's a whole other uh, element here to consider, and that is that nobody's talking about how to remedy any of this, right? Like people are talking about, fine, let's ban policymakers from trading stocks. Yes, finally, please, of course. And what do we do first about the generations of investors who've been defrauded by policymakers trading based on inside information that only they had access to, basically defrauding the marketplace. More importantly than that, what do we do about the generations of policy that have been stacked in Wall Street's favor because policymakers had a stake in the outcome and skin in the game when they were passing laws to fill their pockets instead of meeting the needs of their constituents? How do we reset that table and what is the schedule on which we're going to revisit policies in sectors like from healthcare? You know, the Affordable Care Act was a massive subsidy to health insurance companies in which many members of Congress are invested. So if we're going to have a policy that's free of corporate influence, when are we going to revisit that, for instance, to consider it against the Medicare for All proposal that has long been favored by bipartisan majorities across the United States? There was a study by Princeton in, I think it was 2016, uh, identifying and confirming that Congress responds more to Wall Street, to capital, than it does to we the people, to popular preferences, to constituents. Right. And congressional insider trading is one of the reasons why. It's not the only reason why. You know, and if we fix this, there's still going to be problems with campaign finance. There's still going to be problems with post-campaign lobbying by corporations. You know, these are all different dimensions of corporate influence, different gateways for corruption. I've had a chance to fight several of them. As a baby lawyer, I've litigated the last case before the Citizens United decision that aimed to keep corporate money out of elections. And we won that case. We won the battle and then lost the war. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm now trying to fight the war on another front. And just to be clear, because Citizens United is a constitutional decision, it might, you know, a lot of people resort to an amendment as the likely way to overturn it. I, a, a side, a, uh, an end run around that requirement is to end judicial life tenure in order to force turnover on the bench. That could shake loose some of these jurisprudential log jams that are going to create, have created structural challenges for our democracy. Uh, you know, these are layers of policy that I think most people, certainly our contemporary media, does not think about or consider in any way. And, you know, I've been doing this work a long time and I have some ideas on how to help and uh, right. we're going to get in a position to do that. Shahid for I'm sorry, Shahid for change dot US. Shahid for change dot US. S H A H I D for change dot US. Give him money. You will feel better. We all day we've been talking about what a pig Howard Schultz is trying to bust Starbucks firing people for trying to unionize. Well, boycott Starbucks. Don't spend seven dollars at starbucks instead give it to shahid for change.us i'm not calling for a boycott of starbucks because that will hurt the, you know, the the unions i'm not, but you know one once or twice a week forego your cappuccino frappuccino and go to shahid for change.us and give him money give him money when you get angry at the democrats give him money Trust me, it's a great release. It, it, you know, I, I'm not saying hate Nancy Pelosi. I'm not saying that. But when she makes you angry, go to shahidforchange.us and give him money. Five dollars. He was at office hours Friday. This is a bottom up campaign. And he's taking on the Democratic establishment, the most powerful Democrat 
in America is Nancy Pelosi. And to some degree, they came after you last time, and it was not nice. Talk to me about nationalization. I know uh, I want to be respectful of your time. You are the first person to talk, first candidate to openly talk about nationalizing the oil companies. You're a democratic socialist, correct? I, I'm a socialist. You're a socialist. Uh, yeah. Isn't the pathway to social socialism Congress nationalizing industry? Yes, precisely. Yes, thank you. And it's not just a pathway to socialism. While it is, I'm more focused in this context on the pathway to climate justice. Put another way, a pathway for our species to survive the future. That is not complicated. The primacy of that need over Wall Street profit making could not be more clear. And yet our Congress of millionaires is more concerned with filling their pockets. Now, the I so appreciate you drawing attention to this because I've not heard anyone else. You were the, well, you said that at office hours and I, on the show, I've been going, where are the call? Where are the calls for nationalization? All I have all the I'm a leftist. I have Dr. Harriet Fraud about to join us. All we talk about is Marxist theory and the Marxist critique. There's a pathway nationalize these effing companies. It's so much. I'm at Adley did it. Yes. And first of all, I'm so grateful that you see it through this lens, because I do think whatever passes for the left in the United States is a depressing specter of itself, because if it had any spine, this would be the debate. You know, we're fighting over scraps at the moment, $15 an hour, like, give me a break. Right. And, and yes, just to be clear, the Green New Deal is an absolute imperative. And I particularly appreciate the just transition elements and the federal jobs guarantee. And we cannot pretend that it will be enough as long as we allow profit making from scarce natural resources that nobody can produce or replenish. And I would just note that it doesn't make any sense to allow people to sell things that they can't produce or replenish, especially in an age of, seek, of scarcity and even worse in an age of externality where we're extracting these resources creates such predictable, limitless, compounding, cascading problems going forward. It is absolutely predatory to allow these industries to consider or to continue chasing the profit motive. This is another way to think about this is that allowing the marketplace to decide how much, for instance, oil is extracted is like dialing the extraction dial to 11 because it's an incentive for anyone <clears throat> to get anything and sell it. Whereas once we nationalize the companies, we can do things like make democratic decisions as a people to say, well, we want to ramp this down. There's no way to ramp down extraction without seizing control of these companies. And the fact that we're not even talking about it, even in 2022, is a reflection of just how much capitalism ultimately has the throat, its hand around the throat of our democracy and the future of our species. And it's, I think this vision and the willingness to talk about it. I, if I may directly address also, there's this film, Don't Look Up, everybody's talking about. Right. And like, I'm so grateful that films are getting recognized at the Academy Awards. And like, can we please talk about policy for right. once? You know, even the, even, and I'm grateful that, that a journalist wrote a movie and the people were talking about it, but like, can we get to policy please? And right. it is particularly striking to me when the journalists who write movies who claim to care about climate won't cover the policies or the candidates proposing them. And I just don't, the no. American people don't understand how corporate America works. And if you don't understand how corporate America works, you don't understand who's torturing you and how they get away with it. We don't even have to nationalize the oil companies. We just need to buy 10% of ExxonMobil. That would give us a majority, not a majority, but that would give this government the most votes in ExxonMobil. We could buy up uh, these healthcare companies at 10%, their market cap is, let's say, 200 billion. For $20 billion, we could own Aetna, or at least the 10%, uh, which is more than anybody else owns. And we could say, guess what, folks? You're done. You're, you're now, you're now, what, you're a constitutional lawyer. I, you went to Stanford, you graduated from Stanford. I'll give you a, a special dispensation on that. Uh, is it legal for the federal government to buy stock, go to the open market and buy stock? Absolutely. All nationalization means is exactly that. It is 
there's a due process clause of the Fifth Amendment would require compensation to shareholders of these companies. But that's exactly what. But, but can't we go to can't Social Security? There, there, there's cash sitting in Social Security. Can't the Social Security Administrator say, you know what? Uh, I want to invest in the market. We're going to take some of the money that you pay into Social Security and we're going to buy $4 billion worth of Apple stock. Is that legal? It's, it's legal. I mean, part of the problem here is that the federal government doesn't perceive, and it's fact, it's blocked by law from perceiving its purchasing power as a lever to shift anything, not even just in terms of ownership, but even in the healthcare marketplace, you know, the government can't bargain down the cost of pharmaceuticals. That's a very like meager reflection of the same principle. And that's just, that's a policy choice. There's nothing well, more. You say the law is, is it, is there a constitutional issue of? There was a hundred years ago, there was a case, the Lochner decision, which sort of squarely poised this question of can Congress and legislatures make economic decisions? Can they make decisions to try to craft, to engineer the marketplace? And, and for many years, the Supreme Court said, no, it cannot. And it started with a case about bakers in New York, and it ended in a case about hotels here in California uh, 30 years later. And in between, FDR had to threaten the courts with their potential expansion. And ultimately, the courts conceded, OK, OK, fine, we'll let, we'll let policymakers engineer the economy. And, and just to be clear, that's faded now into an uncontested principle. And Congress engineers the economy every day, particularly to steer wealth upward from working people into the pockets of oligarchs, millionaires like Nancy Pelosi, and the billionaires whose interests that they serve. And that happens in every way from, for instance, in 2020, when the pandemic started, Ilhan Omer from Minnesota, she had the best proposal I've heard since the pandemic started, this was the, the Rents and Mortgage Cancellation Act. She proposed that as long as the pandemic's happening, let's keep people at home, let's make banks pay the cost of housing, freeze everybody's rent payments, freeze the mortgage payments. If somebody's a small landlord and they need somebody's rent payment, okay, we'll set up a government program for them. We've got the resources. And instead, what Nancy Pelosi and corporate Democrats decided to do was give the Pentagon an extra $25 billion <laughs> beyond what Biden requested. Unbelievable. Absolute idiocy, but idiocy where some people more than others end up unfortunately paying the price. Right. I, w I want to do two things. I, I, I want, I would give anything to have you come back all the time. I want to give Dr. Harriet Fraud, Fraud a chance to ask you a question or tell, or tell you how much she loves you. But first, go to shahidforchange.us. Shahidforchange.us. He is taking on the Pelosi dynasty, and you pay a price when you go after the Clintons, the Bidens, or the Pelosi's, you pay a price for this. Support Shahid for Congress. Let's send him to Washington, D.C. and get rid of Nancy Pelosi. Get rid of Nancy Pelosi and some other Democrats. I am a Democrat, by the way. Do, uh, Dr. Harriet Fraud, let me unmute you, please. There you go. I, I totally agree. It just makes me know that we need a revolution here because this happens on every level where corruption and everybody knows. You say people aren't informed. There's that song by Leonard Cohn. Everybody knows. On some level, people know that and they shift their interest into who's having sex with who and sexual practices where they've got to know the details because the place, the empire is falling, corruption is everywhere, and on some level, everybody knows. And that's why what I was going to talk about today is so hopeful what the Amazon victory because everybody knows and they are acting on it and they won. And when Chris Smalls and Derek Palmer declare, this is the revolution. They aren't the AFL-CIO. They aren't the retail workers union 
whose head Apple Baum is getting $337,014 a year, while the highest paid workers are getting a tenth of that at Amazon. But, you know, I think people have to have hope and we have to have a, a really strong socialist party where every, where, where it's like the pole of an umbrella with all the spokes joined at the top for climate change, for Medicare for all, for quality childcare, for Black Lives Matter, for civil rights, for women's rights in the marketplace, for maternity care and maternity and paternity leaves, but all under one powerful umbrella, which is the mass of people of America. Right. Let, let me do this. Let me, let me uh, have Shahid respond and then I want him to come back. So I want to be respectful of his time. Uh, let me give you the last word and then when you're gone, I will uh, try to get more money raised for you. So you're very kind. I appreciate uh, the chance to be with you and, and Dr. Fraud, your analysis. You know, I think we are living at a time that is a crux in human history. We see this already, the acceleration of the pace of technology, how it's changed social norms, how it's disrupted entire industries, displaced families and communities, and created a lot of opportunities for some and a lot of pain for others. And we know that this acceleration is frankly only going to continue. Mm -hmm. and, and we know some of the ways in which it's going to continue. It's gonna get really dry here in the West. It's gonna get hot and people aren't gonna have a lot of water. And a lot of islands in the Pacific are going to be gone. Miami is going to be underwater, right? We, we know all this. And we can either make decisions informed by the science, or we can act like idiots and just fill our pockets and raise the future off a cliff, which is what Congress has been doing for the last however many years. And Those who I, are filling their pockets can continue while the mass is Im immiserated. Well, yes, though, I, I mean, just to push back, I don't think it's a few. This is, I mean, not to bite off a whole trunk here, but this is one of the tragic ironies of like 401k programs, right? Where people gain infinitesimal shares in companies and they come to identify with the interests of capital, even if they are being ground under its heels. And, you know, this, the Stockholm syndrome that has captured the American middle class and the extent to which Americans think that our futures are bound up with the interests of Wall Street when they could not in any more obviously be in opposition. The co-optation, you might say, of working America has been profound. And, and the, if, I, if I were to draw any, uh, there was one theme where you talked about Chris uh, Smalls and, and Derek and the Amazon, and I'm so excited for their victories and the St Starbucks unionizations, just to riff on that, if I may. We have some uh, supporters, volunteers here on our campaign who are active in the Starbucks unionizing wave in the Central Coast. I'm so incredibly proud of them. I wanna shout one of them out who's running for state assembly. His name's Joseph Thompson. Uh, super proud of that young man, incredibly inspiring, inspiring young labor leader. If you're looking- Bring him on. Well, I'd love that. Yeah, yeah. He'd, he'd be a great guest for your, for your program. I'd love that, please. And then and I want to also just riff on a piece that uh, Dr. Fraud said with respect to contrasting Chris with the AFL-CIO. It's, it's such an important contrast. A month ago, maybe a month and a half, SEIU, major labor union, endorsed Pelosi without a vote without any opportunity for its rank and file to participate. And rank and file members came to us and said, this is BS. We want you in this meeting. They get me into the Zoom. I post the analysis they never got to hear. And you know the, the union leadership disables the chat, of course. But the idea that labor unions are becoming rolled and complicit in the aggrandizement of Wall Street and corporate politicians, abandoning the interests of their own rank and file is really problematic here. And I just want to point out that the battle for workplace democracy starts in the workplace and it continues into labor unions and into the political parties that they support if the members push it there. And so I'm really excited by this wave of workplace unionization and I hope that it continues beyond the workplace. And that's a really exciting opportunity that I'm eager to see. And thank you so much for having me on again today, David. It's all thank great. you, Shahid. And please come back and please bring anybody you want. We, we're for you 100%. Go to shahidforchange.us. Thank you so much, Shahid. Thank you. Bye, all. Thank also, you. we should know that less than 10% of Americans own any stocks. So, right. You know, talking about a country where 60% of people don't have $400 in an emergency. Right. 
Yeah. They don't own stock, so they don't understand what nationalizing these companies means. If you if you don't buy, like everybody should buy a penny stock and just own a company and then think about, well, I can own this. I don't have a voting share. Well, why can't my government? They're own? thinking survival. They're thinking of how do I keep from being evicted? Right. You know, the eviction moratoriums are over. 200,000 people are cases, excuse me, are in the pipeline to push evictions. And Adam's swaggering, strutting turd that he is, is- Yes, thank you. Out of their encampments. I mean, really, even, you know, Adams can boldly say, I will not give my tax returns to the public. Adams, you know, we're at a point yeah. of outrageous corruption. Is he the worst mayor? How bad is this guy? He's he's not as bad as Giuliani, but he's it's start. But he's tr- he's aspiring to be Giuliani, right? He's but he's a Demo- you know, But like Giuliani wasn't a Democrat. This right, is what so- Pelosi's a Democrat too. We have I know. To this is- the corruption and its participants, and one of the things that is very hopeful in this landscape of rot and corruption, the falling empire, the lying drumbeat of um, poor people in Afghanistan, their cities leveled by war. What was shock and awe about the pictures on television with Bush leveling whole cities in Iraq? What are we talking about? Destroying Vietnam, destroying Iraq, destroying anything that was going on in Afghanistan, leaving 97% of the people starving now because we're still doing sanctions there. It's, it's bizarre. But within this, there is hope. And I think Chris Small's The Revolution is here, is very, very important because he showed that two workers who... Uh, Amazon's leadership dismissed because he, they thought they were dumb and inarticulate because they don't have Ivy League accents. One, and they won because if you work at Amazon, you're not a person. You carry a scanner, which tells you how many seconds you have for each task and beeps you constantly if you don't do the task. You're not allowed to to sit down. You're not allowed to listen to music. If you go to the bathroom, it registers you're going to the bathroom back at the office. And if you go to the bathroom too much, you're in trouble and you get points. And if you get six points during the peak season, you're fired. And they have pain meds distributed throughout the Amazon warehouses, free pain meds, so people can keep working in pain. And it's The reason they do that is not because they care that their workers are suffering, but because the long lines outside the medical office were obstructing business. So all over they have now these vending machines with pain meds, souped up Tylenol, Advil, all these things. So people can chug a lug, a bottle by the end of the day and keep working. And so that, you know, People who say, well, I flipped burgers when I was young, they didn't flip burgers, measured that the, in three minutes, there has to be three minutes or less from the person who customer walking in the store to walking out with their food. And that they have two minutes and 23 seconds to assemble all the ingredients of a burger. And if you don't do that, there's beeps and that's noted so that the quality of work has changed in the United States. People are truly immiserated. And I think they'd have to have some kind of hope in order to get, (coughs) excuse me, involved and do something. And they'd have to have a place to go rather than six places that are politically absolutely important, vying for attention. They'd have to have a central place to go like the committees against the war in Vietnam were a central place to go when people thought things were messed up there. And they don't, and that's what we need, a viable, smart socialist 
movement that isn't so worried about each other's small microaggressions, but wants to win and bring people in. Right. If Chris Smalls and Derek Palmer can do it with $100,000, which paid for everything for the 11 months they worked on this, all the food, all the heating, that the, the barrels with fire, <clears throat> excuse me, all the flyers, the basic money for those two people to survive. Whereas <clears throat> Amazon spent $4.3 million to crush that union. Wow. And the police arrested them for lighting those fires to stay warm. They arrested them for um, trespassing because one of the reasons that they won is they weren't organizers from somewhere else whose union head works for Clint, worked for Clinton and then Obama and who is you know, big in the Democratic Party. And they Stuart Apple now. Yes. Harvard Law and Schools, and Harvard Law School, Stuart Applebaum. And the big failure in Israel, from right, on destroying the Palestinians. And big in the AFL, which is a, has been bought by the State Department as early as the 50s during the McCarthy era, when they threw the communists, the socialists, and the leftists out of their union after which the union movement started to fade until it's tiny now. The AFL-CIO unions are about 9% of the population instead of 35%, which they were in the 1950s. And so they killed the union movement with anti-communism, calling out the communists as traitors, even though of course they didn't any, do anything as traitors to try to stop an election or anything and the uh, socialists as fellow traveler traders and all leftists as fellow travelers, threw them out of the unions. And now look what they have left, compromised unions that are structured. There's a very brilliant dissertation written by a guy named Frank Annunziato, who used to be an organizer for the teachers union and for the um, hotel workers and bartenders union. And he, that, the AFL unions are corporations selling collective bargaining services and buying clubs and things like that. They are structured that way with the top executives at the top and the grunt work. And there's, it's not a mission, it's not a movement. And these, whereas, and they don't really care about these people. One of the reasons they wanted Amazon is first, when people got off of work exhausted and hurting, they had fires to warm them in the winter because they had a whole, they have slightly more black than white people. They had soul food. They also had West Indian food because there's West Indians there. They had sort of all American dishes like macaroni and cheese, and they gave anybody who wanted it weed. And that was really a relief after such a painful day and weed is now legal. Plus they talked the talk, they had worked there and they got arrested and the Staten Island police whose taxes we pay said, we don't work for you, we work for Amazon. Nice, I saw uh, an article and a video, but you know, the reason they won is they actually were of the people there they knew the grievances and they talked to people at the bus stop about what, they didn't come in with a platform for them to sign on to. They came in listening and they came in knowing from their own work what was going down. And I think if a labor movement is to succeed in the United States, that's just what they'd have to do. Not have high paid, compromised AFL-CIO union people, but people from that job listening. Now there are radicals in the AFL. Sarah Nelson of the flight attendants fought for them during the pandemic, listens to them, was the only voice that called for a general strike. She couldn't get it across in the AFL-CIO. She wanted them to go on a general strike when they made the airport workers work without benefits or change. And 
Uh, the nurses union is another very powerful union that stands up for people and listens to people. But that we need that because we need labor to be active again and to be part of a mass political movement here. And then people would join it because they'd have some hope. And right now they know it's all corrupt. They really do. We had a record turnout in the last election, really record turnout, 66%. France just had an election and they were a little disappointed only 80% came out. Of course, they had a lot of parties and the left got just 1% less than the extreme right, but you'd never hear about it in American newspapers. Right. But, you know, we, we need a viable, sensible left with labor included, with a new labor movement. And Amazon showed us it's possible. That's why Chris Smalls could say the revolution is here. Because that's the revolution. People airing their grievances, working together, understanding where they come from, bringing up the issues from the bottom. No one wants to have to carry a scanner that measures by the second everything that they're supposed to do, even when they're in the bathroom. That's inhumane. And Amazon is the second- I thought we fought a civil war over this issue starting yeah. in 1961. I thought this was resolved. No, of course, corporate power was not interrupted. It's not, FDR temporarily did because they were afraid they'd lose everything unless they went with him. Because there was, the labor movement was a radical movement and was a mass movement and the CIO was a mass movement. And they joined with all the other movements and they supported FDR who taxed the corporations 96.8% in order to have things like social security in a time of a depression. It's so different. Of course they could do it. Even now, if Biden wanted to, at the stroke of a pen, he could say he could cancel student debt. Wonderful. Of course he could do that. He could send buses and trains down to West Virginia and Arizona, door to door to tell those people what this, their representatives are doing to them. He also could not, after we lost four wars in a row, push to have more to the military while the, you know, taking jobs away from people. And Obama had a similar idea. More black people lost their homes because he gave the money to the banks instead of the mortgage people. So that he was a black figurehead, which was very important for some people, but he robbed them blind. We have to stop this and we need a mass party. I think, because I do think people know, it doesn't take more than a few minutes talking to anybody anywhere to know that it's corrupt. I'm seeing it with, I'm seeing it well said. Thank you. I'm seeing it with Ukraine. No peace movement. All artifice is gone. There used to be people who went through the motions of diplomacy, the motions of marching for peace. This administration cannot wait to funnel arms to Ukraine. No diplomacy. There is zero diplomacy no and we're just we're saying go ahead fight to the last ukrainian die right. to the last ukrainian not us by the way the ukrainians and right. we are subjected to a propaganda i mean it's it's shocking because we have immiserated millions we killed millions of people in iraq afghanistan and, and vietnam and they have killed the russians have killed at last official count from Ukraine, it was 1,300 people and then it was 1,700, millions. So I'm not saying that killing or war is, is ever good, but what are we doing? This place is, I think people have given up. They've given up and, and, and Biden's given up. 
you know, after Vietnam, this country admitted that it made a mistake. And we went from 1973, 74 until 1991, the first Gulf War. So how many years is that? That's almost 15 years without a real significant war. You know, Granada, we sent the Marines into Lebanon, but we were not trigger happy. We were humbled by Vietnam. People took to the streets and the American people said, no, no, no. And then George Herbert Walker Bush goes into Kuwait and liberates the Emir. And even though they told us that they were going to do that, Iraq was going to do that. And we didn't say anything. They were looking for something. April Glaspie, I think was her name, the ambassador, said, go ahead, invade. Yeah. But and then then Bush says Vietnam syndrome is over. V- oh, great. Vietnam syndrome is over, which means now we're going to go back to fighting hot wars. But I think what happened is that in the late 70s, by then, industry outsourced to China. It's not allowed in most of the other European countries like Germany, France, all of Scandinavia. It's it's not allowed. You want to outsource your factory in Sweden, you have to get every single person an equivalent job. So it's easier to produce something else than to do that. And you have to pay them till you do. But okay, we allowed mass jobs to be outsourced. And those people, those corporations made a mint paying less than $4 an hour with no benefits. And they took it back and bought our political system so that we could have the best democracy money can buy. And I think people know it. And I think you'd need to have hope and you'd need to have a movement that was united because I think people are tired of fighting for this thing or that thing. They don't believe that it will make a difference unless they had more political hope and muscle. Right. Millions came out against the war in Iraq. They didn't care. There isn't a political force behind it. And now that labor has a chance, things can change. Dr. Harriet Fraud has a new radio show on Pacifica. You can hear it in New York on 99.5 FM Wednesdays. It's called Interpersonal Update USA. For more information, go to harrietfraud.com. She also has two podcasts. They are Capitalism Hits Home and It's Not Just in Your Head. Which I do with Ikoi Hiro, Hiro and Liam and Liam as well. That um, Not Just in Your Head. And BAI, my show is at 2.30 and I love everybody's feedback. Great. Thank you. We love you thank here. You. I love being here. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. When we come back, we will be joined by particle physicist, Professor Marianne <laughs> Cummings. She's also a, an elected official. We, we actually had another incumbent today. We had uh, Congresswoman Marie Newman, but normally our only incumbent is Parks Commissioner Marianne Cummings. We will be back with Professor Marianne Cummings, but first some music from the brilliant Professor Mike Steinel. Walking 13 miles on every shift with not a chair in sight. Lifting 20,000 pounds a day, that don't seem right. Saving plastic bottles to have a place to pee. Injuries in this place are the highest in the industry. Don't believe those TV ads, things ain't what they seem. Don't tell me this sweatshop has become the American dream, we need to stand together. Can't do it on our own, we need to stand together and make our presence known. We need to stand together to get the union done. We need to stand together. What side are you on? 
One million strong, working two shifts a day. Packing all day long while the cameras are running away. One hundred thousand trucks tearing up and down the roads. Delivering stuff all over the world in 40 ton loads. When did this sweatshop become the American dream? Don't believe those TV ads, things ain't what they seem. We need to stand together, can't do it on our own. We need to stand together and make our presence known. We need to stand together and get the union done. We need to stand together. Which side are you on? cell phone, you can't call your mates, can't listen to music, gotta pack all those crates, start to feel like a robot, but soon you understand, there's more of them than you, that's always been the plan. Do not believe those TV ads, things ain't what they seem. And don't try to tell me this sweatshop will become the American dream. We got to stand together. We can't do it on our own. Stand together. We need the UAW, the AFL CIO. We got to stand together. We can't do it on our own. We got to stand together. We need the American postal workers and the farm workers. We need the stand together. Teamsters and the RWDSU. We need everybody. Stand Call together. the phone. Get on the phone. Call your neighbors. They need to stand together. Yeah, yeah. We need to stand together. That's what I'm talking about. We need to stand together. I wish I were Professor Mike Steinell. I wish I could do that. I really do. Stand together. I also wish I could paint like Professor Marianne Cummings, who is a brilliant, I guess you're an impressionist? I guess so. Professor Marianne Cummings joins us. She is a particle physicist, as well as Parks Commissioner of Aurora, Illinois. And thank you for joining us. Hey, okay, so I've already started my video. All right, and I didn't turn it off right now. I got rid of that little box. Okay, so now I can see you. Yes. So. Pretty good oh, for a particle physicist. Glad the particle physicist. Don't let us touch anything <laughs> is the sort of a rule among the engineers at Fermi Lab. Oh. Yeah. So gaining access before I want to talk about propaganda and where you get your information and what the truth is, but gaining access to powerful people, if that's your game, it really is stultifying, isn't it? This whole it game of- it, it, prevents, it prevents your movement from creating your own center of gravity. Right. And, uh, and even though, uh, you, uh, fellow you've had on your show, uh, my old friend, John Lash, uh, He's gone up against the Democratic machine, and it was the Democratic machine that uh, that supported our Republican mayor, Richard Irvin, who is now running for governor. 
Right. But nonetheless, he can always organize people because when John asks people to come out and do something, they come out and do it. Yeah. That's not something you can get just by credentials or, right. you know, having institutional backing. You, you know, people do things for John because they feel that whatever he is concerned about is a good thing to be concerned about. A lot of people don't have time. Yeah, and I understand it enti entirely. I mean, I'm trying to like keep my company together and, you know, family issues. And it's just hard to like stay on top of things. So you have to, a lot of local politics is just developing trust among people. Right. Like you'll help them out. And, you, and it's not a matter of winning every time. And, and if you're going against, uh, up against power, you are going to lose quite a bit. But people trust when you really put yourself out there. And, you know, that's why, that's why it's so tough. I, you know, I, I might be carping on this, but it was so tough for me to watch Bernie Sanders campaign for Hillary, then campaign for Biden. Because, you know, not, not only was I kind of personally offended, it's like, Bernie, what are you doing? I mean, half of us don't believe you really believe what you're telling us. I mean, and he's trying so hard, you know, to campaign both, both times when, for both Hillary and Biden to not outright lie, to try to be as forceful as he possibly can. So the last time is we got to defeat Trump, we got to defeat Trump. But nonetheless, it's just like, oh, you know, you kind of, you know, you, you tarnish your credibility and, that's basically what people like Bernie have is the trust in people that they're going to fight. And, uh, you know, and, and, and I, I don't know, it's, it's like neither, of the, neither Bernie nor, um, nor, you know, want, they, they don't want to throw lob political bombs. They really want to try to work with the Democratic Party. I think they genuinely feel that's all we have. But right now, the Democratic Party is out to completely discredit and destroy both of them. They can't. I mean, Bernie has power in his own right. Well, but by the way, that was earned. You know, 40 years in the world, you know, 30 years. You know, uh, at least 20 of them being alone on the floor of the Senate or before that, the House with nothing but the C-SPAN cameras going. Right. And in you, but that earned Bernie a credibility. It's like that guy is showing up even though no one is out there giving him, even though everybody who is powerful is shunning them. So, you know, um, it's, I'm, it's, it's hard. I mean, you know, it's kind of like doing this road Going this route of activism feels like, you know, walking from Chicago to New York instead of just getting on the damn plane and going there, you know. You but, mean safer is safer? More pleasant? <laughs> it's actually safer to go on the damn plane. More pleasant. But, no, you know. I think mean, walking would be safer and more pleasant. Not if you're going through, not if you're going through Detroit. <laughs> well. Um, no, but it's like, you know, anyway, it, it, it's, yeah. And I think, I know I heard you were talking about Chris Smalls earlier, and I think that's, that's the difference. I mean, he was able to organize and get people on his side because he had a personal relationship with them or they had mutual shared experiences. And it's not like, you know, I'm sure there's some great people who have come in, uh, you know, from outside and organized places in the past and succeeded. But it really helps when people feel like you're one of them. Yeah. You know what the Democratic Party people say? I keep getting complaints. Why are you beating up on the Democrats? Why are you being why are you being so mean to Joe Biden? And they're child molesters. They really are. They say, come on, come into my house. I'm saying, come on, I'm, you know me, come on in, come on in. They present themselves as normal, caring children of the enlightenment. And then once you get behind closed doors with them, they're, they ravage you. You know, at least there's something honest about the Republicans. They're, they're not. Well, you see the Republicans coming a mile away. You know, yeah. if, Okay, so th this is just a bit, 
I used to be kind of like, well, the Democrats have like some, there is, there, there, there is some measure of difference between Democrats and Republicans so that, you know, you get there. And when you're a president of the United States, even very tiny shifts in policy have a lever arm that can make a difference for people yes. on the ground. Yes, absolutely. And, and if you're just doing this case by case, incident by incident, and all in isolation, you can justify it even as we continue to slide, you know, further and further toward fascism, toward inequality, toward, uh, you know, for the last 10 years, a big a chunk of the population that never had seen its life expectancy go down in over a hundred years, middle-aged white people, their life expectancy was going down. So like, you know, incidentally, yes, you can make a case, but just on the aggregate, we are, this isn't working. And it isn't working because if, if you can shift your perspective and see who's supporting these people, not just, you know, the rhetoric and what they're saying and kind of the, the cultural memes that they're tweaking with people. Uh, but understand, well, where's the money coming from? They're supported by largely the same groups. And, and if you understand that, then you understand that the Democrats are probably more dangerous to the progressives than the Republicans are because the, 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 the Democrats are more immediately threatened by progressives. Yeah, the, Republica, the Republicans, at least for now, don't care. Now, the Republicans will be threatened by progressives if they see that, for instance, a Bernie Sanders, I'm a, I, I believe in my heart more than any other counterfactual I've ever believed in that Bernie would have won. However, I, it, I'm not blind. If the instant it looks like the Republican leadership was seeing how Bernie was appealing to a lot of their base, you know, on, uh, on populist issues, uh, they would they would take the claws, I turn the claws on him. However, we see that coming. You know, I think part of the reason why Bill Clinton was managed to survive politically the whole Monica nonsense was, yeah, a lot of people I knew actually were kind of disgusted with his behavior who were liberals and feminists. But I mean, the, my God, they had to, the Republicans were just so grossly hypocritical and just so gross. Right. So in some sense, it's easier to fight when those guys are visible. You know, you could have uh, women's marches like when when people were shocked into doing something because Trump was elected, not Hillary. When we get somebody like uh, Biden in there, especially when the squad has reassured us that, oh, the instant he's in there, we're going to be pushing him left. Mm. You know, it, it tends to take all the energy out of your movement. And I really feel a kind of deflation on a national level for anything progressive. And the now the mentions of Medicare for all on the websites of various progressives just feels like it's campaign season. Not that it's activation season, it's, it's campaign season for these people, so. Now you uh, go door to door, you went, door to door for Nina Turner. By the way, we had Congresswoman Marie Newman, and I asked her about the uh, Democratic Congressional Progressive Caucus endorsing Chandel, uh, Chantel Brown as oh, over, yeah. over uh, Nina Turner. And she said it's in the Progressive Caucus's charter not to go against an incumbent. Well, then, that, then they're worthless. Right, and, and Chantel Brown is a member of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. And I said, well, how do you get in there? He said, well, you know, you, you fill out a form and you have to be accepted. So I thought the Congressional Progressive Caucus under Pramila Jayapal was gonna change, that they were, they had they the said. swap. Yeah, right? they said they were. She said she was going to make it, you know, that people would really have to be progressive. And it wasn't just, you know, a cover for some corporatist. And, but you know, the reality is the reality. And I think uh, Jayapal, like all of these guys, it's very hard. And I can't say that I wouldn't be one of them either if I was in, I've never been in that kind of position of power. How would I know? But, uh, 
um, you know, you come to think of yourself as indispensable after a while. Then you come to think of, well, my career is indispensable. It's the position. We have to protect my office. We have, then you can just slowly justify doing anything just to stay in power. And you can always be doing this. And, uh, but yeah, Marie Newman is like, she's, I don't think she is as progressive as some, but I think she's more honest than most. Right. And I can deal with honesty. You know, yeah. if somebody isn't as progressive, but you're just honest about and straightforward about yeah. how what you think and what you see, I can I can work with you. Right. You know? so, right. And, and it's I, hard to get elected. There it is hard to get elected to Congress given who the American people have become. Yes, and she's uh, she's not uh, in King County. I don't think any of her new district is in King County. However, they're right next door to us, so because it's a big chunk of DuPage County. So uh, the progressives of King County had endorsed her. Uh, had endorsed her. She came to our Zoom meeting about two and a half months ago, and she took questions, um, not all of them polite, from hard hardcore committed progressives, and she stayed on. I mean, she didn't. Mm -hmm. She just didn't say, well, I have my little spiel, a few minutes and I have to be off. She stayed on for a while and took questions and she knew. She's got, so I don't know if she talked about it, but basically, you know, we redistricted, uh, just got through with redistricting here and her district is gone. The uh, Democrats were hoping that she would run in Chuy Garcia's district which is uh, Chuy Garcia is uh, a progressive, as progressive as these guys are, but he was a, a big Bernie Sanders delegate. He, he ran for mayor and he should have won. Uh, he ran against uh, Rahm Emanuel. And if, if that tape of the police shooting uh, that 15 year old kid had gotten out, he would have been the mayor. But you know, that's all history. He, uh, but uh, Marie Newman, took a look at the map and said, oh, wait a minute, you know, uh, as much of my old district is in, is in Sean Caston's di district, the, the, the new sixth district as in Chuy Garcia's district, you know, well, why should I run against a fellow progressive who has a significant Hispanic community? And he's, I mean, I don't think Chuy Garcia has anything to worry about. So she chose to go over to Sean Caston's, which was a good choice because Caston's uh, district, I think there's less than 50% of his old district is in his current district now. So, uh, you know, that gives, that lessens, and I've been telling people this, you know, for over a year, you do have an opportunity if you can run for Congress in a year where you've redistricted and the incumbents don't have as big as advantage as they normally would for name recognition and everything else. So, um, but you know, she's, uh, I'm, I'm glad she's running because she has, she's had to toughen up a little bit, you know, and she's kind of got some of us as an example of what we expect. But, um, you know, I was, uh, there, there was some pseudo uh, scandal that the casting uh, group was, was trying to foment. And, you know, I, we, we sat down with her and said, look, you can't sit there and be mealy mouth when they're just clobbering you. You have to start out like, how dare you? And by the way, the way you were conducting your campaign last time, you probably should be in jail right now. Mm -hmm. There's a, so that she did that public, you know, there's a little bit of a scandal, like, you know, on, not a little bit. I mean, Sean Caston has some real worries about the way he, you know, they conducted their finances last time. Uh, people can Google that, but what, what I want to say is, is that you, you can't be afraid to go on the offensive with these people. And if you go on the offensive and you stand your ground, then people can trust you that you'll stand your ground against, you know, these overwhelming forces. Once you go, once you're, you know, back in Congress and some of the favorite young people that, you know, the establishment wanted, you defeated. Um, it's it's never going to be nice or pretty or polite but uh, you know so you knock on doors mm -hmm. you talk to the people you're an actual candidate what what do the american people think i i don't know what's going on i just read 
And what I read, and I'm appalled, but then I get out of the city and I see actual human beings, because anybody who lives in Manhattan is, yeah. is a monster. Uh, real human beings look happy. They're, they're not as angry as people in well, New York City. People, what are you can have a conversation with people who are not utterly partisan polarized. I mean, you can have a conversation with them and that's why they're not so bitter and mean. And I mean, some of the people who I thought to be very hardcore lefty liberals, I mean, some of the stuff that I'm hearing there's them saying, and it's out of anger and frustration, you know, we just got to win something. And I said, well, you know, that kind of explains why all the evangelicals, you know, clustered around Trump. They just had, they've been losing the cultural battles for so long and they cluster around Trump, who of course is the opposite of everything they preach, but they ultimately don't care. When it's about your ego and when you think that your personal mission is more important than your little peccadilloes, because God will forgive those because you're you as opposed to one of those people. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, I, I just, uh, I think partisan po poisoning is awful. It is, it's, it's wrecking our ability to do anything. I mean, it's wrecking our ability to do anything collectively. And you know, I've said this before, you, you can no longer hate somebody because they're Jewish or Arab or gay oh. or a woman or a man. The only, the only acceptable hatred now is hating somebody for what they believe. So in many ways, this is an improvement over the past. I hate you because of how you think, not how you were born. Well, at least it's a rotation, I guess. <laughs> but unfortunately, <laughs> racism and bigotry is, is folded into that as well. And it does. I mean, look, yeah. um, I think I've mentioned it before, but you know, part of, the um, part of this elitism uh, from the Democrats has is shielding a not so subtle patronize, uh, patronizing attitude toward minorities, you know, toward immigrants. Um, I did tell the story about Nina Turner being, I, I think she was supposed, thought she was going to be on Ben Jarofsky's show, but Ben Jarofsky, who was a local uh, uh, reporter and had a radio show on the uh, on the alternative radio network here got booted off for some reason and so they had Jonas Pizzito who was an NPR plaque you know a liberal and at one point she was talking to uh to Nina and said don't you hate Jill Stein I just hate that woman and Nina Turner just kind of gave her both barrels you know and a hatred for what I mean people nobody has a right to your vote and if the democrats didn't and she was trying to tell her as gently as she could because nina's a professional but with a lot of passion that no one has owns anybody's votes the democrats did not earn the votes of a lot of people they didn't even inspire people to show up and vote and then you know not to make just to make matters worse she thought well you know the russians that were really good into get, getting into the american psyche I mean, and I think maybe blacks are vulnerable to them. Like maybe blacks That's should not go. The, she said that to Nina Turner? He said that to Nina Turner. There were a couple of us listening. We were like, on, it was going, it was live streaming on, on Facebook and we were kind of listening together, a couple of us. And we just, and, and Maggie's looking at me, oh my God, was that as racist as it sounded? I'm saying, oh, she, she didn't get enough punishment from Nina 15 minutes ago. And boy, Nina, Nina fired both barrels at her. Oh, good. Yeah, I mean, she did. And and boy, Joe, she was visibly shaken. She did not expect that. And so, you know, when when Nina is standing on her ground like that, you know, that's that's awesome. I mean, Nina, I know she has to get to Congress, but I don't think straddling positions are, is going to help her. Um, you know, she was walking back a little bit because they had all these Republicans come after her. But, uh, some incredibly mild statement like, oh, Palestinians are human beings with human rights, literally was kind of the statement. And she should have been taking Chantel to the woodshed 
for getting Republicans to attack her on that. But she, you know, because we we got to hold together, you know, for in well in, in a place like in, in a place like the eleventh district in Ohio, you don't have to pull together because there are you know the, the Republicans are in a firm minority. So you know, just I hope that she's she's a little tougher publicly, which I know she can be. And I'll probably be out there a few days before. It's all about turnout, and in those areas, you know, people. And when 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 are the primaries? Uh, the prime, I, I, it's at the end of the, it's in June and I have to look up the, uh, I wanted to look up the date, but I don't know that one, uh, right off the top of my head, but I know, I think Junaid's, uh, no, she's in, no, she's in May. That's right. Because I've, I've got, I've got travel in June. So I think, uh, I, I think she's in May. Our primary is at the end of June. Sorry. There's a lot of prime people I'm supporting, but um, I think it's the first weekend in May. Well, you know, we can go on Al Gore's internet and find that out. You yes. know, Ohio. And primary. while doing that, let's say hello to Peter B. Collins, hey. Bay Area Radio Hall of Famer. May who, 3rd. May 3rd. Yeah. Who looks like it's, it looks like spring has sprung <laughs> in, in, San Francisco has greetings, it? David and Professor Marianne. Uh, I do apologize. Uh, my lighting director called in sick today, and it's a little dark here in my home office. But it is still daylight outside, even though we're having a little unpredicted rain shower. So I have the door open to enjoy the uh, the fresh air and that moisture because we don't get enough of that these days. Right. right. We we woke up to snow around Ooh. here. Yeah, I got that report from Ann Arbor too. I uh, woke yeah. up to soot. We had we we had snow. I mean, I was driving back from uh, Michigan today, uh -huh. and uh, somebody just uh, texted me though a, a picture of our neighborhood at about seven o'clock this morning. I'm going, no, <laughs> <laughs> it's mostly melted, you know, of course at, at this time of year, but. Um, but I have to say, I'm a little uh, distressed. Apparently, Scott Ritter's uh, uh, Twitter account is still, still suspended. Yes. And so is Pepe Escobar's. And, Pepe uh, Escobar's, they suspended his account? Oh. Yes. Uh huh. And this over the weekend, at the suggestion of one of my longtime listeners and supporters, a gentleman named Del Leonard, who lives in Maine, he pinged me and said, hey, Peter, uh, Pepe got kicked off of uh, Twitter. Why don't you invite him on the Feldman show? So oh. I did. But uh, Pepe begged off because he's currently in France. He kind of divides his time between Paris and Bangkok. Mm -hmm. uh, but he is in France and appearing on the Feldman podcast at 6 a.m. His time was just not appealing enough. <laughs> 6 a.m.? We could put him on, you know, uh, it well, be our late night. well, why don't we thank Professor Marianne Cummings? I'll give you the last word. And then no, we'll I mean, we need to continue this conversation because there's a disturbing trend that we are not allowed to counter the prevailing nar narrative, which is looking more and more juvenile and obviously exaggerated at, at the very least, you know, as the days go by. Hey, don't and step out of line. Yeah, they there are platforms that we're on. Yeah. I I have gotten emails from you know certain platforms. Do not discount the war in Ukraine. Do not say it is fake. Do not question the atrocities. Do not question uh and don't defend Putin. Well, and, and you know, that, that's interpreted very broadly because yes. any criticism of the government of Ukraine uh, or the influence of neo-Nazis or the latest allegation of the use by Ukraine of cluster bombs after we heard a whole chorus of boos when we were told that Russia was using cluster bombs, 
And we make cluster bombs that we sell to Israel. And uh, so the, the selective outrage, the uh, uh, consensus hypocrisy is something that's very troubling. And Pepe Escobar is not an American. He's a Brazilian uh, born international reporter who I've known for 15 years. Is and he still writing for the Asian Times? He writes for Asia Times, but many other outlets too. Asia Times has had a lot of ups and downs. Okay. Uh, but, but Pepe is a remarkable guy who I have turned to time and again for the offshore perspective. How does American imperialism look when it's not laundered through the corporate media in this country? And so I consider him a very valuable voice. He sometimes, for my taste, is a little too pro-China. He sometimes uh, comes off as a little too pro-Russia. But when all we're getting is the Pentagon's you know, official narrative uh, parroted by the media and then heightened with these very emotional and powerful personal stories uh, and they're heartbreaking stories. But we have to be as hard-nosed as anyone else about what the real risks are if we allow Jake Tapper to present another toothless, pardon me for what I'm about to say, but a toothless elderly woman from a little town in Ukraine who survived World War II and now is facing this as you know her final chapter. Those are tragic, tragic stories. I've seen some stories in nurse, same identical stories in uh, American nursing homes. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and, I'm being serious. I mean, uh, not to discount the suffering in Ukraine, mm -hmm. but you don't have to go to Ukraine to see a toothless survivor of World War II facing death and uh, neglect. And mm -hmm. go ahead, please. I'm sorry. Well, it, it, it's just this. And now we're seeing the uh, kind of censorship that the social media platforms either sidestepped or, uh, you know, they went through certain motions, but they attempted to pre preserve some modicum of, of freedom for us to express. But now after Russiagate, the left was completely groomed to see Putin as the darkest Dr. Evil. And we all have to fall in line. And it was Ari Fleischer back after 9-11 who lectured people like Bill Maher, uh, watch what you say. And so we are in another period of that right now. And those of us who call it out, those of us who are critical of the mainstream media and want to uh, respect the intelligence of our listeners and viewers are being forced to shut up and fall in line. And it's a very dangerous precedent because these rights will not be recovered even to the extent they existed six months ago. And if Elon Musk gets Twitter, who knows? <laughs> I've never seen anything like this in America before. Even the Iraq war, there was a peace movement. There were people questioning the administration, I've never seen you, 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 I've never seen anything like this before. Now, granted, we're not sending troops in and we're not invading, but we are providing war material to, to Zelensky and prolonging this pretty much in the name of commerce. I mean, there's just no, there's no attempt to negotiate with Putin. I've never seen anything like this. It's even the even Chamberlain met with Hitler. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I in fact, just an hour ago, I was talking to an old contact who is an activist with Veterans for Peace. And uh, I mentioned to him that we've got a, a war that is supported by most Americans. And we're not seeing the kind of call for peace 
worldwide that we saw in 2003 to 2005 or so. Uh, and, you know, I, I think many people feel helpless, but I think most people are brainwashed. And it's just Putin bad and war good. War good and Ukraine, so sorry. Thoughts and prayers. And we'll send you, you know, we'll send you more guns. Let me play you a clip from the CEO of Raytheon. Uh, I think, again, um, recognizing, you know, we are there to defend democracy. And the fact is, eventually, we will see some benefit in the business over time. Uh, everything that's being shipped into Ukraine today, of course, is coming out of stockpiles, either at DOD or uh, from our NATO allies. And uh, that's all great news. Eventually, we'll have to replenish it. And we'll, we will see a, a benefit to the business over the next coming years. Yeah, it's an inventory clearance. Gregory J. Hayes, CEO of Raytheon. And a future Secretary of Defense. Absolutely. <laughs> no, I mean, you're, it's funny, but it's true. The last two both came from Raytheon. Well. The current yeah. guy uh, and, and the Raytheon connection was totally buried because he's the first African-American Secretary of War. Right. And the guy before that, Mark Esper, just another weapons slanger from Raytheon. But the truth is... We are there to defend democracy. <laughs> Come on, don't you love democracy? Yeah. Couldn't we, if he's there to defend democracy, if Raytheon... Why don't we vote? Why don't we ask the American people? Why don't we take it to a vote whether or not we want to send arms to Ukraine or diplomats? I think most Americans would prefer diplomats. This is why we have to bring back the draft. So, Well, David, do you remember uh, Mike Gravel, the Alaska senator who ran for president and yes. was the butt of many jokes? He, he was a very serious man. After all, he facilitated the uh, reading of the Pentagon Papers into the, uh, the Senate record when he served in the Senate. And <clears throat> he promoted for a long time before he ran for president the idea of a national referendum. And it would come in handy at a time like this. On whether or not to go to war. Mm -hmm. Hello? Sorry, you, I'm so, coughing a little bit. I'm trying to avoid uh, broadcasting that. Uh, on this show, a cough is, is better than my voice. Uh, <laughs> talk to me about drone operators and what you read in the New York Times. Well, Sunday's paper, <clears throat> which I have here, and there isn't enough light for people watching on YouTube to read much of it, but they had an interesting... A uh, feature story on page one that jumped into the uh, main section and went on for a while. And it's, it's perfectly legitimate reporting. In fact, David Talbot, the uh, muckraking author and uh, founder of Salon, uh, posted this article and, and gave modest praise to the Times for publishing it. And what it is, is it's based on the sad story of uh, Captain Kevin Larson who worked at the Creech Air Force Base outside Las Vegas. And he was a drone operator. And the cumulative effect of doing that job for, I think, two to three years uh, uh, led him to use psychedelic drugs to try to clear his mind so he could sleep. And he used ecstasy or the street name Molly. And uh, he told his wife about that. She ended up divorcing him and, and testifying against him in a court martial. And uh, ultimately he uh, was convicted. He was told to come back after lunch, but uh, he loaded up his Jeep and hit the road. And when he was cornered in uh, Northern California, he shot himself. And it is a very tragic story. And it deserves to be told, but it's too late. 
This has been going on since 2001. That's when we first uh, admitted that we were using unmanned aerial vehicles. And there are a number of courageous whistleblowers who have stepped forward at great personal expense. There are former members of the military, and I'll single out Colonel Ann Wright, who joined Code for Peace, and they protested the, the Creech site, and also uh, there's one in uh, near Buffalo in upstate New York. And they have been drawing attention, not only to the people on the receiving end of drone strikes, and that deserves much more coverage too, the innocents who were monitored from the sky uh, for days uh, before, based on a, a ping from a cell phone that may be in the hands of its owner, may not, we don't know, but they would make a remote decision, often aided by the Tuesday meetings in the Obama White House, to kill somebody. And the collateral damage, the weddings that were hit, the families who were taken out, the uh, <clears throat> unexpected passenger in a car that was blown up, those stories all deserve to be told. But in three or 4,000 words in the Times yesterday, uh, they didn't even mention Daniel Hale. Daniel Hale is still is currently serving 45 months in federal prison. His sentence was longer than that, but he had some time served before he went to trial. And he started in 2013 trying to go through the channels, trying to be a legit whistleblower trying to expose the cavalier manner in which people were remotely executed. And we see this as an antiseptic way to conduct warfare because it doesn't put Americans right. at risk, or so we think. Right. But Larson and Hale are just two people who took the orders and the, the Times explains that the CIA is not called some other agency in this context. They're called the customer. And when wow. the customer ordered a kill, the team had to deliver. And Hale and Larson, they lived with the guilt and the ugly sense of responsibility that they felt. Larson described how he would drive home to his family from Creech into suburban Las Vegas. He said, I got to hug my kids after I just watched a guy who was murdered with his entire family. And so this is where we're at. We, we talked about the corporate media's coverage of the current war. Now that it's safe, you know, uh, to my knowledge, and that's an important qualifier, we don't have any hot uh, drone attacks that are occurring on a regular basis right now. We don't even know what Biden's drone policy is. We don't know if he has a, a drone meeting once a month, once every six months to decide who we can uh, uh, kill. But just like the domestic surveillance, just like so many other issues, the fact that the generals knew that Afghanistan was a bust for years, that more money, more troops, more time wasn't going to make a goddamn bit of difference. And they will expose that when it doesn't matter. As we know, Congress isn't going to investigate. Lawsuits will not be allowed to proceed to any meaningful conclusion. And what is really ghastly is the way we freely talk about atrocities in Ukraine. And I will stipulate that I believe, you know, most of that atrocity making can be attributed to Russia. But I don't think Ukraine is innocent. But we play it that way. There's, there are no innocents in war other than the civilians. Yeah. So it, it's, you know, it, it, 
after the years that I put in uh, as a left-leaning media figure, it's really dispiriting to see how we fought so hard for leftist views for diplomacy over bombs. And it, it's been wiped out. Gone. And, Gone. I, I can't believe that. I mean, am I missing something in the well of the Senate or in Congress? Are there any? Are, is anybody saying, where's the diplomacy? Is Bernie? No, Bernie doesn't talk about these kinds of things. And I'm sorry to say that. I'll give you a quick story. Uh, when I substituted for Tom Hartman on a number of occasions, I, I did his Friday show where Bernie was featured in an hour long uh, segment on a regular basis. So we're going into the segment and I have about a minute to talk to Bernie on the back channel off the air. And I said, hey, Bernie, just a heads up, I, I want to uh, talk to you about the latest news from Israel. And this, I, you know, I don't know what that news was anymore. I can't remember that. Uh, and he said, no, I don't want to talk about that. He said, here's what we're going to do. <laughs> and he ticked off uh, three domestic issues. He wanted to talk about Medicare for all. He mm -hmm. wanted to talk about a $15 minimum wage. And, you know, just other things that are part of his pretty standard agenda. And because it wasn't my show, uh, I didn't put up a fight. Right. But it, it really galled me. And access uh, is overrated. Get gaining access to celebrities and politicians, not politicians, but incumbents, it's overrated. They will not answer your questions. They squirm, they deflect, they distract, and they make you feel like you're Mike Wallace. They make you feel like a prick. Let me give you two exceptions. Keith Ellison, now the Attorney General of Minnesota. He was a member of Congress. He was briefly the Democratic uh, National Committee Chair before Obama forced him out using Tom Perez as the wedge. And I was at, uh, what is it, the Daily Coast thing, Net, Net, Net something nation, Net Roots nation. Net Roots. And there's uh, Keith Ellison. And I'd, I'd met him before and talked to him. And I put a microphone in front of his face. And I said, did James Clapper lie under oath when he denied that there was a massive domestic surveillance program? And Ellison, he spelled it out. He said, yeah, L-I-E. He lied. Well, uh, uh, Merkley, Jeff Merkley, senator from Oregon, was there. I asked him the same question. Oh, just a whole word salad, but he couldn't bring himself to state the obvious. And it was his colleague, Ron Wyden, who had asked Clapper the question. So the, the other one who has been brutally honest is Maxine Waters. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> you could ask her anything, and she will not filter it. Beyond that, the list is pretty short, David. Right. So why talk to them? Because they're, you know, short of the full unvarnished truth. They're working on incremental change on bills that are better than doing nothing, better than an alternative. Right. And it gives a guy like me a chance to at least try to get them to answer the question. Right. I wouldn't bother with Ted Cruz. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So the, I want to, I want to credit uh, <clears throat> the uh, two professors from Sonoma State's Project Censored because back in 2008, at a uh, media reform conference that was put on in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, they declared a truth emergency. And the media reform people, including my friend John Nichols, who writes for the nation and uh, was part of the, uh, the free press 
media reform group based in Washington. Uh, they tried to hush uh, Mickey, uh, Mickey. Oh, I'm sorry. I can see him, but I can't summon Mickey's but last Kaus, name. Klaus? Pardon me? Kaus? Klaus? No. Huff, Mickey Huff and Peter Phillips. And the, those guys at their booth had put up a sign, Truth Emergency. And the uh, organizers of the conference came around and said, please take that down. There's a Fox News crew here. We don't want them to see that. Wow. <laughs> so we have been living in a truth emergency for quite some time. And, you know, Obama was slick and, you know, put a great face on it. Trump was blatant. And, you know, it confounds us that so many people would believe his lies. And, you know, Biden is, is in the Obama zone. Uh, he's not as, as clever as Obama, and he blurts things out that uh, are not in the script. But, you know, we, we have not lived with the truth for a long, long time. I wonder if it's always been the same in terms of the quality of the leadership. People like Matt Gates, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, the lunatics in the House of Representatives and the, and the Senate, they didn't have a bullhorn the way they do now. Isn't it necessary if you're going to run a party through the Senate or through the House, you need yes people you need people to shut up get in line and vote the way i tell you to so they go out of their way to harvest imbeciles in various hamlets across america this is a useful idiot let's run them for congress you can't have uh 435 alan graysons nothing will get done so you let's let's run this guy he'll keep his he's an idiot he likes you know whatever the problem is now they have access to Twitter and Facebook and people cover them haven't these idiots always been around sure <laughs> I mean <laughs> uh, over the weekend I had to bite my lip to avoid an argument with a relative who was visiting and he's from Michigan and he was uh, extolling Gerald Ford. And Gerald Ford was a useful idiot on the Warren Commission. Gerald Ford was a useful idiot in the right wing uh, failed effort to impeach Earl Warren. Gerald Ford was a useful idiot in covering Nixon's crimes and pardoning him uh, before any accountability could occur. And then they promoted him. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and he was perhaps our dumbest president. Uh, but not Dumber everybody. than George W? Dumber than Trump? Well, I don't consider Trump dumb. He's, he's, uh, he's an innate intelligence, but. Yeah. Uh, it, it's a, you, you threw a tough one to me comparing. W and Ford, uh, but my my point is just you know in in my lifetime, there have always been idiots in Congress, Wilbur Mills, uh, uh, you know all kinds of people who were there just because they had they were next in a in a political uh, machine or uh, region. And uh, they had done all the right things to fend off challengers by giving them money or getting them jobs. Uh, so there have been many people who were clever at the uh, machinery of election uh, who you know, weren't really interested in the process of governing. And if they had enough power and they were guaranteed re-election, yeah, it was good enough for them. They just do what they were told. Well, before you go, there was an Easter egg hunt today 
on the White House lawn, no masks. A lot of senior citizens, no masks. Nobody's wearing masks. Is COVID over? Have they just surrendered to the right wing on this, on the mask issue? Well, we have to check the guest list. Was anybody invited from Philadelphia where the current spike surge is <laughs> uh, being reported? I don't know. <clears throat> there is a the, nice going on right now. Well, I, I believe that the calculation, and this is just speculation on my part, but Joe Biden is looking at his 33 approval rating, 33%. And saying, you know, if I make any moves, it's going to get even lower. And, you know, he essentially has allowed people to say that, that COVID is over, that Omicron is behind us. But the reports are, you know, there, there are these new sub variants of Omicron that just have numbers and dots. And I think there's a B.1.2.12 <laughs> or something like that. But of course, we have now largely dismantled the PCR testing that was widely available just three months ago. And so these, I'll call them less reliable home tests are being used, but there's no uniform reporting I mean, if so, that uh, means no new cases. You test positive, and you stay home. You're not listed as a new case. Yes, right. And and our data collection on this has been miserable from the start, but uh, it's now just a, a shambles. So, David, uh, before I go, <clears throat> I just wanted to mention that uh, today is my fiftieth uh, year of filing tax returns. And I, I, I want to tell you one funny thing. I, I, I've been running a nonprofit and had to, to file a return. It had less than $10,000 in revenue. But in this form that you fill out, there is an odd question. And that was, did the organization derive any revenue from an indoor tanning facility? <laughs> I don't know any nonprofits that are devoted to tanning indoor or outdoor, but I have to feel this is an artifact of the Democrats pretending that they opposed Trump's 2017 tax cuts for corporations and the wealthy. And I do recall there was something inserted there related to tanning salons. But to see this trickle down to the tax return for a nonprofit <laughs> just, just floored me. But well, speaking of trickling down, let me play you a clip from Tucker Carlson. Um, if you want to optimize and take it uh, to another level, expose yourself to red light therapy. Yes. Um, and the juve um, that we were using in the documentary, there's a massive amount Which of that. testicle tanning. It's testicle tanning, but so much <laughs> out there um, that isn't being picked up on or covered. So obviously half the viewers right now are like, what? That's testicle tanning? That's crazy. But my view is, OK, testosterone levels like crash and nobody says anything about it. That's crazy. So why is it crazy to seek solutions? It's not crazy to seek solutions. And I think um, I was recently exposed to a term called bromeopathy. And I think there's a lot of people out there right now that um or don't trust the mainstream information bromeopathy the really? last time i had hot nuts uh i was <laughs> strolling i was strolling a manhattan street and there was a vendor there <laughs> but the last point i'd like to make well hang on before you move on okay if, if tucker carlson is pushing canning salons for our testicles and you're running a nonprofit and what did they want to know about tanning salons did we derive any income last year from indoor tanning facilities so something's going on it's in the same section did you have a fundraiser did you have a casino night uh, <laughs> i can't explain it <laughs> well okay at but the large the larger point i want to make is that 
Americans are put through a ridiculous and meaningless ritual because the IRS already knows what's on your W-2. They know what's on your 1099. The only thing they don't know is any cash income and what your deductions are. And the, you know, it's arguable whether it's a benefit or not, but the Trump tax reform uh, raised the standard deduction to $12,000, which means that a lot of people don't need to track their deductions because they wouldn't have exceeded that anyway. So we could easily just send the IRS a postcard that says, here are my deductions in five categories. Here is my cash income that wasn't reported by some other party. And calculate my taxes and send me a bill. But just like immigration, the Republicans benefit from not solving the problem. We're told there's a huge backlog at the IRS. And we know that the number of uh, inspectors and auditors uh, was sharply reduced over the last five years. Big surprise, backlog at the IRS. Well, that's the way they like it. Mm -hmm. Because the, <clears throat> the people who have massive wealth, they don't have an income. The clever ones borrow money from their largesse and just never pay that loan back. It's not taxable. So Elon Musk can buy the world's biggest yacht that can't get under the bridge in Rotterdam. <laughs> that's that's uh, Bezos. Oh, Bezos. Thank you. Uh, and, and, you know, the little people have to sit down or they have to get TurboTax or pay H&R Block or a CPA to do their taxes when there is no mystery to this. And yet... Congress will never do anything to fix it. And you do know that we, we do have to wrap it up, but you do know that TurboTax is free to anybody who wants to file all by themselves. That's the deal they made with Congress. Mm -hmm. The deal is we will provide free software. Just don't tell anybody. Right. That's the deal. You don't have to pay an account. You know, I did my own taxes three years ago. And I looked at it through TurboTax. I went, I owe too much. I must have screwed up. And I went to an accountant and he said, no, TurboTax, want me to file this trip? They did it right. But the other reason taxes are complicated is it's a scam to get a CPA. Right. You have to pay all this money to get the license. And now we have millions of CPAs. And somebody said to me, don't we have a right to make a living? And I said, no, you don't. <laughs> no. <laughs> because you're a CPA. You're, you're the very same person who gets hired to cut costs. You're the one who sits down with the billionaire and says, you know, you don't need this factory in Warren, Pennsylvania. Don't I have a right to earn a living? Peter B. Collins is a Bay Area Radio Hall of Famer. Go to peterbcollins.com for a treasure trove of his interviews, podcasts, and radio shows, and plug rahima.org for us. Well, Rahima is the Silicon Valley Fund Foundation that was started by uh, your next guest's mom. That would be uh, Professor Adnan Hussein's mother. And uh, they have been helping immigrants and refugees in California for, I believe, over 30 years. Uh, and they have uh, supported waves of immigrants and uh, refugees, I think, in particular. So Rahima.org is where you can uh, drop a dime or a dollar or uh, even more and support the work that they do. And uh, I, I think it's a tremendous organization. And uh, I'm happy that I learned about it. Great. Professor Marianne Cummings is Parks Commissioner of Aurora, Illinois. She's a particle physicist. Follow her on Twitter at Razor Girl. Thank you both. Very, very interesting. Well, Our Professor. Pleasure. Can I, David? Thank you. I'll see you next week, I hope. 
Professor Adnan Hussein hosts the Mudgeless podcast, as well as Guerrilla History. He's also chairman of the religion department at Queen's University up uh, at, in Kingston, Ontario. I don't know if that's up. Well, it's, it's superior, so it's... <laughs> it's up from New York, north, yes. And he joins us today. Let's talk about the Al-Aqsa Mosque. A couple hundred Palestinians were arrested Friday during a morning prayer service for Ramadan. 135 were injured. Israeli security forces spent about an hour lobbing tear gas into the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which I think is the third holiest site in Muslim religion. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. It's a, a sacred spot. Um, the, um, of course, the two holy places in the Arabian Peninsula, what is today uh, rather grotesquely, in my opinion, called Saudi Arabia, um, Medina and Mecca, um, you know, take pride of place because they're part of the objects of pilgrimage during the Hajj that takes place in about three months or so. But um, Jerusalem was the first um, direction towards uh, which Muslims prayed. Um, and there is also the tradition of the night journey uh, where Muhammad uh, journeyed and met all the other prophets. Um, um, and um, the dome of the rock in the famous gold um, domed structure on the top of uh, what you know, was thought of as the Temple Mount, uh, where also the Masjid al-Aqsa, the Aqsa Mosque is located, is the um, supposed to be the, the foundation stone of the temple. And also at the same time is thought to be the stone from which um, he made this mystical journey uh, and visited the heavens and, um, and the, the levels of, of hell, um, which was in fact actually an inspiration for Dante's uh, divine comedy is this idea of visiting, going on a kind of journey a spiritual or mystical journey to visit and see the condition of those who were pious and rewarded in the levels of heaven, but also how they will be, you know, subject to all kinds of torments in, in, in hell. That, that vision that Dante had in the Divine Comedy um, is thought to be uh, inspired by a translation from Arabic into uh, uh, the vernacular Italian uh, of Muhammad's journey um, that it provided inspiration. So, the point is, yes, that a Jerusalem is a, a holy city for Jews, for Christians, and for Muslims. And unfortunately, um, it has been a site of contestation uh, to have a kind of religious national sovereignty over the control of these holy places. And that is leading to, um, I wouldn't say that it itself is leading to, I would say that the political situation exacerbates these religious identities and the investments that people have in religious sovereignty and control over their holy shrines and sanctuaries. And we see the same thing happening for Christians. This is often characterized as just a matter of Jews and Muslims, but um, you know, next weekend um, will be the Orthodox Easter. So Easter for Roman Catholics and those in the Western churches was celebrated just this last weekend, Easter Sunday, we're now in Easter Monday, but in the Orthodox uh, churches, which includes Ethiopia, um, uh, Egypt, the Copts of Egypt, the Armenians, um, Russian Orthodox, Ukrainian Orthodox, uh, Serbian Orthodox, and Greek Orthodox, those that conclave of, church, of, of church community celebrates Easter this coming weekend. And they have a very special ceremony that takes place in Jerusalem at the Church of the Resurrection or the Holy Sepulchre as it's known uh, in the Latin West. Um, on Saturday, there is believed that a holy fire descends and relights all of the, well, relights the candles or the lights in the tomb of, of, of Christ as a kind of miracle that symbolizes the resurrection after being entombed, the resurrection on the third day. And they have a whole um, liturgical performance that involves 
you know, anticipating this divine fire coming. And now that means that it brings a lot of people in for Easter services. And this year, uh, there have been restrictions put on to limit the number to only a thousand uh, you know, uh, visitors. And the Orthodox Church itself has said they are not going to abide by these limitations, and they've complained about, about these. And so what we have is, you know, a variety of um, communities that are, um, you know, sort of struggling to assert their um, uh, public performance of their religious uh, identity and their um, their religious um, uh, practices in these spaces. Um, and it's leading to, of course, exacerbating uh, conflict um, in, 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 this, uh, in this period. And I think we're at a very interesting moment because it's Passover. Passover is, of course, uh, you know, Easter is based, uh, you know, uh, to some extent on um, uh, the Passover. The Last Supper was. That's right. The Last Supper and the events uh, of the Last Supper are, you know, a Passover feast. So there's an intimate connection. They don't always perfectly overlap because of different ways of calculating. This year they do very closely. And likewise, it's the month of Ramadan. And so you have Muslims going to the mosque in the early morning in large numbers. And so these religious enthusiasms, of course, create, you know, um, potentially, uh, you know, security issues because it brings so many people out. I mean, I recall that even, you know, the Crusaders, for example, in the 12th century outlawed the Friday prayer in Nablus because they were just, you know, concerned about hundreds and thousands of uh, the inhabitants of the city coming together, listening to some, you know, kind of speech in a language they don't understand, and perhaps it leading to, you know, revolt, uh, insurrection, or throwing off of, you know, the uh, crusader uh, control. So bringing out a lot of people and um, channeling their kind of uh, emotions in this way is, is seen as, um, you know, potentially dangerous. And um, so we see the authorities, the Israeli authorities are quite concerned um, about- What was the cause to lob tear gas? How do you justify lobbing tear gas into a mosque and arresting people? What, what was the probable cause? They were Palestinians. Yes, yes, that's right, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it provides, uh, you know, I think these are performances. So in addition to the religious performance, these are performances that are taking place in a multi-religious context for a multi-religious audience of asserting one's religious identity vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, other religious communities. And in fact, actually, you could say in some ways, that's the whole purpose of the Dome of the Rock being built when it was built in um, 682, I think it was started by um, the Umayyad Caliph um, um, uh, of the time, um, Abdul Malik. He wanted to build uh, a monumental religious structure that announced essentially on this high spot and a, a place that was revered by other religious communities as well, um, to announce that Muslim sovereignty had come and was going to stay now, that this is the era of this, of this new dispensation and that it's superseding the previous, the previous ones. Um, so in my own research, I've actually seen how there were stories that circulated of how, um, you know, the church steeple of the Church of the Resurrection um, or other structures were higher than the Dome of the Rock and that this angered the Caliph. And so the Caliph tried to, you know, have this removed and cut down so that, you know, his religion's, you know, uh, monumental uh, collective uh, cathedral mosque would be higher and that miraculously wasn't able to topple it. It just would keep coming back. And so what oh. these stories are about are, you know, responding to the loss of sovereignty. And in fact, actually that miracle of the church uh, of the holy fire coming into the church of the resurrection that is being anticipated for this coming weekend is in a way a Christian miracle that, is, that only seems to have emerged after Muslims conquered the city.
In other words, it's a miracle that says, okay, you may be in control of the city now, you're ruling it, but Christ still reigns supreme, you know, uh, and he's going to show this, that he is still sovereign. Even though we're not politically sovereign, he's sovereign. And so this is kind of what we're dealing with is um, the way in which uh, there are performances of one's identity in this atmosphere of sovereignty, of religious sovereignty, having its own politics. Now, I wouldn't say that's the source of the conflict, not at all, but this certainly exacerbates why at this moment we're seeing particularly friction, just as we did last year at right around this time. It's I because of the confluence of these religious performances of people being brought out in large numbers for communal and collective revitalizing of their identities, uh, that is seen as dangerous. And so there's a contest going on. India, Lord Mountbatten uh, decided to split India into Muslims and Hindi, Hindus. Yes, yeah. How many Muslims were left behind in India? How big a Muslim population do they have in India and how are they faring? Well, for a very long time, India was the second largest Muslim nation by population. Now, obviously, Muslims are a minority in India, but there are around, today around 200 million. And this used to be second only to uh, Indonesia's uh, Muslim community a very populous uh, nation. But I think now Pakistan might have just slightly more, but it's approximately equivalent, maybe 220 million in Pakistan and 200 million in India. They and didn't decide. Sorry? Go ahead, go ahead. And 100 what? Oh, and 160, 65 or so in Bangladesh. Uh, and so if you think about it, actually, um, at the time that uh, the British were uh, making determinations about the future disposition of the Indian subcontinent and the end of British colonial rule, um, you know, they're known for dividing and conquering. I mean, you, you see what happened in Northern Ireland, we see Israel, Palestine, and of course, also the Indian subcontinent. And they usually ruled through, um, people's tribal, ethnic, or religious identity. Like they, they made much of this. And so they had privileged certain communities as right. uh, administrators in their, administ you know, in their governance and that they would recruit them into their armies as troops. So you see many Sikhs and Muslims were troops in the British armies because there was a kind of secretarial and administrative or bureaucratic class from the previous Mughal Empire. The British often used those same cadres to help them administer. And as a result, when it came time for independence, there were concerns by, you know, uh, the majority Hindu community that, you know, they want to be able to frame and establish a state on, you know, uh, uh, outside of British colonial influence. And this concerned the Muslims that they would be a minority and they would no longer have that predominant administrative and governing sort of position. And so they decided they needed to have their own nation based on their religious identity. And you have the severing of the Indian subcontinent and the creation of Pakistan. Initially, it was both East and West Pakistan, that is Bangladesh and Pakistan together. There was a civil war and they became separate countries. But if you think about it, what it did is it legitimized in some ways what has happened now, which is the rise of Hindu nationalism. Because although initially the Congress party, you know, was a secular state and it was, you know, equal citizenship, if you create a separate country specifically for the Muslims, then you're implicitly suggesting that India is for the Hindus. And right. it creates a kind of religious nationalism in response to, you know, Muslim religious nationalism that founded Pakistan. Currently, you know, Muslims are about uh, 15, 14 to 15 percent of India's population. If there hadn't been the separation and partition, which of course we have to emphasize was the largest transfer of human populations in the history of the world. We're talking about a few million people moved from what, because 
Hindus and Sikhs left what is today Pakistan and most, many Muslims left what is today you know, India. And there were violent clashes. It led to a lot of bloodshed because again, it politicized religious identity in this way. But if it hadn't been partitioned in this way, Muslims would be about 33% of the population. And while they still would be a minority, that's a very large substantial community that right. I don't think they'd be in the same position that they're in now, especially under this more re religious nationalist, Hindu nationalist government, um, where now you have religious processions, much like what we were seeing happening in Jerusalem is religious possession, uh, 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 processions, uh, for Ram, the various uh, Hindu festivals, aggressively going to, uh, you know, to pass by mosques, um, specifically in their uh, procession route, in order to, um, you know, express a kind of do the dominance of the dominant religious community. And it created conflict, sacking of mosques and clashes and um, arrests, huge numbers of arrests. And we've been seeing this, um, you know, happening very frequently. Um, uh, you know, uh, is uh, Modi uh, encouraging this? Well, Modi's uh, party, the BJP, um, you know, uh, do have an ideology of uh, exalting the, you know, Hindu characteristics of the Indian of Indian society and of the state. Um, and um, he definitely is somebody who, when he was the governor, I believe, of Uttar Pradesh, seems to have been responsible or at least looked the other way when the law needed to be enforced, when there were communal riots between Hindus and Muslims, particularly around the charged question of the status of the Ayodhya mosque that was alleged to have been this holy place, the birthplace of Ram, a uh, very, you know, kind of would be, you know, as a result, a very holy place for the Hindus, but it was a mosque, at least in historical memory since the uh, 15th or 16th centuries under the Mughals. And um, there were lots of conflicts around this. Um, and um, it led to the deaths and almost like what you might say pogroms, you know, of, of Muslims in many cities in this North Indian um, province of Uttar Pradesh. Um, and um, he is uh, blamed for fomenting some of this, but certainly um, for never really having an inquiry and bringing any of the perpetrators to justice. Um, and so he's brought that same kind of um, attitude, I think, to um, the federal, uh, federal politics as well. And so it's fairly routine now that, you know, uh, Muslims will be killed. For example, there will be rumors spread about um, murder of cows, okay? The Muslims do eat meat, um, and, but the cow is a holy uh, animal sanctified for, for Hindus and upper castes in particular are vegetarian. And so sometimes there might be traffic accidents or things like that. And cows that wander about sort of freely might be hit by a car and immediately rumors will go out that the Muslims have murdered this cow specifically. And there will be a riot where they will find somebody and make them a scapegoat of this, of this situation. That's something that's happening very routinely. Wow. You know, I was visiting a friend at a nursing home that was run, I guess it's a kosher nursing home. It was on a Saturday. And I guess this was an Orthodox Jew. And he says to me, uh, can you open a door for me? And I said, I can open up many doors. I have much influence for you. Uh, and he says, no, I need you to open up the door for me. I have to visit somebody. I said, yeah, I'll go open the door. He goes, are you Jewish? I said, yes. Forget it. I go, why? I need a non-Jew to open the door for me. And I was tempted to say, no, you need a psychiatrist. <laughs> then I realized, all right, maybe there's something to this, but uh, I did feel contempt for that. Like, what, what, what happened to you that you that you need a non-Jew to open a door for you on a Saturday? Like, because God says you can't work, but you're 
obviously carrying a book. I think this guy was a rabbi. He was visiting a patient and he's negotiating with God. I'm obeying the Sabbath because he sounds pretty I, busy. To be yeah. Honest. <laughs> yeah. He was wearing a suit, but I didn't open a door on the Sabbath. So God, did I get one by it? I mean, it's just, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but it just feels like that effort should be channeled into healing the world. Right, right. Well, and the, in, in, indeed, you know, is there not, you know, the idea of tikkun, you know, so tikkun olam, so healing the world, making it whole, uh, repairing it. Um, so, yes, I think uh, it's more a matter of how you approach these religions. I mean, some people are very very observant about um, uh, what we would consider very minor details, but they elevate these to the true scrupulosity of religion. And for others, it's more a question of ethics and of, you know, taking the message that is guiding some of these injunctions and trying to put that into practice and see the wider communal good uh, that's at stake. Uh, but these are, you know, debates that uh, that happen. I'm afraid that I think um, it may seem totally unreasonable, but I think one of the best ways to uh, confront and deal with this is not to uh, enforce a kind of secular perspective, because that just becomes a kind of conflict, um, right. but to try and make the case of religious ethics and expand our you know, understanding of what's what's kind of the meaning of 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 these these systems that that are important for for people and giving them identity and tradition, um, but if they um, you know become a you know an end in themselves, it's kind of like you know um, I find, for example, if you talk with many Muslims, they 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 say Islam says this, Islam says that, and it's almost as if they become so concerned with the system of this organized religion that they've forgotten right. you're supposed to be worshiping god you know <laughs> like where's god in all of this like sort of forgotten in it because we're so busy working for the identity the practices the uh, you know without um kind of engaging the the more spiritual and ethical core um that gave birth to these so in any right. case i'd see the news and it's very disturbing and distressing um you know that um that uh for the sake of religious identity, you know, we have people uh, willing to put themselves into into conflict and to forget about what's most sacred, which is, you know, one another. Before you go, Pakistan, some soccer star it was in, uh, not some soccer star, like the soccer. Uh, cricket, what? actually. The cricket? cricket? Yeah, cricket. he's a famous cricketer. Okay. Yeah. And he was captain of the Pakistani team when they won, you know, the World Cup for cricket. And, um, you know, his post. That was terrible what I just said. Some <laughs> that, was that was. That was. But, he, but the point is, is that he was a real outsider. You know, a real outsider. Very charismatic. Yeah, I mean, obviously, good looks, a famous athlete, um, you know, had a glamorous life, but he decided in his post cricket career, post athletic career, to get involved in um, various uh, non governmental charitable works. Um, and also to get into politics, he founded an outsider populist party. He took brave stances early on, like in the early 2000s against drone bombings and um, was very concerned about the US invasion in Afghanistan. And um, so he has had a kind of anti-imperial perspective, uh, populist protection of Pakistani sovereignty and is an outsider who come. And so he's been compared in some ways to a kind of Trump figure. And you can see that he is reviled by the establishment, the established political parties, the media in Pakistan. But, um, you know, although no prime minister uh, rather famously has, has served their full term, uh, all the other ones, when they departed, uh, people were pretty disgusted with them, with their corruption, with their ineffectualness. Um, in his case, he was ineffectual, but I don't think people believe he was corrupt. And that's also why 
there are hundreds and thousands of people demonstrating to try and restore him to power. So Pakistan is facing a very serious uh, situation. On the one hand, there was a constitutional crisis because um, there was a vote of no confidence proposed. He said this was all US and foreign kind of meddling. It was a plot to get him out. Um, you know, perhaps the uh, reason most proximately, I mean, obviously he's been somewhat unpopular and outside of the US orbit, um, you know, for his entire career, uh, but he also happened to make an official visit to Russia on the day of the Ukraine, in, uh, you know, invasion. And the US was very unhappy uh, with, um, you know, with his behavior that he should have canceled uh, the, the meetings and so on. And he, and Pakistan did not vote, you know, to put in these sanctions. They took a neutral stance. And so in the intervening time since February 24th and that fateful visit and meetings in Washington with the U.S., with the Pakistani ambassador to the U.S., who was told in no uncertain terms that, you know, the U.S. was quite uh, unhappy uh, with his government. Uh, since that time, there has been brewing a sharpening crisis politically where members of his own coalition were induced to join the no confidence opposition. They ended up uh, proposing a vote. He dissolved parliament, you know, unconstitutionally, but not just to prorogue it, but he said, okay, fine, let's have elections. But of course, that's the last thing any of those people want because he is quite, you know, does have a popular base. So instead it was taken to the Supreme Court of Pakistan, which normally was not a very independent institution, but they did uphold uh, the law and say it was illegal to have, um, you know, um, uh, uh, dissolved parliament. And as a result, he's out of the prime ministership. The question is, is will there be elections? And I think that's essentially the demand of the people who are demonstrating in the streets now is that there should be uh, elections and they want to see him restored. So it's a very interesting situation. Some soccer star, I apologize. I don't follow right. sports. Obviously, I don't follow sports or too closely what's happening in Pakistan. So that was uh, pretty horrible. Yeah, I mean, I think basically the question is, will Pakistan uh, continue to be as it has been since independence, basically um, a vassal state of the US? I mean, it's been under military dictatorship for most of its time. It's seldom had these civilian governments and they have been unstable. No US president has ever visited Pakistan except when there's been a military dictator ruling it. So they've done nothing to sponsor and support civilian democratic institutions, but there's, it's been a sclerotic system, even more so perhaps in the US because there are these feudal families of landlords. They never had, unlike India, that had land reform in the 1950s and 60s that helped equalize things and give peasants you know, land and opportunity. That never happened in Pakistan. So the landed elites, have controlled the political, civilian political uh, aspect with these two parties, you know, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, the Bhutto uh, Zardari uh, People's Party of Pakistan and the other, the Pakistan Muslim League under Sharif and now his brother, Nawaz Sharif and now his brother, Shahab. Uh, they've gone back and forth holding power. The true power is the military and the army and no civilian government ever runs across across them. You know, Imran Khan is almost the only one who seems to be trying to oppose. He opposed the military's appointee who the military wanted for the ISI, the inter-services uh, uh, agency that is the Pakistani Secret Service. He opposed the military's choice. And since then, the military has started to uh, put pressure on him and work with the opposition. And that's why his government has fallen. They are very worried about the fact that he's going rogue from the US policy. They want to be, you know, they're integrated in the military, you know, architecture uh, with the US after all these years of, you know, warfare in, in Afghanistan. Pakistan's military is very much in line with the US. Uh, um, uh, policy and foreign policy. And so, you know, we're going to see, is Pakistan going to be forever a vassal state of the U.S.? That's what we'll be watching and seeing. Interesting. Well, thank you for this. Professor Adnan Hussein, 
is the host of the Mudgeless podcast, as well as Guerrilla History and chairman of the religion department over at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. Who are your guests on Mudgeless and Guerrilla History? Uh, well, uh, we have a couple of guests upcoming on uh, the Majlis, um, uh, somebody who's actually going to talk about uh, Urdu poetry, Urdu poetry being the poetry of Pakistan, so sort of Pakistani culture uh, uh, and literature, we'll be talking about that this coming um, uh, later this month, and um, on uh, the, on guerrilla history, um, we just had, I put, put out an episode with Henry, we discussed uh, a 14th century Muslim, Arab Muslim historian, Ibn Khaldun, who some people call the father of the social sciences, uh, because he decided we needed to invent and develop a science of human, of studying human society in order to be able to understand history properly. Yeah. Um, yeah, so he's a fascinating figure, and you can learn a little bit about him and the relationship between history and the social sciences uh, in his in his thought. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Professor. I really Thank appreciate you. it. Well, when we come back, we will be joined by the brilliant Professor Mike Steinel. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. Friend me on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and office hours every Friday night, starting at 8 p.m. People like Professor Adnan Hussein are there and teaching. We'll be back with Professor Mike Steinel. But first, it's time for some swine bomb boogie. Porcelain hysteria in the greater Bay Area. We heard about it on CNN.com. I guess they're calling it a swine bomb. We've been infested by feral hogs. They messed up my lawn and they ate my dogs. They're taking over and they're out of control. We're gonna organize a swine patrol. We got a swine bomb. We're doing the swine bomb boogie. These hogs are smelly and they make nasty sounds. Some of them weigh close to 800 pounds. Now you tell me if you think I'm mistaken. I think that sounds like an awful lot of bacon. These critters are mean, they can tear into you. Here's what they say you're supposed to do. Get on your car or climb up a tree Cause pigs can't climb, at least that's what they tell me We're in a swine bomb Pigs can't climb Doing the swine bomb boogie Pigs can't climb Folks are getting guns and shooting them on sight I doubt if Peter thinks that's alright all my life I've been for gun control Now they done put me on swine patrol Pigs can't climb and white men can't jump All we can do is a bump de bump Can we chill these pigs out with some smooth and metal jazz? Round them all up and send them to Alcatraz We're doing the swine bomb boogie Pigs can't climb. We got a swine bomb we're doing a swine bomb boogie. Pigs can't climb. We got a swine bomb. Pigs can't climb. We're doing a swine bomb boogie. Pigs can't climb. We got a swine bomb. Pigs can't climb. We got swine hogs all over the place. We're doing a swine bomb boogie. Pigs can't climb. I don't know what we're gonna do. Tell you. Seems like we're gonna do the jigs, can't try. 
That's uh, Professor Mike Steinell, who I wish I were. <laughs> joining us from Denton, Texas, is Professor oh, Mike Steinell. Pigs can't climb. That's my favorite part of that song. Pigs can't climb, David. Isn't that something? So I've been preparing for, I think, some kind of hard drive or computer, and I'm going through everything, collecting your songs, and I've figured out a way to play. There's a... Tre- there is... You've written some amazing songs. I think there's about, there's over 30 now. That's all? I That's all? I have to count. <laughs> Only 30? <laughs> Maybe 30, I don't know. How's my volume? Perfect. Okay, good, good. Yeah, you look good. Hey, listen, I, um, I did yard work today. It's, uh, it's, it was beautiful here today. Unbelievable. Does that Very make you happy doing that? Yeah, I find it very, yeah, yeah, just, you know, first of all, being out in the air, it's good, and uh, being able to do it, you know, and, and uh, I put in uh, begonias, I have this big bed of begonias, it's uh, around underneath a pear tree, and it's very nice, got rocks there, and uh, I was very happy that almost half of my begonias from last year came back, wow. they, they, they froze out. But I didn't take them out because this happened last year. And then they just popped up. So I added some, you know, about that many more. So I got even more begonias. And the irises are coming up in the back. And tomorrow the grandson comes over. He's in town. And we're going to farm. We're going to pot geraniums, I think, in the back. So, yeah. Oh, by the way, the Reverend Barry W. Lynn butt dialed me. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> I, he was talking to his uh, one of his grandkids oh I that's just, interesting for, for you like just a, heard the conversation i just heard it was really sweet and you still like your grandson oh man he's the best okay two, he's two and a half now two and a half all right so uh it'll be uh we haven't seen him in since since christmas no god could it be no no we saw him uh, uh, we saw him about six weeks ago but the weather's great. Are you We're opening gonna... the lake house up in Kansas? I'll be soon. Uh, after this, I'm going to scoot up there and turn on the water and check everything out and maybe play some golf. And so that'll be happening soon. Right. Hey, about Swine Bomb Boogie, I'm a little miffed that uh, Emil has not weighed in on that issue in his right in his backyard. And right. I know it's a conundrum for a, a vegan because they're killing those swine. They, they have to kill them. They have to get rid of them. They're very destructive. But I was curious about he, why he, uh, he's avoiding that very serious topic. What are the swine doing? What are they doing? Well, they kill, they kill a lot of other animals. And then they tear, they tear up a lot of uh, uh, farmland. And uh, you know, they kill chickens and stuff like that. So and pigs they, are carnivorous. They're, they're omnivores. They'll eat anything, I think. I, I, I could be wrong about that. But they're really cute and smart, and they make great pets. They're, they're, yeah, you know, but these are feral. These are like, you know, these are wild haw, wild boar. Didn't you ever see, um, what was the thing about the uh, piggy, piggy, um, Lord of the Flies? Didn't you ever see the boars in Lord of the Flies? Remember they, the boys killed a boar and they kind of got a bloodlust and then they killed piggy spoiler alert if you're reading that <laughs> they killed piggy and uh yeah but i didn't know i didn't know pigs are that dangerous well when they're 800 pounds jesus they could they and they have attacked remember we we we, we did know your swine and there've been right, like, right, forgot. That. <laughs> I think we have to look at that. Hey, by the way, I I've, I've got a new song. I've I've been I've expanded uh I'm Feldman and I paint with the broad broad brush. I'm going to do it live. Oh, good. I've been I've been mining the um I've been mining the uh monologues for things and they're kind of hard to find. Every now and then, I think it's so memorable when you just go over the top 
and and that uh, I think there are more than there really are. I'm trying to. I was going to work in the one about compromat. You know, John Ross has got to be in his bonnet about you talking about compromat. But there's that's a hard rhyme. That's a hard rhyme. Well, but well, just, I ran well, across. Wait a second. I ran across the great listeners. Viewers, if you haven't seen December 27th, 2021, where David talks about Zillow porn, it is so fun. It's brilliant, David. It's the, your Zillow I don't even, well, God bless you. Thank you for saying that. I don't even remember. You don't remember doing it? <laughs> I don't it? remember. Oh, wait, wait. I re, That's right. Zillow porn is an Airbnb are the like the difference between Playboy and, and Hustler. Hustler. Yeah. But then you got into the snuff porn of Zillow porn, which is home demolitions. <laughs> the really nasty stuff. <laughs> like Zillow porn is like play because you know you can't have that. Right. Airbnb is like hustler <laughs> where you look at it and go, that could happen. <laughs> yeah, it's a, <laughs> could actually it's a li- it, that is what you should I don't know why you can't just um that's like on the quality of uh, Spalding Gray. I, I loved Spalding Gray, uh, Swimming to Cambodia. You know, he would, for those who listening, right. and, and, and if you haven't seen Spalding Gray, you've got to check him out. Right. He'll sit and talk for an hour and a half in front of a desk, is sitting behind a desk, and it's, it's spellbinding, wouldn't you say? Yeah. He, he did dram, though. <laughs> I know. He did. Well, he jumped. He jumped. Oh yeah, that's that changes the swimming to Cambodia. That, that's, I mean, I remember the first thing that Spalding Gray drowns, and I go, "Well, there goes swimming to Cambodia." Let me do this because you know Dan Frankenberger is our quiz meister. Uh oh, are we going to do a quiz? And, and and for some reason, I can't tell who is who. Which one is Dan, and which one is? Oh, for- look at that! Look at that! Now, is that the luck of the? Dr- Did you pick that? Dan? Do, you, do you have pearl snaps? You have pearl snaps? He dated pearl snaps. The great <laughs> jazz. <laughs> mine's, snaps. A cowboy, mine's a cowboy shirt. I got pearl snaps. I had Andy. a couple minutes jump on it. And I saw it. I was like, ooh, I got that shirt right over there. <laughs> <laughs> not quite. Not a quite. Not quite. Exa- you have the, uh, the northern uh, Rochester version. If I had a red background, it'd be a little closer. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, In the hat. (laughs) Dan Frankenberger is our quiz meister. (laughs) And I've been losing. I have been losing. What, what well, is accor- according to my records, uh, you've won every single one. Ah, oh, bless you. Ah, oh, there you go. So, what is our quiz tonight? Do we have one? <laughs> yes, tonight is we have a space quiz because in early April of 1970, an oxygen tank explodes on Apollo 13. Correct. Preventing the... Uh, third- this is not fair. I will because I'm obsessed with Apollo 13 and Dan. Yeah, you, he is. Yeah, that's right. So uh, let's do this, but it's a little. Is it, is it an Apollo 13 quiz? In general, it's about space, but the theme is Apollo 13. So you might have a slight advantage if you're an aficionado and uh, yeah, a, a, a studious of this event. But you got to give me. You got to give me points, like playing golf. You got to give. Right, me I'll give him. I'll give him three points. How three many questions points. are there? There are seven questions. Okay, yeah. I get three I, points. There should be four questions in honor of Passover. <laughs> Let's put some money in the in the kitty. Meow. <laughs> okay, who goes first? <laughs> well, since uh, Professor Steinel placed money in the kitty, okay, uh, I think he should go first. Okay. 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 I'm, I'm ready. Ed White was the first American to walk in space. What did he say after exiting his Gemini 4 capsule to perform the spacewalk? Was it, I don't oh. feel like a giant. I feel very, very small. Okay. I'm out. I've never felt this free in my entire life. Or... 
I brought my heavy boots, so I have them. (laughs) (laughs) I think it's okay, I'm out. I'm going to agree. That is correct. Okay, I'm out. I I think I remember that. (laughs) Yeah. Wow, that's... Or she died tragically. That's what I told my girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All the way. Uh, face to, hey, you're out. Uh, okay, I'm okay, up. Okay, I'm out. Let's tie one one. Question number like two. Three points, right? No, 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 no. I'm I'm ahead three to one. Oh, you're ahead three to one. Okay. 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 Question number two. The original Mission Control Center, used from 1960 to 1964, was located on the grounds of which U.S. military facility? Was it Andrews Air Force Base in Maryland, Langley Air Force Base in Virginia, Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida, or Cousins Bear Horse Face (laughs) in West Virginia? (laughs) Um, well, I know the answer. I'm just trying to remember what Cape, what Kennedy airport was called before they changed. Well, it's, it's Canaveral, but what was Kennedy airport before Idlewild? Was it Idlewild? Uh, no, 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 no. It was named after a mayor. It was you were at LaGuardia. Uh, LaGuardia. No, no, that okay. That's the other one. Yeah, Laguardia. No, but I'm I'm going to say Andrews. No, no, it's Canaveral. Trust me. Okay, I'm trusting you. What's, What's the correct answer? What is your answers? I say I'm Canaveral. Say Andrew, I'm, he's saying Canaveral. I'm saying Andrews. The correct answer. You. The correct answer is Cape Canaveral. Okay. <laughs> It's three to two. I, I gave you the answer. I know. I didn't trust you. Okay. <laughs> You're up. Question number three. Which of these is a place where humans live and study stars? Is it moon probe, space shuttle, international space station, or proctology office? <laughs> Well, you see the stars as he's when he starts. I'm going to say the International Space Station. I am going to agree. That is correct. <laughs> well, it's four to three. I could do this all night. This is fun. When I was researching this, I was like, when you look up the the uh, celestial events and stuff, there's the brown dwarf stars, and I'm trying to. Th- th- there was Molly no- Shannon will accuse you of sexual assault. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> I went proctology office. Number four. Okay. How do astronauts protect their bone health while in space? Is who's up? Who is this? That'd be yours. Okay. David's first. How do astronauts protect their bone health okay. while in space? Drink lots of fluids. Special space suits special medicine or exercise equipment mm. you uh, no, the bone health well i thought you were going uh, i thought number four was supposed to be a bone joke about a boner joke yeah i would say equipment the uh, number four i'm gonna say equipment also yes exercise equipment that's correct <laughs> He threw us a curve. Uh, he threw us a curve that number four wasn't a joke. Five to four. Yeah. Four to four? I, my delivery could use work. Exercise, five to four. Equ- exercise equipment could be funnier if I was better. No. Yeah. Number five. Okay. Neil Armstrong was the first man to walk on the moon. What career did he pursue after leaving NASA? 
professor at MIT, aerospace consultant for Grumman, professor at the University of Cincinnati, or arm wrestling. <laughs> Before I answer, just a little, Neil Armstrong's brother lives at the lake where our house is up in Kansas. Really? Yeah, yeah. You know him? Haven't met him, but I've heard that he's he's you know he's in the neighborhood. I have to go. Wow. I'm going to say he's at MIT. What was you, at MIT? You are so, with all due respect. Wouldn't it be funny <laughs> if Neil Armstrong's brother was an agoraphobic? I just is afraid to leave it. Um, <laughs> Neil Armstrong uh, taught aeronautics at in Cincinnati. He went back home to Ohio to lead a very quiet life. He was picked to be the first man on the moon because he was a quiet man. He wasn't, Buzz Aldrin was too much of a showboater. So it's Cincinnati is the correct answer. He was a professor at the University of Cincinnati. Ouch. So it's not, right. in all fairness, this is my obsession. I mean, it's really not fair. Yeah, and I, I, I really miss bumpers. those things. Those bumpers used to play with, uh, you know, the Apollo 13. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, and I've mentioned this before. There's one of those. I went and actually listened to many hours of that because once you got me onto that, and that one where he goes, uh, um, we need to, don't, what does the guy say? Don't make any mistakes. Anyway, and this one guy comes on and goes, uh, well, there's, uh, there's one guy here who, he thinks you know he's got something. It's just like, <laughs> yeah. Let me. Uh, I I Can you play it? I, I but that guy in real in real time, that there's a whole lot of silence. After uh, who is it? Um, who's the control guy? Uh, Gene, Gene Sermon. Gene. I think it's Gene Krantz, I think. Yeah. Who is still alive? But I don't have the courage to ask him to do the show. Um, Why not? I know. He's God, the coolest man in the world. These guys are so cool. Let me just see if I have Hey, we it. didn't answer the question yet, did we? Oh, what was the question? <laughs> We're so lame. I forgot the question, too. Uh, yeah. We did answer the question, and there was a professor at the University of Cincinnati. I thought we had another question already after that. Not yet. Oh, okay. Let me just see if I can we find have two more questions, number six and seven. Okay. I don't think I have it. Maybe, hang on. I used to have it. I love those clips. I also miss the you miserable hump. You're listening to the David Feldman show. You happy self actualized hump. <laughs> the positive spin. Right? Uh, okay. I'll, I'll find it. I, you know what I need to do? I need to get. Okay. So we're down to what? Number we have six. two questions. Number six. Here we go. I'm going to do a Karnak. Okay. It's tied, by the way. I'm going to do, it's number two. <laughs> Earth revolves around the sun every 365.22 days or so in an elliptical orbit with an eccentricity of about 0 0.017. The perihelion or the closest point to the sun is about 91.4 million miles. <clears throat> Around what date does this occur? December 21st? Well, say this again. Start again. Who, who's up? <laughs> uh, I already made my guess. It's number two. <laughs> Professor Steinell is first on this one. The, <laughs> Earth <revol> <laughs> the Earth revolves around the sun every 365.22 days or so in an elliptical orbit with an eccentricity of about 0 0.017. The perihelion, or the closest point to the sun, is about 91.4 million miles. Around what date does this occur? Is it December 21st? September 22nd? June 22nd? Or the third date? <laughs> Well, I'm gonna. I I I, I'm, I think it's the June date. So I'm gonna 
disagree. I'm just thinking because this I, I have no idea. I know that it's summer in Australia when it's winter in the north. And that is because of the axis. Just answer the question, David. I'm don't just, wait for the don't wait for the the <laughs> the translation. Just answer I'll, the question. I'll wait till hell freezes over. <laughs> Badly Stevens except for the Russian. Badly so. Stevens. Uh, <laughs> which made no sense when he said, I'll wait till hell freezes over. What does that mean? Uh, he'll wait a long time. So it was weak when he said that. Yeah, he should have said, <laughs> things are melting on the ice cap. We got to. Uh, like Adley Stevenson, the egghead. By the way, that was what I used to call you before I met. That's right. You, you used to call me egghead in the emails that I would send. Email. Right. I called you egghead. I'd say, hey, egg. So, <laughs> but, but Adley Stevenson was called egghead. And he was the UN ambassador to the United States during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And he was saying to the Russian ambassador, did you plant missiles in in Cuba? And the Russian is talking and saying, wait, wait. And Adley Stevenson says, I'll wait till hell freezes over. What does that mean? I never understood. Everybody said that was Adley's finest moment. I'm thinking he's saying he'll wait forever for the answer, right? <laughs> yeah, because he prompted the guy, don't wait for the translation, just answer the question. He assumed the guy right. spoke English. Right. Which was probably true. Right. Probably true. I'm going to go with June. Adley Stevenson murdered somebody. Did you know that? He accidentally uh, shot somebody in his home. Yes, in his youth. Yes. Uh, I am going to say that June is the is June 21st. June 22nd is the summer equinox, if you're normal and live in the United States. And December 21st is winter if you're normal and a good Christian, unlike the Australians. That's the tilt, that's the access. So what is the September oh. thing? We have December 21st, September 22nd, June 22nd, or the third date. I'm gonna say, well, third date is probably the right answer, but I'm gonna say September 22nd, you said? Yes. Yeah, I'm gonna say September 22nd. The correct answer is December 21st. December twenty first. December twenty first. These, these that's the winter solstice. Out. Yeah, but that's the tilt. I thought that's the tilt of the Earth. Not anything. Yeah, to... I think you're right. And that's the closest it get, we get. Earth revolves around the sun in the elliptical orbit with an eccentricity of about point zero one seven. The perihelion, or the closest point to the sun is 91 million miles. What date does this occur? December 21st. So Australia's summer must be we caliente. I speak a little <laughs> Australian. <laughs> That's very impressive. That's impressive. Gracias. That's right. <laughs> All right. It, it's a tie. Yeah. OK, let's tiebreaker. This is question the, number uh, seven. Here's the last one. This is the rubber matches, so to speak. All right. Number seven rubber. Here we go. That's what I told How her. does the space shuttle generate water in space? Who's up? Who's who's up? Uh, David is first. David is first. All right. How does the space shuttle generate water in space? They don't. They have to carry it all up there with with them. Hydrogen and fuel cells produce water as a byproduct. They efficiently recycle the water through urine filtration and hydro collectors, or they say mean things to each other and collect the tears. <laughs> That's uh, a good one. Uh, the hydrogen fuel cell, I, I, I would guess. I will agree. That is correct. All right. So it's time six to six. How do we break the tie? We live to, we flip a coin. We live to, we live to play another day. We live to play another day. Dan Frankenberger. That was fun. That was good. Good quiz, Dan. Space. Yeah, yeah man. We'll see you next time. Okay. And I'll see, 
I'll see you Wednesday, Dan Frank. How do people contact you? Uh, you can send me an email at dentfeldman at gmail.com. Okay. And we'll do community billboard Thursday. Very well. And a quiz. Don't put yourself to sleep before then. So no, you know what it is? I'm, I'm not drinking coffee. I'm drinking, yeah. That's got to be tough, David. Well, I, I get up in the morning. I have two cups. I have two cups of coffee in the morning. And that's so it. you are drinking coffee. I have two cups in the morning. That's what normal people do. Right. But I, in the past, I would be drinking coffee now. I got up at yeah, seven. Yeah. I find yeah, okay. I'm physically tired, but my brain is working. Well, that's good, I think. How much coffee do you drink? I'm, I'm drinking some right now, and I'll probably regret it. We, I had two cups in the morning, and then I, I just had some now. Just kind of needed a lift, you yeah. know, so. Hey, cool. I wanted to talk about Mortimer Radler. I don't know how much time we have. I got this, the Feldman uh, song I need to play for you. Mortimer Adler? Was he, who was Mortimer Adler? Sure. Amazing. You know, here, here's what happened. Last week I heard um, the Hershenbergers, uh, Ethan and his father, and the discussion came to angels. And I remembered um, Mortimer Adler. I'll get to the angel part in a, in a minute. Mortimer Adler uh, quit school at 15 in Chicago, went to Harvard at 18. He was an amazing person written i have a list of his books it's, it's the book that i got into i i heard him on larry king. remember larry king when he was on the radio he actually had interesting people on not just celebrities but he had this guy mortimer adler and mortimer adler had written this book called six great ideas truth goodness and beauty the ideas we judge by uh liberty equality and justice the ideas that we live by. He's a, he was a philosopher mm. who put, he, he was like, he would sift through the, the great ideas. But uh, <clears throat> that book grew out of a project. He, was, he developed the Chi University of Chicago reading list. And Encyclopedia Britannica in 43 came to him and said, we want you to curate or edit great books of the Western world that we're going to sell. And you you may have your parents may have owned that set um they own mortimer uh, adler they, <laughs> they just talk. but anyway he said i'll only do it under one condition and that is i want to write in addition to editing these books i want to write a syntopticon which is an index of all the great ideas one by one and where they're who what pages in what books they're spoken of. Um, when I, I saw that show and then I saw, uh, remember the, the DC press club used to be on Fridays. I don't think they do it anymore. Our NPR affiliate showed it and also played it on the air. And I saw him on that. And, uh, he had, he, t he talked about, uh, books. He said, I can remember these numbers. He said, this year, 40,000 books will be published. A hundred will be worth reading. Two will be worth reading twice. And maybe one might be worth reading more than one time. He said, but the great books are worth reading over and over and over again. And then he curated this thing. But he's written so many books, um, six great ideas. Um, and so that, that appealed to me, truth, goodness, and beauty, I was teaching a pedagogy in class, teaching students how to teach improvisation. And one of the things you have to do when you teach something, you have to, when you teach an art, you have to evaluate it. And it could be very subjective and difficult. And this book had a really good discussion about what is truth and what is beauty and what is, you know, and the subjective, how um, the skeptic, you know, and he traces everything through the, um, through the lens of the philosophers. But he wrote in 1972 a book called Angels and Us. And first of all, he was a, a Jewish agnostic who attended, um, I think he was, he attended church with his wife his whole life, 
but he wasn't a believer and a self-professed agnostic. Um, I think they went to, uh, you know, they were, um, they might have been a Presbyterian. I, I read about it. But anyway, he wrote a book about angels, angels and us. And basically, it comes to the conclusion that if you believe that there are beings of thought, beings of thought, that angels might be possible, you know, things that don't have a body. If you, if you can believe there's something, and, and that goes back to, you know, uh, Plato, he, he, he harps on Plato a lot. For Plato, the reality was not, the th he, Plato talks about art like someone who makes a picture of a tree. You have the picture of a tree, which isn't real, and then you have the tree, which isn't real in a way, he says, because the most real thing is the idea of a tree or the idea of a chair. And so if you have an idea can be real, then a being of thought, I'm not, I'm kind of screwing this up, but it's, it's a fascinating discussion. I'm going to reread angels and us. So an angel, if you have an idea and an idea can be real, then an angel can be real. That's where he comes down on it, I think. But yeah. he goes, he traces the whole history of, of the fascination with angels. And one of the big battles in the, in the prologue to the book, Angels and Us, he talks about as he was curating and editing great books of the Western world and doing the Symptopticon, the first thing that he wanted to talk about was angelology. The, the, you know, the, the, the fascination with angels through history. And, uh, and so, and he, he fought the, the guy that was, uh, <clears throat> ahead of, they, they, di they didn't want to do that. They thought, well, that's, that's an old fashioned idea, but he, uh, he stuck with it. And that is the first idea in the Syntopticon, which has, by the way, he says, Plato talks about in his books, um, 102 ideas. He boiled those down to 64 ideas. This little book here, I just found this, Art, the Arts, and the Great Ideas by Mortimer Adler. And he, he goes through and uh, he'll, he'll, he takes love and, and talks about different aspects of love. For example, the nature of love, where it is in Plato, where it is in Aristotle, Platonius, Augustine, Aquinas, Dante, Chaucer, Calvin, Hobbes, Spinoza, Locke, Rousseau, Kant, Hey, and this is in the Synopticon. Yes, the Synopticon. But how, does, but how are you able to put together a Synopticon without an internet? Well, he talks about they had a staff of 30. It, it took a million dollars, which it, in 1943, and it took 10 years. 1943 to 1953. You know, a Herculean um, So you had to read and go, this is about love. This is about food, and then you have to put it, say, okay, on this page, he's talking, and then it's a list. That's an amazing, that's amazing. It is, and people don't know about that. And I think a, we had a friend from church who passed away, and, and we were visiting her, and I said, oh, you have great books of the Western world. She said, I would love that. And I kept thinking she was going to put me in her will and give me, <laughs> give me that collection. It isn't expensive. It's about a thousand dollars. I, I would have given you the Synopticon so you could know what you were missing. <laughs> but I think it's an amazing. And I, and I, I wanted, I'm going to reread Angels because it is, it's an interesting thought experiment, you know. Could there be beings that are just beings of thought? He said, you know, um, people, people, angels have been depicted in art, you know, with human bodies, but you know, that may or may not be the reality, you know? Right. But, um, you know, the film critic, David Denby from New York magazine decided to reread the great books. Oh yeah. I think he went bankrupt. Let me just look it up. I think. He, he went was, bankrupt because he read them? I think he lost all his money. Because so he spent all his time reading books. the books instead of, like, writing stuff? Wow. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He, the money vanishes. He lost all his, I'm not <laughs> lying, he lost all his money in 2004. 
Uh, no. Don't read the great books. Yeah, that's, that's good advice. To your own book. <laughs> Balance yeah. your books. But I thought that was, uh, it was an interesting thing, and maybe Ethan's listening to the show, and, and uh, he can comment on that. But, uh, hey, you want to hear your song? Of course. The Feldman song? Okay. And yeah. also sent you one that you could play maybe uh, as we go out. But anyway, so this is, uh, my name is Feldman, and I paint with a broad, broad brush. I'm doing this live, so I don't have the, the background voices. You know, I love those when I do the backgrounds, like pigs can't climb. That's, that's my favorite thing to do. Or, or uh, um, Anyway, so let's, let's see if this works here. Can you hear it? Oh, yeah. My name is Feldman and I paint with a broad, broad brush. My name is Feldman, I tell jokes that can make a sailor blush. I got no time for shades of gray, everything is black and white. Go ahead, call me Rash, cause I'm itching for a fight, cause my name is Feldman and I paint with a broad, broad brush. Woo! My name is Feldman. I'm the crown prince of hyperbole. In the field of exaggeration, I have earned my PhD. I can talk for an hour or more about the Mo Green New Deal, but I can also play the blues on a glockenspiel. Wow, my name is Feldman, and about New York I've been doing some pondering. You can trust me on this, all the real estate here is money laundering. A billionaire's child is doomed, they don't have a chance. We need to send them all to re-education camps. My name is Feldman, and I paint with a broad, broad brush. I'm going to play my organ now. Here we go. And I got the bit to say about the legal profession. Particularly lawyers from Harvard, that seems to be my big obsession. I'll claim the Ivy League is evil, and it may seem kind of dumb to you, particularly since it appears I went to Columbia. Oh no, I turned it off. See what I did there? Dumb to you, Columbia? Pretty good, huh? My name's Bell. 
My name is Feldman Wow, what a gift What a gift uh, I like the dumb tea rhyme and the pondering, the money laundering. Pondering rhyme. and la- money laundering. Wonder that got me. Mike Sayal is a jazz trumpeter, composer, and genius. I wish I were this man. I do. He's an educator. He taught at the University of North Texas Jazz Studies, uh, faculty member from 87 to about two years ago, author of the highly acclaimed Essential Elements for Jazz Ensemble, Volumes 1 and 2, Building a Jazz Vocabulary. His other book on jazz is Running the Changes. I will get to Saving Charlie Parker and the Lake House in just a second. Go download Song and Dance, the Mike Steinel Quintet, featuring Rosanna Eckert. It's on Origin Records. For more information, go to MikeSteinel.com. God, I love this man. Uh, Tell me about Saving Charlie Parker and the Lake House. You're also a novelist. Yeah, I didn't have much to do over the uh, the lockdown, so I started writing stuff. I don't know exactly why. The Lake House is on um, Lake House Part 1. I'm going to have to rename that. I'm going to call it something else because it gets confused with a lot of lake houses. There's about 12 novels called The Lake House. Most of them... Uh, uh, most of them suspense novels about murders. Mine is about a murder, too. But Saving Charlie Parker is a little bit of jazz history and time travel. Retired jazz professor falls down the stairs, hits his head, wakes up in 1953 next to Charlie Parker. Right outside of Massey Hall in Toronto, the scene of the greatest jazz concert ever, the last time that uh, Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie performed in public together. 1953. When do, but, we get, um, when do we get to read it? I don't know. I'm waiting on the publisher. They've I've approved everything. I sent it back. Now they they're gonna they're gonna put me in charge with a um, a consultant for publicity and you know release and everything. We're gonna do a book big book signing and concert here in Denton. Wow. And, uh, maybe we'll stream that. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll do it on a Friday and then you could be part of office hours. You could. I would love that. Yeah, I'll try to orchestrate that. Yeah. You're the best. You are, you're just amazing. You want to play that little clip that I sent you? Yes. Earlier today? Yes. It says a suggestion for Feldman. Okay. (laughs) Uh, Let me me just. Can you find it? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Hang on. I played for the refugees. Oh, you did on the show? Yeah, I love that. I'm yeah. waiting on Rosanna to redo. She's going to sing the melody. I'm going get to get a version with the voice singing it. Appreciate you playing it. Thank you very much. Are you you're thanking me? I'm thanking you. Here we oh, go. Yeah. Here we go. Feldman Sweet Suggestion. It might be time for a Feldman vacation. A camping trip, maybe a river cruise, or a week in LA so you can really schmooze. It's a very long show, two times a week. Could it be your brain has sprung a leak? It's time to take a break and get out of town before this whole thing comes crashing down. About doing a best of show You could mine the archives And save some dough With all the crazy stuff Happening each day You could play old clips Of Harvey J Thank you. 
It's time, I'm sure, for a Feldman vacation. So go up to Nantucket, find the man who can suck it. You better do it now before you kick the bucket. You better do it now before you kick the bucket. You better do it now before you kick the bucket. <laughs> wow. I forgot that. I love that. Did you do a new version of that? No, that's the old one. I love that. I love that. I'm going to open the show with that. We love you. I love you. Professor. Right back at you. Right back at you. You're the best. You're the best. What an honor. What a privilege. Thank you. I'll, uh, I'll check out the show tomorrow while the grandson's here while we're gardening. Okay. okay. Don't let him hear it. But don't let him hear it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Bye. Thank you. That's tonight's show. I want to thank Jason Miles and Pascal Robert. Go listen to their amazing podcast. This is Revolution. David Cobb, follow him on Twitter at David K. Cobb. Howie Klein, and of course, Congresswoman Marie Newman. Read Howie over at Down With Tyranny and donate to Congresswoman Marie Newman. You can do that through the Blue America Pack. And of course, Shahid Buttar, the next congressman from California's 11th congressional district he is going to defeat american oligarch nancy pelosi in the primary for california 11th and uh go to shahidforchange.us that's shahid for change s-h-a-h-i-d-f-o-r change.us follow him on twitter at shahid for change give him money dr harriet fraud Listen to her podcasts, Capitalism Hits Home, and it's not just in your head. Follow her on Twitter at Harriet Fraud. The brilliant Marianne Cummings, Professor Marianne Cummings. Follow her on Twitter at Razor Girl. Peter B. Collins, go to peterbcollins.com for a treasure trove of this man's radio shows, podcasts, and interviews. Professor Adnan Hussein, listen to the Mudgeless podcast and Guerrilla History, and Professor Mike Steinell, go to MikeSteinell.com for more information. This show is put together by a lot of brilliant, brilliant people, Sarah Bush, Grace Jackson, Hannah Feldman, Joe in Norway, Andy Brown, Professor John, Dan Frankenberger, and the invisible ninja we have a youtube channel that's slowly growing it's a good way to share content from this show so please check out our youtube channel we're available wherever fine podcasts are downloaded i'm david feldman reminding you to reminding you reminding you to fix your dentures reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. He's talking politics and comedy too. To tell a dirty joke, he knows quite a few. He's just a lefty from way back. He's a human man with an Emmy for right. Some days he's mad and he feels like fighting. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. So get your ears all right, buckle in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. Yes, it's time right now for the David Feldman Show. Get your ears on right, buckle in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming away. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way.
Hey, I, I got to jump off. Uh, my mother's doing fine, but I got to be up really early and to visit her. So I, I'm a little stressed out because of all this stuff, but she's doing great. So, uh, oh, wait a second. Did I kill the YouTube feed? Hang on for one second. I don't think I killed the YouTube feed. Hang on. Oops, we're still on YouTube. Okay. <laughs>